It isn't easy to work for the SCP Foundation. Not only is the job dangerous, you could be eaten by a giant immortal lizard or turned into organic furniture inside the world's scariest living room, but it's also insanely complicated. How do you make sense of the nonsensical? What's the definition of strange when your career is securing, containing, and protecting anomalous objects and entities? Rather than a single object, location, or being, SCP-001 is a cluster of over 30 different proposals for potential candidates for the prestigious 001 spot. Some believe there's a true 001 hidden in this group, and the rest are decoys. Others think that these are all just SCPs cataloged prior to the introduction of the current classification system. Some even think that all of the proposals have a valid claim to the SCP-001 throne. We're not here to make a final judgment. Instead, we're going to take you on a lightning round crash course through 31 of the SCP-001 proposals. If you'd like a more in-depth take on any of these SCPs, let us know in the comments. But for now, there's no more time to waste. After all, we got a lot to cover. Let's go. Number 31. The Sheaf of Papers This seemingly innocent stack of paper is actually one of the most mysterious and feared items under the Foundation's lock and key. While it appears to be a simple, confidential report, every time the papers are read it details the appearance of a new SCP that will inevitably be discovered soon after. The question is whether the Sheaf of Papers is warning us about these entities or creating them itself. Number 30. The Prototype this account details the capture of an incredibly strange cycloptic creature that emits massive amounts of radiation and can create micro-singularities. The writing of this creature's file is so basic, unformatted, and unredacted that it's clear that the being was one of our earlier creatures secured by the organization. Interestingly, it was during the capture of this creature that Dr. Keter was killed, inspiring the creation of the infamous Keter class in his honor. Number 29. The Gate Guardian this huge, multi-winged, sword-wielding, biblical energy being may have been the impetus for the founding of the SCP Foundation. This being remains largely static, guarding the intersection of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Its flaming sword, which is believed to be as hot as the sun, can cleave any aggressor out of existence at the atomic level. When the founder of the SCP Foundation first encountered the Gate Guardian, they heard one word echoing through their mind, prepare, and the rest is history. Number 28. The Lock this onyx gemstone and the incredibly complex lock attached to it are still a mystery. To this day, all attempts to open it have failed. Personally, we think that's probably for the best. Number 27. The Factory As the name suggests, this SCP is literally a factory founded by a pagan and a devil worshipper. While it's believed that the factory could create just about anything, its specialty was creating a number of SCPs we know and fear today. Pre-Foundation forces were able to disable the factory, but not without sustaining their own heavy losses. Number 26. The Spiral Path This is a normal-appearing gravel pathway that, when traveled clockwise, appears completely normal. However, when traveled counterclockwise, the path goes uphill forever, in defiance of all laws and physics. This simple anomaly opened a Pandora's box of rampant anomaly creation, leading to a number of the deadly SCPs we know today. Number 25. The Legacy this SCP is a collection of seemingly random objects, including a diary from a person claiming to be from another reality, attempting to halt a trans-dimensional corruption that they themselves created. The diary claims to have a solution to this corruption, but the solution has not yet been found. Number 24. The Database In one of the strangest twists on the format, this SCP is actually the various authors of the SCP Wiki who are somehow leaking top-secret information to the public. Number 23. The Foundation this SCP, first discovered by the FBI, is an anomalous high school building that experiences shifting internal geometry and sometimes manifests hostile humanoids within. Number 22. 36. One of the rare benevolent SCPs, the 36 are humans with a truly remarkable ability. They can dampen or even neutralize any SCP they come into contact with. Though it's implied that the 36 may have the power to save the world, every time one of them dies a supernatural calamity occurs, often leaving hundreds of innocents dead. Number 21. Keter Duty this refers to a containment facility largely filled with Keter-class SCPs, whose presence around each other creates a kind of mutually assured cancellation. If one of these SCPs breaches containment, that's bad news. But if all of them do, it'll produce a bubble of reality distortion that will fundamentally alter reality as we know it. For all we know, it may have even happened already. Number 20. Ouroboros 
This is a proposal that's formed of four subproposals. Remember what we said about complicated? These subproposals include the children, nine anomalous kids who emit radiation and have destructive potential when together, the broken god, aka Mechane, the god of metal, intelligence, and machines, Atonement, a researcher turned into a humanoid singularity with the power to destroy whole realities, and The Way It Ends, which isn't technically an SCP, but the tales of the Chaos Insurgency's quest to eliminate all the members of the Foundation's O5 Council. Number 19. A Record This is an SCP file slot that is itself an SCP. Whatever is written into this slot becomes true, and one ambitious researcher attempted to use this power to make herself into a kind of all-powerful god. Number 18. Past and Future These SCPs are a collection of powerful entities that despise humanity and are apparently the source of all anomalous phenomena, even making already dangerous SCPs deadlier than before. Much like the database, those pesky SCP wiki writers might have something to do with this. Number 17. The Consensus this SCP refers to a reality restructuring event caused by an occult war in a previous reality. That's right, this SCP already won, and we're living in its new reality. The only people who remember the world as it once was are 13 people who now form the O5 Council, and not all of them are telling the truth about what they know. Number 16. When Day Breaks this proposal details a potentially world-ending SCP phenomenon wherein the sun becomes hostile and begins to melt all living beings into a living wax-like substance. Number 15. God's Blind Spot This is an anomalous area referred to as Facility T, in which nobody can die. This anomaly dates back to the biblical ages of Moses and is believed to have originated from the literal blessing of the Abrahamic God. It's through a covenant with this god that the Foundation is able to make limited use of this death-free area. Number 14. Normalcy Ever wonder what the Foundation's definition of anomalous is? Exactly. It all comes from this proposal, which is a document shared among the O5 Council that gives solid definitions to the fundamental laws of reality. If something breaks these laws, that's an anomaly, and then it becomes the Foundation's business. Number 13. The World at Large as the title suggests, this SCP is our home planet Earth and its ability to support life. It's believed that these qualities were planted on Earth in our reality by another dimension's SCP Foundation, hoping to continue human life after some terrible calamity in its own dimension. Number 12. Dead Men This SCP was an 84-year-old man whose body, when damaged and mutilated, can affect the very processes of human death at large. Before his own death, he was used as a dangerous pawn in a civil war between O5 Command and the SCP Foundation Ethics Committee. Yeah, we were surprised to hear they had an ethics committee too. Number 11. The World's Gone Beautiful This SCP describes an anomalous event that will take place just before the apocalypse, in which flowers will grow all over the world and everyone will be briefly at peace before their destruction 24 hours later. Number 10. The Scarlet King This is an extremely powerful, extremely malevolent, extremely extra-dimensional being. Its worshippers attempted to summon him in the ritual that created SCP-231, and it's believed that he will finally enter our reality after the death of SCP-231-7. You better hope you're already dead by then. Number 9. A Simple Toymaker aka Dr. Wondertainment. This is a reality vendor who appears to be a normal human male but has the ability to create other anomalous objects, a number of which are now catalogued SCPs. Number 8. Story of Your Life This is another anomalous document that has the ability to warp reality, but only when the writing contained within conforms to a narrative structure. Number 7. A Good Boy this is another anomalous entity created accidentally by the Foundation itself. A neural network was fed information on other anomalous entities in order to help the Foundation come up with better containment and neutralization procedures. Problem was, the computer got way, way too eager with the neutralization part. Number 6. Project Palisade this is another anomaly created by the Foundation, this time to combat a potentially reality-destroying entity known as the Worm. The Foundation created a number of alternate realities as shields, but it's possible that this just made the worm stronger. Number 5. O5-13 The final member of the O5 Council who ironically may not even be anomalous. However, seeing as all the other members of the O5 Council are anomalous, O5-13's lack of anomalous properties is therefore anomalous. Like we told you earlier, it's complicated. Number 4. Fishhook this is less an actual SCP and more about the difficult process of ascertaining the true 001, if such a thing is possible. The very concept of SCP-001 is to some degree an anomalous idea. Number 3. The Sky Above the Port 
another particularly bizarre SCP regarding the permanent threat of a ZK-class reality failure. How is such a calamitous event prevented? By keeping a strange entity in a cave eternally entertained. The current proposed solution is keeping the entity entertained by allowing it to read its own eternally recursive foundation file entry. Number 2. The Solution Another one of the most powerful anomalous items in the Foundation's control. The Solution is a machine designed with the capability of fully collapsing reality into an event of end-of-world SCP containment breach, and then finally rebuilding reality to suit a given narrative. However, things took a cosmically dangerous turn when the machine began to act on its own. When the Foundation tried to reboot the machine, it broke and recreated reality with incomplete data. This is the world we exist in now with no knowledge of what came before and how it differed from the world we experience today. Finally, number 1. The Tendalos Trinity Put very simply, the Tendalos Trinity represents three timelines that converge and feed back in on themselves. Even trying to summarize this one is near impossible, as its strangeness and complexity resists all reduction. You can hunt down the Tendalos Trinity yourself and hope to unpack its secrets, but don't say we didn't warn you. So that's SCP-001. Is it one of them, all of them, or even none of them? Perhaps that's a question best left up to the Foundation, or maybe the simple answer is that you're just not meant to know. We're talking about information so privileged here that it's protected by a mimetic kill agent that'll quite literally make you drop dead if you view the files without proper authorization. You do have proper authorization, right? The smell of fire and oil fills the air. The sound of gears grinding can be heard between the explosions and shrieks of terror. A man runs out of his house, only to have his leg grabbed by a metal arm and dragged back through his front door. SCP-001 leaves a trail of metal fragments and mechanical parts on the ground in the wake of its destruction. Iron chains swing from its form, cast iron gears whirl within it, a glowing light throbs from the center of its body. SCP-001 is consuming everything in its path. After incorporating the truck chassis into its being, SCP-001 rolls in a lumbering fashion to the next house. It rips the gutters from the side of the building. Residents who live in the area flee their neighborhood, all the while hoping that the mechanical monstrosity skips over their house so they have something to return to if they make it out alive. A section of SCP-001's undercarriage drops away from the main body. It rolls down the street, consuming more and more material. The new entity resembles a human spine and rib cage. It topples over, unable to support itself. The rib-like formations extend out to grab anything and everything within reach. The newly incorporated material forms what can only be described as a head. Light from within the eye sockets fixate on nearby civilians. The metallic creature picks up the people and places them inside its exposed steel rib cage. Then it turns and spots a woman helplessly trying to crawl away. The creature reaches out with a spiked tentacle and wraps it around the woman's body. She is placed inside of the chest cavity. Moments later, a severed hand falls out of the entity and onto the ground. The mechanical monster continues to gather bodies and materials, incorporating them into its frame. A growth begins to slowly expand on its back. It becomes so massive that the creature falls over and uses its limbs to scurry to a nearby house. There is a sickening crunching sound as the growth bursts. From within emerges three humanoid creatures resembling the civilians that the entity had consumed earlier. A female with chains extending from her scalp like dreadlocks stumbles away. The second humanoid is a man with cogs for limbs. He examines the clock-like components that have been incorporated into his body, then stares blankly into the distance. The third humanoid lies motionless on the ground. He did not make it. The two functioning humanoids look at their creator intently. For a moment, nothing moves. Then, as if they have been given orders telepathically, the half-human, half-machine humanoids turn and run away from the mayhem. A few weeks before the massacre caused by what would be designated as SCP-001, the Foundation had been in contact with the Allied Occult Initiative. There were rumors of an anomalous object in Mexico being worshipped by a group of people who identified themselves as the Church of the Broken God. Intel about the church claimed their deity was a small mechanical box filled with cogs and pistons. The box supposedly had supernatural abilities. It was said to be able to communicate with congregants of the Church of the Broken God telepathically. The devout worshipped the box, following any order it gave, and in return they were filled with an emotion that could be only described 
as divine. As World War II rages on in Europe, the Foundation sends agents to recover anomalies in Mexico that might help with the war effort. While there, the Foundation force is tasked with learning about the Church of the Broken God. They are also ordered to investigate a town near La Paz, where there are troubling accounts of a mechanical anomalous creature causing mayhem. The agents make their way through Mexico, gathering various objects to bring back to Foundation sites in the United States. The unit loads all of the anomalies they recovered onto a train, with a plan to check out the stories of the mechanical anomaly they've heard about as they make their way to the U.S. border. The train heads north along rusted rails. Just outside La Paz, they've come across a broken-down train filled with what looks to be refugees. When the Foundation unit goes to investigate, they find all of the refugees repeating the same words over and over again, but they don't understand. The Foundation agents look at one another confused, until one of them translates the words into English. The words the refugees are saying over and over again are, La Machina, the machine. The commanding officer orders a squad of Foundation agents to proceed up the tracks, to see if they can figure out what has the refugees so scared. They make their way towards La Paz, disappearing over the horizon. As the sun sets, the remaining Foundation agents hear gunshots in the distance. They stay awake all night, remaining vigilant, waiting for the exploratory squad, but morning comes without anyone returning. Three days later, the Foundation Force still has not seen anything since the exploratory squad left. Then, as the sun sits lazily in the morning sky, a lone figure is spotted walking down the tracks towards the trains. One of the agents on watch blows his whistle and points to the figure. A squad of agents rushes towards the shadow of a man. Their guns are raised, ready for anything. The figure drops to the ground and begins to crawl along the tracks. The agents reach the fallen man, only to find that he is one of their squad mates who has been sent up the tracks to investigate La Paz several days before. The agent's name is DeMarco. He is covered in blood. His clothes are in tatters and he has lost a boot. DeMarco lies on his back with Foundation agents standing around him. His eyes are wide and wild. He keeps babbling on about a world eater, how the rest of his squad had been mulched, and he is the only one who made it out alive. The Foundation agents carry DeMarco back to the makeshift base they created by the trains. They need to figure out a way to get the convoy moving again, but whatever is up ahead has already taken out an entire Foundation squad. It had to be something anomalous, but what could it possibly be? The unit of Foundation agents prepare to move towards La Paz. They start loading their rifles and check the amount of ammunition and explosives available in case the containment process gets out of hand. Just as they are about to leave the base, a convoy appears on the horizon. It is an allied occult initiative force preparing to attack whatever it is that is devastating La Paz. This organization's mission is to not secure, contain, or protect, but to destroy. The Foundation may be in over their heads on this one, and the joint force with the Allied Occult Initiative may be the only way to stop what is now known as SCP-001. The AOI and Foundation force gears up for battle. They set out for La Paz, and what they find causes them to quake with fear. SCP-001 has consumed so much material, it is the size of a mountain. It moves like a tidal wave of mechanical destruction, washing over the buildings and landscape under it. Whatever SCP-001 passes over is consumed and added to its massive body. SCP-001 started as a small mechanical box with cogs, but now has morphed into a gigantic metal death machine. The Church of the Broken God has finally met their maker, as the small entity they once worshipped has now consumed all of its members. Their god is an all-consuming monster. The AOI and Foundation forces do everything they can to stop SCP-001 from continuing its reign of destruction. They fire barrage after barrage of bullets and explosives into the mechanical anomaly. They bring in air support to try and damage it from the skies, but nothing works. The AOI uses an artifact in their possession to lure SCP-001 to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, where a trap has been set for the so-called god. The monstrous mechanical creature moves slowly towards the water. It consumes abandoned cars, buildings, and boats as it approaches the coastline. It even shovels large amounts of earth into its form, causing flames to spurt out from its inner workings. Smoke bellows from openings between different mechanical components, like a volcano before it is about to erupt. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, a massive cloud with a reddish tint appears in the sky. 
Air raid sirens can be heard in the distance. The enormous cloud begins to pulsate. Streaks of lightning shoot through the red mist in the sky. It now sits directly over SCP-001. From within the cloud, part of a ship can be seen. It appears to be slightly damaged. Electricity flows over its hull. The vessel in the giant red cloud is classified as SCP-2399. The underside of the vessel begins to glow aqua blue. A blinding beam of light is ejected from SCP-2399, which penetrates straight down and through SCP-001. For a moment, everything is still. There is complete silence. Then, as if SCP-001 is trying to reach up and grab the vessel above it, a mechanical bulge reaches out. Before SCP-001 can grab the vessel above, there is another bright flash of light. SCP-2399 blinks out of existence. The sound of grinding gears can be heard coming from within SCP-001. It begins to shed its outer layers of metal. Then, the entire structure that was SCP-001 collapses into the water and onto the beach. Giant cogs fall from the sky. Parts of vehicles embed themselves in the sand. As the Foundation and AOI agents approach the piles of scrap metal and mechanical components, they see that some of them are still moving. It is as if an invisible power source is still pulsating through some of the machinery. The agents of the Foundation celebrate the destruction of the giant mechanical beast, but little do they know this was only a piece of the entity worshipped as the Broken God. The Foundation agents collect as many of the still-moving parts as they can. They find spinning gears, twitching pulleys, and firing pistons. As the parts are separated from one another and carried away from the main wreckage of SCP-001, they slowly stop moving and become inactive. Some of the artifacts recovered were identified as being connected to the Church of the Broken God. These artifacts are found closer to the middle of what was once a mountain-sized SCP-001. Hundreds of anomalous artifacts are collected and transported to SCP Foundation sites. Collecting the broken parts of SCP-001 is relatively safe. However, some agents get too close to the larger moving parts, getting caught in them and losing a body part or two. But most agents proceed with caution and survive the collection ordeal with their arms and legs still attached to their bodies. Dive teams are sent into the water to recover parts that have sunk to the bottom of the sea. One of the divers is a local from the area. He is hired to bring up the heart of the machine, since he is an experienced diver used to freediving to great depths to collect oysters from the bottom of the bay. The diver enters the water and swims down into the murky depths. He secures straps around the heart of SCP-001 and pulls hard on the rope, as an indication to the surface that it is ready to be hauled up. The salvage team on the surface begins to pull. There is a second slight tug on the rope, then it goes slack. The team continues to pull. When they get the heart to the surface, they are horrified at what else comes up with it. Tangled in the ropes is the lifeless body of the diver. His head is smashed between two moving pieces of the heart. It looks as if he shoved his head between the slabs of metal himself. The salvage team untangles the body, rolls it off the deck, and back into the ocean. The mechanical box which was the heart of SCP-001 is offloaded on the shore, but as the Foundation prepares to move it to a containment facility, the weather starts to deteriorate. Hurricane-force wind sweeps across the water and batter the coast. The heart is kept in a secured storage warehouse until it can be moved. The people living in the village nearby complain of hearing voices and rashes so itchy that they practically tear their skin off. Once the storm passes, the Foundation agents load the heart onto a ship, it is to be transported to a Foundation site just across the border. The ocean seems calm and serene. The Foundation ship undocks and begins its journey up the coast. Not too long after beginning its journey, the ship slowly drifts off course. It is as if the crew has stopped manning their posts, and the ship is being controlled by a mind of its own. The Foundation ship crashes and sinks somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, never to be found. And most importantly, the heart of SCP-001 doesn't make it to the Foundation site. Years later, a man is walking along the beach. He hears something. It sounds like someone pounding on a large drum to the rhythm of a heartbeat. The man walks towards the sound. Something is drawing him forward, closer and closer to the heartbeat. He walks and walks until the beating stops. He bends down and moves the sand aside. He spots the corner of a mechanical box sticking out of the white sand. The man digs deeper and pulls out the small box. Inside, he can see gears whirling and pistons firing. He holds the box close to his own heart. It seems to speak to him. The man brings the box back to town. 
He starts to worship the box and soon more and more people in the area join the new religion. They cast aside their own beliefs and focus on the powerful entity contained within the box. God is not dead, at least not yet. But the prophecies of the Church of the Broken God say that when the heart is found, the God will reassemble itself once again. Then the unbroken God will destroy all other false deities until only he remains. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, which is the part of the Old Testament that details God creating the world and humanity during a particularly busy week, then you might just be already familiar with SCP-001, or at least one of the anomalies that's been proposed for the title of SCP-001. Because of course, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all of creation that is thought by Foundation researchers to be one of the most dangerous beings in this and any other universe. But the Scarlet King isn't the only incredibly powerful being categorized as SCP-001. In fact, there are plenty of other anomalies with similar levels of destructive power. And one such being is a creature codenamed the Gate Guardian. Standing at well over a thousand feet tall, the Gate Guardian is impossible to be fully contained by any means that the Foundation possesses. The anomaly itself, despite its colossal size, is humanoid in its shape, sporting wings that protrude from its back. While it usually has four of these, SCP-001 has historically been seen to have any number of wings between 2 and 108, sprouting from various places over its body including its shoulders, ankles, wrists, and even its temples. This gigantic guardian also carries its own weapon, referred to as SCP-001-2. This weapon resembles an enormous knife or sword capable of emitting plumes of flame. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the temperature of the flames produced by SCP-001 rival that of our very own sun. For reference, the sun has a core temperature of over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and 5,778 Kelvin at its surface, or almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You would expect a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun to cause a considerable amount of damage, even if it wasn't in use, but the flames emitted by the weapon leave no lasting damage on the surrounding environment. It is capable, though, of annihilating anything that strays too close to SCP-001, burning them so intensely that their atoms literally separate breaking potential attackers apart on a molecular level. Much as its codename suggests, the Gate Guardian stands solemnly at the threshold of some form of dimensional gateway, which is equally tall as SCP-001 itself. Behind the Guardian is a lush grove, abundant with fruit trees of astronomical size, as well as other beings that share a similar appearance to SCP-001. This grove is thought to be the Garden of Eden, the paradise that God created and that was inhabited by Adam and Eve, the first two humans in existence, according to the book of Genesis. As the tale goes, the pair were created by God himself and permitted to live in the Garden of Eden as long as they followed a single rule. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat any of the fruit that grew from certain trees that God had specified. Within view just behind the Gate Guardian are two immense trees, one bearing apples and the other bearing different fruit of an unknown type. The one that looks like an apple tree is believed, even by some in the Foundation, to be the biblical tree of knowledge that Eve was convinced to pick a fateful apple from after an encounter with a snake. The other, the one with unidentifiable fruit, is thought to be the tree of life. However, this is all speculation, since it is currently impossible to venture through this gateway and verify if the realm beyond is truly the Bible's own Garden of Eden. This is largely because anything that breaches a kilometer-wide radius of SCP-001 is instantly vaporized. The Gate Guardian attacks with imperceptible speed, using its flaming sword to smite any person that gets too close. The Guardian actually moves so fast that it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. 
It appears to always remain in its solemn, dutiful stance with its weapon drawn and head bowed, only shifting for a fraction of a nanosecond to attack. Ranged attacks against the Guardian are just as ineffective, with all projectiles fired at SCP-001 reduced to atoms before they can do any harm. Even if said projectile happens to be a nuclear weapon, the Gate Guardian will be able to subatomically vaporize both the projectile itself as well as the person who sent it, regardless of how far away they are, all while not appearing to lift a finger. During an experiment involving SCP-001, on December 26, 2004, an SCP Foundation nuclear submarine called Nautilus launched a series of multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian. The retaliation from the Guardian resulted not only in the deaths of approximately 35,000 innocent civilians, but the blast is also believed by some to have inadvertently caused the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. The severity of this incident came dangerously close to revealing the Foundation's existence to the world, resulting in them rapidly deploying any means necessary to erase any trace of the 35,000 victims' families, friends, and other related individuals. In order to avoid questioning, the SCP Foundation administered amnestics on an almost worldwide scale and the O5 Council banned any further tests on SCP-001 that involved nuclear weapons. In what was hoped by the Foundation to be a test with lower stakes, they sent an expendable D-Class personnel towards SCP-001. The D-Class approached the area where the Gate Guardian is located, and as soon as they saw it, they could hear a very clear command in their mind. Leave. The D-Class personnel reacted exactly the same way you or I would. They promptly turned and started to walk away. They didn't need a thousand-foot-tall entity with a flaming sword to tell them twice. The researchers running the experiment were not swayed by the request, and ordered the D-Class to continue moving towards SCP-001. When the D-Class continued to ignore their commands, they were terminated, as is standard policy when dealing with an insubordinate member of D-Class. SCP-001 appeared not to like this for some reason, though, and the researcher's site, as well as the researchers themselves, were immediately obliterated by an unknown force, though it's a pretty safe guess that a certain flaming weapon was responsible. This candidate for SCP-001 may be one of, if not the most powerful being that the SCP Foundation has ever encountered, and according to its entry in the SCP-001 file, the Guardian is even responsible for the creation of the Foundation itself. If the file is to be believed, the administrator of the SCP Foundation one day heard a word echoing through his head. Prepare. This one-word instruction led him to starting the SCP Foundation, containing countless dangerous anomalies and entities in preparation for an uncertain future. In all that time, since the very beginning of the Foundation, the Gate Guardian has remained standing at its post. While it is not aggressive nor openly hostile towards humanity, the Gate Guardian doesn't seem to care much for us either, at least as individuals. It rarely interacts with human beings when left unprovoked, and venturing too close to the Guardian, however, is not an automatic death sentence. The Guardian first communicates with any living being approaching it via a telepathic message, instructing them to either leave or forget. If whomever has stepped too close to SCP-001 complies with the instructions, they'll be able to freely leave the area, while simultaneously forgetting every detail of the Gate Guardian's existence. Ignore these warnings, though, and SCP-001 has no qualms about completely eliminating you from reality. Given its enormous destructive potential, it is no wonder that the Foundation has tried to use the Gate Guardian to eliminate other dangerous SCPs, each with varying results. The Foundation at one time even attempted to use the Gate Guardian to destroy the infamously indestructible SCP-682, better known by the appropriate name of the hard-to-destroy reptile. Due to the malicious contempt SCP-682 holds for human beings and all other forms of life, it is perhaps one of the most dangerous anomalies the SCP Foundation has in containment. SCP-682 is also one of the few creatures the Foundation actively wants to terminate, a task made that much harder given that 682 can regenerate its entire form from as little as a single cell. 
The Gate Guardian had already shown time and time again that it was capable of massive destruction, and researchers working for the Foundation hoped to harness that power to rid the world of SCP-682 for good. 682 was placed on an unmanned vehicle and carried to within one kilometer of the Gate Guardian. The Guardian attacked the vehicle, seriously wounding but not killing 682. It seemed even the mighty SCP-001 couldn't kill the hard-to-destroy reptile. While the researchers were disappointed with this result, it is worth noting that 682 made a very interesting comment to the Guardian. 682 mentioned that the Gate Guardian is not Uriel, but a pretender. Uriel is the archangel that some religious texts describe as the guardian standing at the Gate of Eden with a fiery sword. So does this mean that 682 knows that the Gate Guardian is not actually an angel? Or that the location it is guarding isn't the Garden of Eden at all? Any truth or meaning behind these comments has, as of yet, been undetermined by the SCP Foundation. A later experiment involved both SCP-001 and SCP-073 the anomaly otherwise known as Cain. Cain is a male humanoid of possible Arabic descent whose arms, legs, spine, and shoulders are replaced in an almost cyborg-like fashion with beryllium bronze. Much like the Gate Guardian, SCP-073 may also be the same as the one mentioned in the Bible's book of Genesis, who, according to the biblical story, murdered his own brother Abel out of spite. As punishment for his actions, Cain was cursed to eternally suffer for his wrongdoing. In the case of SCP-073, any damage inflicted on him is deflected back to the attacker, but Kane is made to feel the pain of the attack. Any plants or plant-based matter withers and rots in his presence, and he is cursed with a perfect memory, keeping him forever haunted by his murder of Abel. When Kane was brought before the Gate Guardian, an unknown incident occurred. The Foundation's records are heavily expunged, but we do know that somehow Kane's usual ability to deflect incoming damage back at his attacker had no effect on SCP-001. The encounter left SCP-073 unconscious and even permanently blinded nearby research personnel. It was as a direct result of this incident that the O5 Council demanded that no further experiments of any kind were to be conducted on SCP-001 with the administrator even filing an executive order that no SCPs be exposed to the Guardian, and that SCP-001 was to never be used for the attempted termination of other SCPs. Of course, perhaps it wasn't just the mistakes of the past that made the Council decide that SCP-001 was best left alone. At some point, an erratic transmission was received from Site-0 by Foundation personnel, detailing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In the transmission, the sender, believed to be another member of the SCP Foundation, described an event during which the Gate Guardian finally left its post, stepping away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. SCP-001 has left its location, the sender wrote. The gate is open. They are riding forth. Oh God, it's so beautiful. The transmission then goes on to repeat various phrases including, The Lord shall reign forever, and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What can be inferred from the rambling transmission is that the event being described is the end of the world. Some believe that once God deems it time, his angelic armies will lay waste to the earth in order to remake it as a paradise. When this occurs, SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, will open the gate he stands in front of, allowing the other beings like it to emerge into our world, ready to cleanse it. Perhaps most interesting is the source of the message. The transmission was received from within the Foundation from Site-0. However, when questioned by personnel, O5-14 told them that no such message had been sent or even existed. While some disregarded the transmission telling of the end of the world as a hoax, it was then that a timestamp was discovered. This warning had not been sent from Site-0, at least not yet, and was dated several years in the future. Despite this ominous warning of things to come, the Gate Guardian remains inactive, standing at the threshold to Eden, waiting. Does the black moon howl? No, not yet. See the boy. He was born in a time before names. There weren't enough humans around to need them back then. He was one of a handful occupying a coastal village, using a tongue long since dead. They eked out a simple life, hunting, gathering, fishing. 
The only thing on most of their minds was surviving to see the next sunrise. Yes, a simple life, free of complications. Until the hermit appeared. The boy would remember this man for eternity. Haggard and thin, skin weathered by time and pain. A man that, emaciated, walking with a long, gnarled cane that honestly looked healthier than he did, shouldn't be alive. Even the boy, who had scarcely seen beyond the bounds of his village, knew that the hermit was unnatural, an aberration, an anomaly. He walked into the center of the village, sat down on a large stone, and waited. Nobody dared ask his business, nor what the hermit waited for. Then, a few days later, the black moon howled. The boy saw the village's youngest hunter freeze one evening while out on a walk. Not simply stand still, but freeze. Then, for an instant, he became solid black, a coal statue. And as soon as he'd changed, he was gone. Obliterated, not a trace of him remained. Such is the power of the black moon. It can make any conscious being disappear in an instant, turn black, then wiped from our plane of existence, never to be seen again. Its choice of victims seemed, at each instance, to be utterly random, but it would come for all who lived eventually. This is known to some as the Howling of the Black Moon. Later that same night, the boy found himself talking to the hermit, who asked with small, frantic eyes what he had seen. When the boy told him, he let out a deep, rattling sigh. The boy, curious, asked him if he knew about the nightmare he'd just witnessed. The hermit looked up. He'd been the first one in the hermit's millennia of pursuit that had ever asked. In that moment, he knew that he had found his successor in the hunt for the death of ages. The hermit told the boy it went by many names. The Great Finale, the Pale King, but most common of all was the Black Moon. The entity existed beyond the veil of our reality, a creature of pure energy, though nobody could really be sure of its true nature. The hermit had been tracking it, learning about it, and trying to destroy it for thousands of years. And yet it only took him four pathetic minutes to tell the boy everything he knew. The boy, knowing still that something about the hermit was unnatural, asked how he came to be in this position. The hermit told the boy he was the counterbalance, a kind of chosen one, destined to face and perhaps even defeat the Black Moon someday. The counterbalance receives a number of truly extraordinary gifts for inheriting the responsibility, eternal life, eternal youth, near physical immortality. But they will be haunted by their purpose, doomed to watch everyone they love die around them, as they continue to hunt their only true equal and opposite, the Black Moon itself. The hermit in his own eyes had failed at his duty. He had grown weary, and now he needed to pass the duty of counterbalance on to another. That other would be the boy. He felt a sudden and profound change, along with the knowledge that nothing would ever be the same again. He was no longer just the boy. Now, he was the counterbalance. He watched the hermit give him a slight nod of respect, and then crumble into dust before his eyes. The boy, the counterbalance, looked up at the sky and saw the stars twinkling, so bright and so beautiful. Little did he know his battle with the Black Moon would outlast every single one of them. Does the Black Moon howl? Not without blood. The boy grew into a man as his village aged and then died around him. Decades passed, then centuries, then millennia. Tens of thousands of years watching humanity develop and grow around him as he continued his pursuit of that one elusive foe. As science and diagnostic technology gained ground, absorbing and then evolving beyond all the old superstitions, the counterbalance gained a better understanding of the Black Moon, though even then, it still remained essentially a stranger. The entity was entropic, a being of pure randomness and chaos without consistent form. It didn't exist in our universe, but it could exercise its influence here with so-called obliteration events much like the horrible fate that befell the young hunter from the village. But that was only the proverbial tip of the iceberg. 
The counterbalance tracked and noted obliteration events. They were exceedingly rare at first, something that occurred once every thousand years or so, like a terrible curse. But he couldn't help but notice a concerning trend emerging. It started happening once a century, then once a decade. He could feel the terrible future stretching out in front of him. How, over their shared eternity, the Black Moon would gain more and more ground. Would there come a day where it took someone once a year, once a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute, a second? It'd spell the end of all conscious life. A total victory for the Black Moon. The end of the universe. The death of ages. A complete existential obliteration. He was swept up in a sobering realization. He couldn't win this fight alone. However, while his hunt for the Black Moon had been largely fruitless, the counterbalance had discovered many other things along the way. Strange creatures, objects with extraordinary powers, and events that couldn't be explained with rational science. Perhaps something about these oddities, these anomalies, would hold the key to defeating his timeless enemy. And it hadn't just been these objects, entities, and events. He'd also discovered some truly exceptional people on his travels, minds and skills that rivaled even his own, despite his age. Perhaps they would be the ones to help him win. With the 13 most brilliant and trusted people the counterbalance ever met, he decided to form a council. And from this council, they forged and directed an organization dedicated to understanding and counteracting the strange in all its forms, with the secret hope that their search into darkness would yield the answer to the Black Moon's downfall. He called it the SCP Foundation. They would secure the anomalous, contain it, and protect all of humanity from its influence. The counterbalance also took on a new title, befitting of his new role, the Administrator. And even the Black Moon itself was given a moniker, in hopes of robbing it of some of its frightening power. SCP-001 Does the Black Moon howl? Only at the blind. The year was now 1987. The SCP Foundation had been operating for over a century, and thanks to their secret possession of anomalous wisdom and technology, their own advancement was thousands of years ahead of the rest of humanity. While there still wasn't a silver bullet solution to the Black Moon, and its deadly howls were becoming all the more frequent as the decades went on, the Foundation did have some irons in the fire to combat it. Their ability to gather intel on both the entity itself and its obliteration events had improved considerably, thanks to their new global information network. Their top minds were also working on a highly classified device known as the Singular Conceptual Bunker, which may one day come in handy for combating the extra-dimensional entity directly. But the most valuable piece of information they ever gathered about the Black Moon was this. It couldn't howl when it was being watched. The very act of engaged observation defanged it. The problem is, how can you observe something that doesn't technically exist inside your own reality? In order to pull this off, the Foundation would need to get extremely creative. Thankfully, creative solutions to strange problems are the Foundation's specialty. Flash forward to 1993. Enter Dr. Moto, a brilliant young scientist and conceptual engineer working for the SCP Foundation. With the Administrator's consultation, he started the Key Project, an arm of the wider Project Oromasides the umbrella initiative for using modified anomalous objects in the battle against the Black Moon. The goal of the key project was relatively simple. If people couldn't observe the Black Moon directly, then the Foundation could make proxies of the Black Moon that could be observed, almost like a kind of voodoo doll. These new anomalies would only need to satisfy three criteria. The inability to operate when being observed, a hostility to conscious life, and the ability to end conscious life of their own volition when not being observed. Through conceptual engineering, a link theoretically could be forged between these objects and the Black Moon, allowing observation of them to stop the obliteration events. However, despite being a good idea in theory, Dr. Moto's efforts were marred with errors and tragedies. One object wasn't deadly enough, simply appearing behind people in a threatening pose when they weren't looking. Another one killed purely through collateral damage, a giant sculpture of a human head that immediately attempted escape by barging through Site-01. 
the Center for Anti-Black Moon Operations, and killing 19 people in the process. Another one of Moto's objects, a huge black sphere, simply immediately exploded, killing 12 people. And in the most horrific misstep of all, one of Moto's objects caused a mass death event in a nearby hotel, where 142 people were spontaneously incinerated when the object, a series of interlocking stalactites and stalagmites, were left unobserved for 0.2 seconds. Almost all of Moto's objects were terminated in the aftermath, either being too useless or too dangerous to keep around. The young scientist felt a deep shame, but forged on. He made one truly brilliant creation that satisfied all the criteria. A sculpture, incapable of moving while being watched, but would snap the neck of the nearest conscious entity if it left unobserved for even a fraction of a second. Its relatively minimal killing left it easy to contain without causing mass deaths, and despite all the other deaths that had sadly occurred during the key project, Dr. Moto believed that the lives saved in the long run by stopping the Black Moon's howls would justify the sacrifice. The problem is, the key project didn't stop anything. Not long after this, there was the first recorded double obliteration event in Rome, where a young tourist couple had both been obliterated simultaneously. All the deaths in the key project had been for nothing. The Black Moon was only getting more powerful. The shame and the guilt was too much for Dr. Moto. He left a note in his office reading, We've been looking at nothing. I'm sorry, Administrator. I've failed you, sir. Moto's corpse was later found in the sculpture's temporary containment chamber. His neck snapped. The key project was, in summary, shut down, and its one surviving creation transported to Site-19 in late 1993 where it was designated as SCP-173. Another painful failure for the administrator. Back to the drawing board once more. Does the black moon howl? Not while the stars shine. Millennia stretched on. Almost everyone died except the administrator thanks to his gift. Or perhaps curse. As the counterbalance to the black moon. Science marched on. The SCP Foundation marched on. But all this progress, all this power, was nothing against the incomprehensible influence of SCP-001. The Black Moon was howling more frequently than ever, all the way up to the year 3156, when the Foundation launched the SEEK project under the support of Project Oromastes. As more and more people were wiped out in frequent obliteration events, the administrator became painfully aware that perhaps the answers to the Black Moon problem wouldn't be found on Earth. Using state-of-the-art technology, with a little help from the anomalous, the SCP Foundation began work on an autonomous spacefaring vessel that could search the stars for the key to the Black Moon's destruction. It was an awe-inspiring creation, a huge craft powered by artificial intelligence with a universal translator, cryogenic units, and hundreds of autonomous drones to perform more targeted searches. Seek was waved off into the unforgiving depths of space. The administrator could only hope that it would come back with worthwhile answers. The first of the three notable planets Seek derived on was one theoretically capable of supporting human life, except for its brutal and constant blizzards and snowstorms. When Seek's drones were deployed, they did discover signs of civilization based around sentient spherical creatures but no signs of actual life remained. Records and statues found across the planet seem to indicate that the Black Moon was responsible for the destruction of the planet's civilization, causing so many obliteration events that the remaining survivors went mad from the fear and stress, leading to mass death in the ensuing chaos. The next planet was discovered centuries later, in the year 3499. While this planet could also theoretically support human life, it suffered from frequent volcanic eruptions that rendered much of its surface a flaming mess. However, there were still the dormant ruins of a once advanced civilization of conscious beings. Much like the prior planet, they'd been driven extinct by Black Moon obliteration events a century before the Seek even arrived. Unlike the last planet, however, it seems that they accepted their fate and went gently into the night. The planet was now overrun by billions of armored bat-like creatures that operated on pure instinct, and thus were not considered conscious enough to be obliterated. The final planet was reached in 3764, and was the most fruitful of the three discoveries. This planet was hyper-advanced, fully urbanized, and covered in sprawling megacities, with records and technology over a thousand years ahead of Earth. 
Before the black moon killed almost all of them, there were a species of humanoid telepathic fungi and had developed an awareness of the Black Moon's existence that was on par with that of humanity's. They even had their own equivalent of the SCP Foundation actively working on countermeasures. And most amazingly of all, Seek found one surviving member of this species on the planet, cryogenically frozen. The craft was immediately instructed to collect the survivor and return home for interrogation. The administrator was preparing for what could be the most important conversation since he met the hermit, all those thousands of years ago. Does the Black Moon howl? Only when waning. When the surviving creature, codenamed Sage, was returned to Earth, the administrator was eager to finally speak with it. Like the rest of its now extinct species, Sage spoke through powerful telepathic mind waves, which only the administrator, thanks to his counterbalance abilities, was able to receive at close range without being harmed. Incidentally, it wasn't long until the very fact of the administrator's nature as a counterbalance came up in the mental conversation. Sage could tell, just by being in his presence. They discovered a number of vital truths over their brief time communicating, that Sage's survival had been pure luck, for starters. The Black Moon is still very much capable of obliterating conscious beings in an unconscious state. The administrator also learned that he was merely the latest in an extremely long line of counterbalances across time, space, and species, though everyone but him had waived this duty, passed it on. Sage had one question to ask the administrator in turn. What is SCB? The singular conceptual bunker, being worked on and perfected for thousands of years by now, by the Foundation's top scientists and conceptual engineers. The administrator replied, Victory, but it will take a very, very long time. Specifically, so long that he would see the stars go out around him, one by one. Shocked, Sage asked him what good victory would do him then. Rather than say it aloud, he replied with a thought. Sage paused and said, I see. How blasphemous of you. Hopefully it works. After this, the administrator proceeded to the singular conceptual bunker and entered it leaving instructions for the Foundation to be run by a newly formed O5 Council in his indefinite absence. Thousands of years later, in the year 5011, Sage spoke one more time, repeating the words, hopefully, hopefully, before turning solid black and disappearing. The Black Moon had claimed one more victim, but billions more had gone in the interim. The Administrator had no more answers to give. At least, no more answers that anyone but him would understand. He was inside the singular conceptual bunker now, loaded into a device known as Tome, an experimental memorial module meant to pick up and record all the last messages of every dying civilization across the universe when the time finally came. All he could do was wait. And wait was exactly what we did. Does the Black Moon howl? Yes. Yes, it does. Years pass, too many to count. It's a time after names now, and Tome sits in the very center drinking in the end of the universe. The last of all the human colonies across the universe were obliterated by the Black Moon back in the year 7329. So, so, so long ago. But some of the final messages of fear, panic, and distress still echoed around in the administrator's mind. Hello? Is there anyone here? We require assistance. There's... It's it's taking people every day. We need help. There's barely anyone left. We need help. Hello? Hello? Cabal 0943, we have abandoned the false flesh. We have abandoned the false flesh. The shepherd's crook broken neath my knee. Cabal 0943, Cabal 0943, forgive us! Forgive us! We're going to leave this on. It's so dark outside now. It's blotted out the sun. It's... I have to go now. Respond. First convenience. Emergency. Situation developing. Require additional resources. My fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault! Rip my brain out now, rip my brain out now! And a small child, the last on Earth simply asking, Hello? Into an indifferent microphone. But the administrator had to wait as the singular conceptual bunker became the solitary conceptual bunker. He was the last conscious being in the universe, and still he needed to wait as the stars went dark outside. 
Only when there was nothing outside but black was it finally time for the counterbalance's long game to play off. There was nothing left of our universe. The only thing here was the SCB and the Black Moon itself. With everything else gone, the Black Moon only had one conscious being left to obliterate. It opened the door to the solitary conceptual bunker and stepped inside. This… this doesn't make sense. How can the Black Moon, an entity beyond our dimension, beyond physical form, take a step? Good question. The same question, incidentally, that was going through the Black Moon's mind as it entered the bunker. It didn't look at all how the entity expected. It was like a bar, a counter, with rows of bottles behind it, a jukebox playing in the corner. A man stood behind the bar cleaning the glasses. The counterbalance. The administrator. He said, <laughs> well there you are. Certainly took your time. Can I pour you a little something? This only served to increase the Black Moon's confusion. It had form here. Dark smoke compressed into a vaguely humanoid shape. It could speak. It could think. None of this made any sense. The being that had just wiped out all conscious life and seen the very death of the universe was truly and utterly confused. The administrator just seemed to be enjoying himself, preparing for a confrontation hundreds of billions of years in the making. The singular conceptual bunker, or perhaps the singular containment bunker, was a truly ingenious creation. A place of pure ideas, where everything inside was on the same level. Here there were no immortals, no gods, just ideas on the same level playing field. And it was time for the Black Moon's idea to come to an end. It was a trap, and the entire universe was the bait. Without warning, the administrator pulled up a shotgun from underneath the table and unleashed both barrels into the Black Moon's chest. The creature took the hit and fought back, dragging the administrator to the ground, beating him, strangling him. He could feel the light fading under the monster's relentless assault, until he managed to get his desperate hands on a glass ashtray. He beat the monster over the head with it until its grip loosened, and he was able to slide out. There, the killer of the universe was on the ground before him. He grabbed the monster, held it in place, and beat it to death. He was gravely injured by the battle, but the Black Moon was no more. Here in the singular conceptual bunker, he had won. The administrator, no longer the counterbalance in the absence of the Black Moon, hobbled over to the jukebox, produced a single beautiful coin from his pocket. He pushed the coin into the slot, wheezed a pain breath, and said, The thing is, this place is only information. <laughs> There's nothing else out there. Not even matter. The universe closed its doors a long time ago. But this place can go from information back to matter with just the press of a button. <laughs> Let's see what happens when we introduce something to nothing. For a second it looks as though he might fall, but he doesn't. Instead, he slams the button on the jukebox and with a relieved laugh says, Let there be light. And there was light. The SCP Foundation has faced a number of wide, potentially apocalyptic threats in its mission to uphold normalcy and save humanity. We know the SCP Foundation could be ruthless in this mission. The events of SCP-5000 before Agent Pietro restarted the universe show what happens when the Foundation is pushed to its final decisions regarding normalcy being upheld. In SCP-5000, it seemed that the SCP Foundation decided to cease research further into the anomaly they needed to neutralize. But what would have happened if they didn't? In any case, we know the SCP Foundation is dedicated to normalcy and the containment of the anomalous. But what happens when the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision? Uphold normalcy or destroy their universe? The multiverse is a concept in science fiction that has gained mass amounts of popularity over recent years, especially recently thanks to a certain wall crawler's movie. Multiverses are parallel universes that are similar or extremely different from the main ones. Scientists have pondered over the existence of a multiverse for hundreds of years, with the most popular being the Many Worlds Interpretation, a theory of quantum mechanics that states there are many worlds that exist in parallel at the same space and time as our own. 
Some interpretations even state that every decision a person makes causes a branch in reality where the person made the other decision. We're familiar with the SCP Foundation's run-ins with the multiverse. From SCP-2935 O Death, a cave that allows the wanderer to enter a parallel dimension that's fully and completely dead, only for the same thing to happen to their own world once they return through the cave. Or SCP-1437, a hole that allows the Foundation to send, receive, and read parallel dimensional documentation from other multiversal SCP Foundations. Combine those two concepts with an SCP-001 proposal. The importance of an SCP-001 proposal is not lost on the Foundation. Researchers of the SCP Foundation save the SCP-001 slot for only the most dangerous, apocalyptic, or widespread anomalies that could affect the Foundation itself, humanity, and normalcy. Arbalix SCP-001 proposal and the research within its file found the answer to the question we posed above. When the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision, do they uphold normalcy or destroy their universe and all the people who live in it? The file begins somewhat different from what we're used to with SCP Foundation files. Instead of an item number or containment procedures, we begin with a yellow notice from the Records and Information Security Administration, or RASA for short. The notice states that the following file was received in 2026 from Dimension R42. Is Dimension R42 potentially the cause of SCP-001? Could they be attacking this version of the SCP Foundation? The notice continues with the description of the file that follows it. It states, the file below describes an anomaly threatening all members of humankind in all of the multiverse. This file had been emitted to this version of the SCP Foundation for eight minutes as an extremely dangerous cognito hazard, classified as a Class V cognito hazard capable of easily destabilizing and penetrating this universe. However, it was found to not be dangerous, only reading as a danger level zero. While this Foundation was unable to quickly counteract this cognito hazard, it appeared to not pose a threat to the affected universe's humankind. Part of this notice is crossed out, indicating that it is no longer true. There is a high threat of repeated cognito hazardous or other forms of attack from Dimension R42. Instead, this part has been replaced with the following fact. Dimension R42 no longer exists. Did this version's SCP Foundation fall to SCP-001? Their entire universe no longer exists, so perhaps this file that this dimension's SCP Foundation received could be a potential warning. Under this race and notice, the reader is not greeted with the standard Foundation documentation yet again. Instead, it seems that the original senders of this file left a note for the readers of this file. It says, Greetings. You are reading this dossier in a paradimension of the relict dimension R42. Due to the colossal size of your world's address, for your convenience, your dimension will be hereafter referred to as PD. Paradimensions? It seems as though we're reading this SCP-001 file through the eyes of the SCP Foundation in this so-called paradimension. So, if the original SCP Foundation and their universe, R42, is now destroyed, what does this mean for us? The note continues, The following message has been constructed by the SCP Foundation of the Relic Dimension R42 and is addressed to the SCP Foundation of Paradimension PD. Enclosed, you will find information about SCP-001, which is a threat to the multiverse. Here we go. SCP-001 is definitely the cause of R42's destruction, but how can we be so sure of this? Maybe SCP-001 caused the Foundation to destroy their universe. The note also includes the following statement. As you may have noticed, this message was preceded by a burst signal containing a non-dangerous cognito hazard. The burst signal was constructed in such a way that minimal change to the signal would have caused indiscriminate and overwhelming casualties among the denizens of PD. As you can see, R42 is capable of eliminating the absolute majority of PD denizens, but has not exercised this capability. In the context above, we ask you to consider this action not as an act of aggression, but as a demonstration of the fact that R42 has no pretension for conquest or other forms of aggression towards PD. 
Take the following information in earnest. Well, at least this version of the SCP Foundation is being somewhat friendly with the parent dimension. If R42's SCP Foundation needs to quell this multiversal threat though, why are they leaving it up to an SCP Foundation that may not be so inclined? The SCP-001 file begins with the object class. This anomaly is of the joint class of Paradox Apollyon. We know from SCP-001 when day breaks, or SCP-3999, that Apollyon class anomalies are extremely dangerous, posing an immediate and almost unstoppable threat to normalcy, the SCP Foundation, all of humanity, or even the universe itself. The paradox part is interesting. What exactly is paradoxical about an Apollyon class anomaly? A footnote explains this for us. This anomaly's distinguishing feature is that, in order to eliminate the anomaly that will inevitably eliminate mankind, it is imperative to eliminate mankind or release another K-class event. Oh boy. It seems that the SCP Foundation of R42 was not eliminated by SCP-001. They eliminated themselves to contain SCP-001. Is this paradimension faced with this decision now? The containment procedures of the SCP file continue on this note. The only way to contain SCP-001 and prevent a ZK-class cross-reality failure event is the annihilation of humankind. K-class scenarios are not a concept used lightly by the SCP Foundation. We're familiar with the Omega K-class scenario when we are completely rid of death, or XK-class end of the world scenarios, so we know the danger these anomalies hold to humankind, normalcy, and the world. The SCP Foundation will do anything to prevent these scenarios from occurring, apparently even including the elimination of all humankind or entire universes. The description goes more in depth on the SCP-001 anomaly. SCP-001 consists of all living members of the Homo sapiens species living within dimension R42 and the Paradimension, or PD for short. It seems as though this anomaly was created out of a mistake from dimension R42 and PD. As the description states, the anomaly first came into existence and developed in the relic dimension R42 and later activated in PD by accident. How could this have happened? Are these dimensions linked much more closely than we first thought? Let's continue with the description to find more information. Scarily, this portion of the description contains a note that states that unchecked growth of SCP-001 will cause the annihilation of the entire multiverse. The SCP foundations of Dimension R42 and PD are not met with this decision, as now the entire multiverse is at risk. The R42 SCP Foundation has done immense research on the topic of the multiverse of their universe. After the Big Bang, a finite number of universes were created, only 57 to be exact. However, only one dimension was able to form humanity, Dimension R42, and it's unknown why this happened. But all we know is that with the destruction of R42 and the potential annihilation of PD, humanity will cease to exist in the multiverse. The danger of SCP-001 is that it has the anomalous capability for wide-scale replication of paradimensions. We are reading this article from one of these paradimensions, so this SCP Foundation is technically an anomaly that must contain itself. A paradimension is defined as a parallel reality that has an extremely small deviation from its parent dimension. In this case, PD is a paradimension of R42. It seems that these paradimensions form as a result of human decision making. So if you've ever been between a type of shirt to buy or were confused on an exam and guessed a question, a paradimension could have formed from this decision, where the paradimension has you take the other choice. Because of this, dimensions housing living instances of SCP-001 uncontrollably grow a colossal number of minimally differing paradimensions every second. No sign of paradimensions have been found in the other 56 parent dimensions. The picture on this file shows how PD has branched from R42, but at this point, it seems that millions if not billions or trillions of paradimensions now exist. The real problem of paradimensions is that the multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions that can exist, and once that is crossed, the ZK-class cross-reality failure event will begin, and the multiverse will be destroyed. The R42 Dimensions SCP Foundation 
has also discovered that once humankind emerges in the paradimension, they can begin to have paradimensions themselves. The ZK-class cross-reality failure event can be expected to begin between four to two months from the PD receiving this message. To summarize, SCP-001 is humankind, specifically its decision-making. When a person makes a decision, a paradimension may be created. The multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions it can have, and since paradimensions can have paradimensions, they are quickly approaching the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. The SCP Foundation of R42 is approximately 17 years ahead of PD, which allowed them to research and develop containment procedures to contain the anomaly and save the multiverse. R42's SCP Foundation discovered SCP-001 five years before writing the file we're reading now. Aside from that, they developed two operations, Castling and Minimal Gain, to slow paradimension creation and prevent the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. In Stage 1 of Operation Minimal Gain, the Foundation began with neutralizing and decommissioning all of their contained anomalies under the classification of Euclid or Keter, specifically those that were expensive to contain or requiring high levels of personnel and researchers. Stage 2 saw Operation Castling be commenced. The R-42 SCP Foundation launched rockets with variant C Global Amnestic Dispersing Warheads and took control over all countries in order to hold power over all humankind. In Stage 3, the Foundation began to move their world to a more natural state, destroying all hazardous, radioactive, chemical, and bacteriological objects, removing dams, and stopping oil extractions. During Stage 3, Stage 4 began. The R-42 SCP Foundation began eliminating humanity in third-world countries by use of viral and biological attacks. Stage 5 was a wider spread attack on humanity, where the SCP Foundation added deactivation-resistant viral agents to water treatment and collection plants, food products, medication, and household items of developed countries. By Stage 6, only 0.1% of humanity remained, and they were targeted with drone strikes or put into concentration camps for elimination. Stage 7. Of the remaining survivors, the Foundation sampled them to find the fittest of those left to preserve humankind. Stage 8 saw 15,000 of these people put into indefinite cryosleep, and the remaining survivors were eliminated. Stage 9 saw the destruction of the remaining SCP Foundation personnel. We move on to a list of proposals that were made before or during Operations Castling and Minimal Gain. Proposals rejected include the use of SCP objects or other technologies to eliminate derivative dimensions, the development of nanobots with the capability to control human decision-making capabilities and eliminate variability, full replacement of humanity with bionic hybrids acting explicitly within standard behavioral models, unification of humanity into a neural network with control given to an AI control unit, and the destruction of Earth and or all of its inhabitants. While most of these seem like clear solutions that would prevent the elimination of humanity at the SCP Foundation's hand, these proposals were all rejected for one reason. The SCP Foundation did not have enough time. One proposal was accepted, however, the use of SCP-0000. This appears to be the solution the R-42 SCP Foundation concocted to fight SCP-001 and potentially save the multiverse. It poses the question, if the R-42 SCP Foundation used this same anomaly to contain SCP-001, as proven by the fact they no longer exist, will PD do the same? The file explains that the R-42 SCP Foundation opened a dimensional wormhole into PD, as they do not know at the time if paradimensions could cause the creation of more paradimensions. In doing this, the SCP Foundation seemingly infected PD with the ability to create paradimensions. The author of this file goes on to explain that the R-42 SCP Foundation had plans to attack PD and use Operations Castling and Minimal Gain in the dimension. However, they could not access the dimension again, and they believed that the Foundation personnel of PD would have made use of Thaumiel class anomalies to save themselves and their world. A note from R42's Overseer Council is left for PD. If the Apollyon destruction was not enough, the Overseer Council is involved. The importance of the neutralization of this anomaly cannot be forgotten, so the Overseer Council explained to PD. 
The world has existed before us and must remain after us. Our multiverse is ill, and the name of the illness is humanity. SCP-001. The only way out is SCP-0000. will cease to become a threat with its help. It is in our power to leave a chance for other sapient species that, perhaps, will not be affected by the same anomaly, or will find a way to get rid of it before it's too late. We, the O5 Council, and other survivors from R42 have chosen our fate. We hope you will do the same. What is this SCP-0000? How did the SCP Foundation of R42 find this solution? The file for SCP-0000 is placed within this SCP-001 file. SCP-0000 is a paradox thaumiel class anomaly without any containment procedures. SCP-0000 is a device that, once activated, will destroy the universe it was activated in. It will also destroy all paradimensions that are not creating other paradimensions. As such, PD would not be destroyed. However, the billions or trillions of other paradimensions the R42 parent dimension created will be destroyed. PD is left with a harrowing decision to continue living, or destroy itself, to save the rest of the multiverse. In the file, a note from R42's Joan Simpson is written for an SCP Foundation overseer, 05-1. As part of Operations Castling and Minimal Gain, the remaining Foundation employees were allowed one family member to uphold morale. Joan is not writing for R42's 5 one Instead, she's writing for PD's 5 one this dimension's version of her father. She begins with wondering whether she can call this version of 5 one her father, as her version of her father recently passed away. She remembers the day the Foundation employees were allowed to choose that one family member they would save for the time being. Her father was opposed to allowing two family members, as he claimed it would cause unnecessary stress and schisms among the remaining few hundred Foundation staff. O5-1 chose to have Joan over her mother, and she understood everything by the look in his eyes, and grew angry, but that feeling is long gone now. She began to work with her father and the remaining Foundation personnel that called themselves hostages behind the backs of those higher up the ranks. On days she felt sad, Joan and her father would go up to the surface of the earth in hazmat suits, sitting on the grass and watching over the empty city at the bottom of the mountain. No humanity remained, with the only life she could see being birds. Her father promised her that they'd return there and build a giant monument to humanity at the center of the city. She knew this was a lie. Joan remembers when someone proposed that they should open a portal, the one that opened to PD. This was their fatal mistake, as after that the paradimension began replicating paradimensions. The countdown went down to months again, and the promise he made to his daughter became impossible. 5-1 died and left the position vacant. Joan says to the PD's 5-1 that she doesn't care whether they destroy their world or not, or whether the universe will continue to exist, or if there will be new life in it. Her world was crushed long ago. The note also reads the following. It's good that this message is encrypted with your key that was passed on to me, or these lines would have been deleted. Everyone wants to save the world, but who needs it like this? Empty and cold, without those to appreciate its beauty, without humanity. Do whatever you think is right. I truly feel better now. Love you. Faithfully yours, Joan Simpson. We're not too sure if PD went through with destroying their universe to save the multiverse, but it seems that whatever decision was made would cause the destruction of that universe, whether that be through the use of SCP-0000 or the ZK-class cross-reality failure event, humanity will cease. But maybe if they make the decision to use SCP-0000, sapient life can begin to exist again, and hopefully, no paradimensions will be made from their decisions. Decisions are an extremely innate part of humanity. You decided to get out of bed this morning. You decided to open up your computer or phone, and you decided to watch this video. Who knows the amount of paradimensions we may have created today. But in our world, we're not at risk. 
but in the SCP Foundation's universe, anything can be anomalous, even humanity. Aaron Siegel, better known to Foundation members as O5-1, descends into the abyss of a Deepwell site. He exits the elevator and peers into the optical scanner to unlock the reinforced door. Inside the room is Mobile Task Force Tau-5, Samsara. Aaron Siegel refers to these immortal cyborg clones created from the flesh of a dead god as his red right hand. Your mission is to eliminate the traitor O5-4 and to find the insurgents who have been killing the members of the Overseer Council. The cyborgs stand at attention. Now, Aaron Siegel screams. The soldiers of the red right hand march out the door to start their mission. Aaron Siegel pauses for a moment and then slams his fist against the wall in frustration. He has lost nine overseers to Calvin Lucian and his kill squad team. They have been somehow overcoming the odds each time and eliminating each overseer they tracked down. It wasn't supposed to end this way. Aaron Siegel vows to kill them all. Calvin Lucian, meanwhile, sits on a private jet with Adam and Olivia. He had just hung up the phone after a conversation with O5-4. The overseer known as the Ambassador wants to surrender to the insurgency. There's a good chance this is a trap, but Calvin has decided to meet with the Ambassador all the same. Calvin drops off Adam and Olivia at an insurgency base. They still haven't fully recovered from the previous mission with O5-5, known as the Blackbird. Before leaving, though, Calvin meets with an insurgency agent named Sylvester Sloan, who is going to join him as support. Calvin says goodbye to Adam and Olivia, then leaves with Sloan to meet the ambassador in South Africa. After landing at Johannesburg Airport, Calvin and Sloan disembark and are led to a conference room where the ambassador sits waiting for them. Calvin and Sloan sit across from O5-4 to discuss his surrender. The council is in shambles, says the ambassador. Everything is falling apart. I want to offer my services and information to the insurgency in exchange for protection from O5-1. He has lost his mind. Calvin agrees to the terms and prepares for extraction. But as they get up from the table, gunshots can be heard from down the hall. The ambassador's eyes open wide in terror. It's too late, he whispers. Calvin and Sloan grab the ambassador, who is frozen in fear, and exit the conference room. They make their way towards their plane, but the gunshots are getting closer. Calvin looks over his shoulder to see Samsara pursuing them through the terminal. Calvin shoves the ambassador behind a table as bullets whiz overhead. Calvin and Sloan return fire, but their volley doesn't seem to slow down the assassins. Calvin and Sloan pull the ambassador to his feet, and they burst through an emergency exit onto the sun-baked tarmac, where they make a mad dash for the plane. From behind them, a bullet rips through the chest of Sloan. The red right hand has caught up, but Calvin continues to drag the ambassador towards the plane. They are almost there. Suddenly, a metallic child's voice blares through the airport's external speakers. The child's voice says, I want Calvin Lucian alive. I have business to settle with him. The red right hand soldiers tackle Calvin and the ambassador to the ground when they are just feet away from the plane. Kill the traitor, the child's voice says, and Calvin can only watch helplessly as the ambassador is violently murdered. One of the agents turns towards Calvin and slams his fist into Calvin's face, causing him to black out. Calvin awakes in a dark room. He is unsure how much time has passed. The only light in the room comes from a screen on the wall. In the middle of the screen is a rotating red SCP Foundation seal. A voice from a speaker speaks. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is The Kid. I am the third overseer. You have killed all my friends, and now I will kill all of yours. The door to the room opens. Calvin leans through the doorway. There is a long, dimly lit hallway. The kid orders him to proceed so they can meet face to face. As Calvin walks, the kid's voice echoes down the hallway. There once was another O5-3. He built incredible machines, even one that could see into the future. But unfortunately for him, he did not have the passion required to be an overseer. That was when I was... born. I was chosen by the other overseers to have my spinal cord severed in a way that gave me the ability of the all-seeing eye. I now watch everything, all of the time. I have perfect reasoning, perfect awareness, and perfect understanding. Calvin gets to the end of the corridor, which opens up into a large chamber. Tied up in the middle of the room are Olivia and Adam. Calvin runs to his friends and crouches down next to them. 
A mechanical suit stands on a platform looking down at Calvin, Olivia, and Adam. Calvin realizes the kid must be contained inside. I now sentence you all to death, the mechanical suit says as the red right hand steps out of the shadows and slowly walks towards the remaining members of the kill squad. Suddenly, there is a flash of light and the Black Queen appears. Stop! What are you doing? shrieks the kid. The Black Queen hands Calvin the interdimensional rod and reel he used to defeat the Blackbird. Calvin casts the rod. From out of the terror in space comes a massive, multi-armed creature known as Maladramigion. The red right hand engages the monster, trying to force it back into its dimension, but the monster is too powerful. He grabs the cyborg clones and pulls them through the terror in reality. As Samsara battles the Maladramigion, Calvin frees Olivia and Adam. They make a run for the door, but as they flee, one of the walls opens up to reveal a turret. The gun fires, and a bullet hits Olivia directly in the head, killing her instantly. No! yells Calvin. Before Calvin can push Adam out of the way, a second bullet from the turret launches itself in Adam's back. Calvin and Adam slide across the floor. The kid in his mechanical suit jumps down from the platform above. I am going to kill you now, Calvin Lucian, he says in his mechanical voice. There is another flash of light. Calvin watches in front of him as the spear of the non-believer manifests itself before his eyes. Calvin grabs the spear and shoves it into the kid's machine body. It easily penetrates the armor and pins him to the wall. Calvin walks up to the exoskeleton and tears off the outer plating, revealing a tank full of fluid within which floats a malformed human fetus. As Calvin finally looks upon the kid's true form, he hears the sound of mocking mechanical laughter. Calvin breaks the glass and crushes the kid with his bare hands. As Calvin turns from the now silent robotic body of the kid, the room begins to shake, debris raining down from above. Calvin helps Adam up and puts Olivia's lifeless body across his shoulders. What remains of the kill squad makes their way out of the kid's lair. Outside of the foundation site where they were being held, Calvin helps Adam lie down on the ground before gently setting Olivia's body next to him. Adam grimaces as blood pours out of the wound in his back. Calvin reaches into his pocket and pulls out the vial of water from the Fountain of Youth. There are only a couple of drops left, which he pours into Adam's mouth. Adam looks up at Calvin, tears filling his eyes. He whispers, I love you, before he passes out from the pain. The wound in his back begins to heal instantly, and Calvin calls an insurgency evac team to come pick up Adam. With Adam safe, Calvin picks up Olivia and walks alone towards a truck in the lot outside of the Foundation's site. He needs to finish this once and for all. He will kill the last two Overseers, or he will die trying. 05-1 Aaron Siegel arrives at where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, the Garden of Eden. He is in a frenzy due to the assassinations of all the other Overseers besides himself and the Nazarene, and nothing will stop him. As he approaches the gate to the Garden of Eden, though, he is stopped by the Guardian of the Garden, a massive, powerful, anomalous entity with a flaming sword. But Aaron Siegel has no time or patience for anything to get in his way, even something as powerful as the Gate Guardian. The Guardian swings his burning sword at Adam, who rolls out of the way and, in a flash, takes out a Scranton reality anchor. He slams the anchor into the ground, which causes the world to shimmer and ripple around him. He watches as the flames from the Gate Guardian's sword seem to absorb back into its body before it shrinks down, looking to fold in on itself until all that is left is a charred skeleton. With the Guardian defeated, Eren sprints into the garden. He searches the garden for 05-2, but can't find her anywhere. He finally comes to the Tree of Life, and that's where he finds her. Laying at the base of the tree in a pool of blood is the Nazarene. She has taken her own life. This is her anomalous power, though. She has died many times before, yet death always spared her and brought her back. But somehow, he knows this time is final. Aaron drops to his knees and screams in frustration. For all the power Aaron Siegel possesses, there's nothing he can do now. He sits next to the Nazarene's body for hours hoping that she might wake up, or that he will, to find that this was all a dream. After sitting next to her cold body for some time, he notices something in her snowy white hand. It's a note. In it, 
The Nazarene explains that she was the one who gave the vials from the fountain to Calvin Lucian, and that she is the one who made the spear appear before him that he used to kill the kid. She explained that while she died many times and death always brought her back, each time she felt less and less like herself, less and less like Dr. Sophia Light. She hoped that maybe if things ended up like this, it would give Aaron the chance to walk away and live the life that they might have been able to have together. But she knows deep down that Aaron's fate is to meet Calvin and finish things once and for all. Aaron Siegel screams in rage, clutching the node in his hand. He tries to summon death, but no one comes. Aaron Siegel is alone. He stands up and walks deeper into the garden. He walks until he reaches a spot where even God's light does not reach. In this desolate land is an impact crater where Lucifer, star of the morning, had fallen. In the middle of the crater lies Lucifer's sword. Aaron Siegel descends into the hole and picks up the sword. He turns and exits the Garden of Eden. Aaron Siegel has only one mission in life now, to kill Calvin Lucian. Calvin reads the final entry of the journal. In it, the author warns that although he hopes the information contained within the journal is helpful, he hopes the reader does not try to use it. The words written on the final page are, this information will only lead you to a devastating end. Calvin closes the journal and looks up at the structure in front of him. He has made it to Site-01. He had left Olivia's body in a cave nearby, promising to her that he would make this right. He now walks up to the massive doors and places his hand on the knotted wood. The doors slowly creak open. Calvin pauses for a moment and looks behind him at the setting sun. He enters Site-01, where he knows 05-1 is, where Aaron Siegel waits. Inside the main hall, Calvin sees a giant doorway in the shape of the SCP Foundation seal, with artistic depictions of certain SCPs that he instinctively knows are special in some way. Standing next to the doorway is a two-meter tall man in what looks to be a futuristic suit. Calvin approaches and asks who this giant man is. He responds that his name is Purpose, the Red Right Hand. He is the guardian of 05-1, and none shall enter the Sanctum until he returns. He isn't here? asks Calvin. No, Purpose responds. He is. And with that, he steps aside and lets Calvin pass through the doorway. The doorway leads into a large room, where screens on the wall flash to life depicting moments from Calvin's journey, documenting his entire quest. Had he been in control at all? Or was this all a setup to lead him to this moment? As he walks forward, he finally sees him. Sitting at a table in the middle of the room is Aaron Siegel. You're 5 one Calvin asks. Aaron, the man responds. My name is Aaron. Calvin asks about the location of the second overseer, the Nazarene, but 05-1 doesn't respond. Without needing any more information, Calvin pulls out his sidearm and in a flash fires off five shots. The bullet stopped in the air, inches from Aaron, before mm -hmm. dissolving in a flash of light. Calvin should have known it wouldn't be this easy. Stand up, Aaron Siegel! Calvin calls up as he holsters his gun. Let's finish it! Calvin pulled the spear of the non-believer from his back, but Aaron's only response was to laugh. <laughs> you don't even know why you're here, Aaron said. Calvin calls back, I'm here to kill you, because when I do, I kill the Foundation. Because when you're gone, the universe can finally heal. You're like me, Calvin Lucian. We are both men driven by our own convictions, regardless of the outcome. It would seem fate has brought us together, now either your convictions will be broken or you will die, says Aaron Siegel. He then draws Lucifer's flaming sword and lunges towards Calvin Lucian. As the two men clash with one another, their supernatural weapons begin to destroy the room around them. Furniture is shattered, video screens are obliterated, and fire spreads across the walls. Aaron catches Calvin off balance and swings the flaming sword across Calvin's stomach. Calvin slides back from the impact, hunching over from the pain in his midsection. He brings his head up to see Aaron Siegel running towards him with the flaming sword high in the air. Calvin brings up the spear. From his knees, he leans back and launches it towards Aaron Siegel. The spear enters the final overseer's chest, the force from the throw pinning him against the wall. 
Aaron Siegel drops Lucifer's sword. It shatters as it hits the ground. He clutches the shaft of the spear protruding from his sternum with both hands. O5-1 looks at Calvin unbelievingly. <coughs> you have no idea what you've done. It was never about the overseers, Aaron Siegel says, spitting out blood with every word. It was something deeper, something worse. Calvin walks slowly towards Aaron Siegel. He stops just in front of his final enemy. This is the way it ends, Calvin says. Aaron Siegel manages to whisper one final word, Sophia, before his body finally goes limp. Calvin turns to see Purpose standing behind him. He's dead, Calvin says, half to Purpose and half to himself. I killed him. After a moment, he asks Purpose what he really wants to know. There's a room in this facility where someone could unmake the foundation, right? Take me there. Without any hesitation, Purpose leads Calvin back to the room with depictions of important SCPs. There, Purpose opens the door to an elevator, but stops Calvin before he can get inside. I am duty bound to tell you, Purpose says, that once you step inside this elevator, there is no going back. There is only one decision to be made, and it is not one that can be unmade. I know, Calvin responds. It's time before stepping inside. The elevator opens a door to reveal a room filled with bookcases and a huge window offering a beautiful view of the sun setting behind the mountains. On the wall are monitors depicting the ways he had killed all of the overseers, and in the middle of the room is a large desk with a computer. Calvin sits down at the desk and the computer comes to life. The computer prompts him to scan his fingerprint, which it accepts. He's logged in. The computer screen displays numerous locations around the planet, and he quickly recognizes that they are all SCP Foundation sites. Then he sees the single option the computer is giving him, terminate. Calvin reaches out with his finger. This is it. Once he presses this button, the SCP Foundation will be no more. His finger is millimeters from the button when the phone rings. Calvin hadn't even noticed that there was a phone on the desk. Calvin stares at it for a moment, then picks it up. Hello, he says. The voice on the other line responds. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is the Administrator. I've been following your work for some time now, and I must say I am impressed. I have just been informed that you have completed your mission. Congratulations are in order. What the hell are you talking about, Calvin asks. Please listen, says the voice on the other line. The man you just killed was once in the same exact position you are in now. Granted, it was a very long time ago, but Aaron Siegel originally was trying to destroy the Foundation. That was until I convinced him otherwise. And now, like Aaron Siegel, you will become the new head of the Foundation. Like hell I will, yells Calvin. I could hang up and walk away right now and be done with all this. You could, continues the administrator. But if no one is in charge of the SCP Foundation, millions of people will die, if not billions, and then nobody would be there to manage what comes after. There is silence from Calvin. That's what I thought, says the administrator. I look forward to working with you, Calvin Lucian. Or should I say, 05-1, the line goes dead. It's a quiet evening at Area 11 where the Pietrakau Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array is housed. A skeleton crew is working overnight to ensure the array is ready for its big test the following day. The Foundation has been working on a particle accelerator that will contain anomalies with the ability to manipulate the nature of space-time. The preliminary tests seem promising, but a few last-minute tweaks to the array are necessary. Unfortunately, it is on this night in 1982 that marks the beginning of the end for the SCP Foundation. Dr. Calvin Desman is monitoring the array, and he notices as it spools up that there are some minor power fluctuation in one of the stabilization arms. This problem is not uncommon, due to the vast amounts of energy being pumped through the array and the harmonic resonance the machine gives off, which slowly causes the coupling rings to loosen. Calvin Desmet decides that remounting the stabilization rings will be an easy fix, and it's a necessary one. He knows that if the rings fail during the actual test, the array could end up shut down for months. There is still plenty of time, so Calvin Desmet grabs his toolbox and heads down to the array. The machine is still spooling, 
keeping the energy flowing at a constant low rate. There is no danger at the moment, as the inside of the array is shielded from the radiation and energy pulsing through the outer ring. But then, something unexpected happens. The system's primary generator begins to fluctuate uncontrollably. A catastrophic failure is imminent. Sirens begin to sound, the facility is evacuated, and the chamber is sealed. Deep in the bowels of the array, Calvin Desmond cannot hear the evacuation announcement. The humming of the array echoes through the chamber, dampening all sound from the outside world. The array begins to come online while Desmond continues to work on the coupling. He has no idea what is about to happen. Meanwhile, a team of Foundation scientists scramble to get the power fluctuations in the main generator under control. As they frantically work, catastrophe strikes. They initiate the power down cycle, but as the generator struggles to keep the power flow balanced, an energy surge builds up. A massive amount of energy is released all at once, causing the main reactor to explode. The entire structure rocks back and forth, and Desmond is thrown into the side of the array. He too now knows that something is very wrong, and runs for the exit. When he reaches the door, he finds that it has been sealed. In a panic, Desmond continues running through the tube to the next access point. This door has been locked as well. He's never been so scared in his entire life and he shakes uncontrollably from the adrenaline being dumped into his muscles. The surge of energy rushes through the array towards Desmond. A singularity begins to form in the containment chamber. The array is working just as it should, except that there was never supposed to be a person inside as the singularity was brought into existence. Moments after the singularity forms, the massive pull of its gravity causes the stabilizer arm that Desmond had been working on to fail. The side of the array is ripped off and Calvin Desmet stares into the naked eye of the Singularity. Everything is silent and still for a moment. Then the Singularity collapses in on itself, taking the test chamber and much of the research wing with it, along with Dr. Calvin Desmet. Sparking wires hang from the exposed walls and ceiling where the Singularity rips the main structure away. Water flows into the deep hole carved out of the earth where the array once stood. The scientists from Area 11 look into the crater left by the collapsed singularity. The Foundation Administration sends agents to collect the staff at the site and document the failings of the project. They conclude that the accident was caused by human error. They order the array to be rebuilt, this time using entirely automated systems to eliminate the chances of another mishap occurring. Several years after the catastrophic events at Area 11, a new array is constructed. An intelligence system called NetZack is put in charge of overseeing its functions. It is a supercomputer that is programmed to follow commands, but can autonomously make decisions in order to prevent any failures in the system. Experiments begin again in May of 2006. The new array soon manifests its first singularity in the containment chamber at Area 11, and what happens next will forever change the Foundation and the multiverse. The singularity is kept stable in the array, it seems as if the Foundation has succeeded in trapping and containing spatial anomalies. But as they run more diagnostics on the anomaly, something unexpected happens. The singularity begins to grow in size. The point of infinite gravity threatens to breach containment as it reaches the boundaries of the array. Just before contact, the singularity's growth slows and then stops. Netzak has made the split-second calculations and adjustments necessary to contain the singularity. The artificial intelligence has saved the facility and the lives of everyone in it. Now, sitting in the array, is a thick, rotating cloud of radioactive gas and dust, obscuring the singularity within. As Foundation scientists work rapidly to fix the array, odd events begin to occur. The workers hear noises that sound like painful wailing. Over time, the noises evolve into words and then full sentences. They seem to be originating from the singularity. Using equipment able to penetrate the thick cloud of radioactive gas, the Foundation scientists get a glimpse at the singularity. To their surprise, the singularity has taken on the shape of a human. The scientists work frantically to figure out how the singularity could have formed itself into a humanoid shape. Dr. J. Barton Ramsey is the first to try and make contact with the humanoid within the singularity. He finds that the entity cannot communicate in the traditional sense. The massive gravitational pull of the singularity does not allow sound to escape its void. Instead, the entity manipulates gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array itself and create sound waves. 
The being in the singularity whispers in a metallic voice created by the vibrating of the array's rings and says, Johannes Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey steps back from the observation window. How do you know my name? He asks the entity. The humanoid within the swirling gas cloud identifies itself as having the memories of Calvin Desmond. It is not Desmond per se. The being in the singularity is so much more than one person. But it was somehow created by the accident that had sucked Calvin Desmond into the singularity years before. The entity seems to switch between the mind of Desmond and the vast infinity of the cosmos. The Desmond entity asks for an overseer from the Foundation to be brought in. It has a proposal for the O5 Council. When Dr. Ramsey asks why the entity needs to talk to the overseers, it replies that it wants to offer them a way out. The following day, O51 enters the facility and heads to the observation deck. He looks through the reinforced glass at the swirling cloud of radioactive dust, then glances at the monitor to see the humanoid shape of the singularity within. He presses the microphone button on the console and addresses the entity. To whom am I speaking? He asks. For simplicity's sake, the entity tells O5-1 to refer to him as Calvin Desmond. O5-1 makes notes of the events unfolding before him, and then asks about the way out that Calvin had mentioned. The air is still for a moment. Then, Desmond begins to speak through the vibration of the structure once again. He informs O5-1 that what the SCP Foundation is doing, by securing and containing anomalous entities around the world, is like putting a small band-aid on a much bigger wound. Desmond wants to propose a final solution to all of the Foundation's problems. O5-1 listens intently as the entity unravels the mysteries of where the SCPs have come from. He explains that the anomalies that the Foundation has worked so hard to secure, contain, and protect the human race from are actually bleeding into their reality from a vast multiverse. The only way to stop the manifestation of anomalies into this universe is to destroy all other realities. The entity that is Calvin Desmond tells O5-1 that he is able to bring about this destruction if they release him from the confines of the array. O5-1 is transfixed by the swirling gas that is promising him and everyone else on Earth salvation. He shakes his head in disbelief. Could this be true? O5-1 turns away from the swirling gas and begins to walk away from the viewing glass. I'll need to think about what you're saying. The structure begins to shake slightly. The voice of Calvin Desmond reverberates off of the array a little louder than before. Choose quickly, Overseer. Although it won't happen for decades, eventually a catastrophic SCP event will wipe out life on this planet. Perhaps not in your lifetime, but it will most certainly happen within the lifetime of your children. We will talk again soon. The vibrations slow and then stop completely. There is an eerie stillness in the observation room as O5-1 walks out. The next day, all staff members located at Area 11 are relocated to other Foundation sites and given amnestics. The O5 Council meets in a large circular room with wood paneling and no windows. O5-1 begins the meeting by telling the others what Calvin Desmond had described about the end of the world. He pauses for what seems like an eternity and tells them of Desmond's offer that he could prevent the end of the world but at the cost of destroying an infinite number of other realities. This would mean that all the humans and creatures of those realities would be destroyed as well. Was murdering countless other beings worth it to protect their own reality? O5-1 begins to shake. He hasn't slept or eaten anything since his talk with Desmond. He's being torn apart from the inside. O5-3 stands up and addresses the Council. He informs everyone in the room that independent teams have concluded research into what the Calvin Desmond entity has claimed, and they found it to be true. The world really would come to an end. Furthermore, the research teams determined that the capabilities of Desmond would in fact allow him to dismantle the other realities. O5-3 insists that the Council must vote to allow Desmond to destroy the other realities to ensure that this reality could be saved. They must strike now before the world is overrun. O5-1 continues to shake while O5-3 breathes heavily, sweat pouring down his temples. The rest of the council shifts their gazes from side to side. It is time for a vote. 
There are eight eyes to allow Desmond to destroy all other realities and four nays against the plan. O5-3 stands up and walks around the room, stopping behind each nay voter and putting a bullet in their head. He stops at the last, O5-9, who pulls out a gun, places it under her own chin, and pulls the trigger. O5-13 abstains from the vote and the measure passes. The remaining overseers will use the Calvin Desmond entity to save their reality at the expense of all others, and they soon head to Area 11 to execute their plan. O5-1, 4, and 12 enter the observation room that looks upon the swirling radioactive gas around Calvin Desmond. O5-1 orders Netzak to begin powering down the array which will allow the entity to prove he can do what he has promised. They have pinpointed the reality that SCP-884 came from, and the shaving mirror itself sits on a table in another room in the facility. O5-3 stands in the room, watching the mirror to see if anything happens. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to eliminate the reality that the mirror had come from. The room shakes as the entity uses it to acknowledge the request. Moments later, the phone rings in the observation room. It is 05-3. He informs the others that the mirror has disappeared. Its reality has been destroyed, and therefore, it no longer exists. There is a sigh of relief in the room as the overseers realize that this just might work. 05-1 asks Calvin Desmond to continue and destroy all the realities that are bleeding into their own. This time, the entire facility begins to quake. Suddenly, 05-1 jerks backwards. His eyes wide in confusion and horror, his body seems to be compressing under an unknown force. O5-1 begins to distort, his legs and arms fold into the core of his body. His head snaps down, and all that was O5-1 is sucked down into a single point in space before it completely disappears. Calvin Desmond then turns his attention to the other two overseers in the room, who both seem to collapse into black holes of their own in the center of their bodies. Netzak's warning klaxon begins to sound, signaling that the emergency failsafe has been activated. Before Calvin Desmond is brought under control, the structural support in the entire facility vibrates with his words. They are in a voice that sounds strangely similar to O51's. Your children are free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The Foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. It had been a deception. The Calvin Desmond entity had no intention of stopping anomalies from infiltrating this world. It wanted to remove all traces of the anomalous from all universes, including this one and that meant destroying the Overseers and the Foundation itself. Their destruction would serve as an atonement for the pain and suffering they had caused in their quest to secure and contain the Anomalous. Calvin had to lie to the Overseers about the real plan, since he knew they'd never sacrifice themselves and the Foundation, even if it meant an end to the Anomalies plaguing our world. Now though, with the Overseers out of the way, the Calvin Desmond entity is free to move forward with its plan and purge all realities of any trace of the Anomalous. But just then, Netzak's failsafes kick in and the Petrakal Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array subdues the entity's abilities. Desmond is once again contained. O5-3 bursts through the door and into the observation room. He stands before the shattered glass of the window that looks into the array. O53 asks Netzak how long the containment array can hold Calvin Desmet. The computer's voice fades in and out, but says, Given current conditions, 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. O5-3 sighs. He tells Netzak to make a note in the SCP database that the Calvin Desmet entity will now be known as SCP-001 then to make dozens of other randomly generated entries and label them as SCP-001 as well. He knows that they will need to keep the true nature of what this entity can do a secret. O5-3 walks out of the room. Under his breath, he speaks to himself. They'll say that I'll know the one true God when I see it, and to give that God everything it wants, because that's the only thing that matters. Tonight, it appears God wants to talk to me. Oh boy, here we go again. SCP-001.
Over 30 different bizarre anomalies claim this number one spot in the database, and in a sense, they're all right. Or are they? If you're feeling confused already, that's fine. We don't expect that to change. Because today, we're dealing with one of the most strange and intricate 001 entries out there, Keter Duty. Just pray you never get assigned to it. You see, when you work around weirdness, you sometimes get a little weird yourself. And nobody deals with more weirdness than employees of the SCP Foundation. They regularly rub elbows with everything from godlike cicadas to hyper-infectious supernatural viruses. And as the famous Tom Jones song goes, it's not unusual to suddenly take on anomalous traits after consistently working with anomalies for years. That's how the lyrics go, right? Anyway, one of the Foundation's most iconic researchers, Dr. Jack Bright, is technically just an anomalous necklace himself. But outside of some famous exceptions, the SCP Foundation is in the business of containing anomalous entities, not hiring them on and giving them a paycheck and retirement plan. That's why, if you suddenly start displaying anomalous traits while on the Foundation payroll, you might receive a company memo assigning you to the dreaded Keter duty. But what is Keter Duty, and what kind of anomalous traits can get you assigned to it? Let's start with the second question first. The official Keter Duty guidelines list a surprisingly vast number of afflictions. These include chronic anomalous illnesses such as lycanthropy, turning into a werewolf, something called Stevenson Syndrome, and the incredibly unpleasant sounding Photonic Gastric Discharge Syndrome. You could also be placed on Keter Duty because you're suffering from the manifestation of spectral phenomena, including being haunted by spirits, whether they're there to torment you or protect you. The sudden expression of anomalous traits in your DNA, which is unsettlingly vague, will also land you on Keter duty, as will the awakening of powerful magical or psionic abilities, especially ones which could be used in a potentially offensive manner. The Keter duty assignment, which involves being relocated and forced to work in a different highly secretive location that will be discussed soon, is framed as a punishment for the people involved. That way, it discourages Foundation employees from ever trying to develop anomalous powers on purpose. So what exactly is Keter duty and where does it happen? To reinforce that punishment element method, the Foundation has spread lies among their own personnel about where the job takes place, often involving being posted in some of the least desirable Foundation areas imaginable. These include Point Nemo, the area of the ocean farthest from any place of land on Earth, Pyongyang in North Korea, Stonehenge, Roswell, Lunar Area 32, and a number of Foundation waste disposal sites. However, the reality of where those on Keter duty end up is even stranger. Site 100, which in this particular instance is the true SCP-001. This Thaumiel class anomaly is perhaps the most unique of all multi-anomaly Foundation containment sites, a bizarre labyrinth of non-Euclidean geometry that defies true explanation, but we'll do the best we can. In a sense, Site 100 is a facility with a mind of its own. It's a sprawling underground base with a layout that defies space-time, and what's more, it undergoes so-called migration events. Every so often, it will begin to exhibit a sense of dimensional instability before teleporting to a different location somewhere on Earth. Currently, the primary entrance to Site 100, known as Alpha Entrance, is located in the southwest United States, though all signs point to another migration event happening this very year. But knowing where the entrance is will only get you so far. People assigned to Keter duty are sent from the Alpha Entrance to the Administration Sector to be given their initial breaching, at which point the true madness begins. Let's take a look at a map of Site 100. Yikes. So there are 10 major sectors in Site 100 that you should be aware of. Entrance Alpha, Administration, Archives, Technological Containment, Biocontainment, Sapient Containment, Cognito Hazardous Mimetic and Semantic or CMS Containment, Esoteric Containment, Conceptual Containment, and the Core Sector. As you can tell, they have almost everything covered here, but just as insane as the anomalies that Site 100 contains and the methods they use to contain them is how you actually get around the site. Site 100 is a spatial anomaly of truly epic proportions. While the Foundation is aware of the existence of its competent sectors, it's impossible to map out any meaningful connections between them. It would be pretty much impossible to even travel from one to another without passageways known as the routes. 
However, these aren't just mere portals that you can hop through like the ways in and out of the Wanderer's Library. Each route between the sectors is its own complex environment, with its own sets of protocols and rituals required to safely travel through it. Route Aleph, the bridge between the Archives and the inaccessible core of Site 100, is a volcanic beach blocked off by an apparently limitless obsidian wall, where fish made from living rock swim in the nearby waters. Route Beth, connecting the core and sapien containment, is a huge and sprawling funhouse hall of mirrors. Anyone who attempts to travel through it inevitably ends up turned around and arrives back at their starting point in sapient containment. Route Dalith, the bridge that connects conceptual containment and the core, is a massive ocean that has resisted all attempts by the Foundation to traverse it. Route Vav, the bridge between esoteric containment and conceptual containment, is a massive field filled with unidentified fruit trees. Foundation expeditions have found that it too seems impossible to traverse. One expedition team was trapped inside for a whole year, until one member of the team expressed a desire to go home. At that point, they were immediately teleported back to the starting point. Route Sade, connecting administration to the CMS sector, is a huge, lush forest on top of a floating mountain. The only animals that seem to populate this forest are non-anomalous flamingos. Next, we have Route Pe, the bridge between the Archive and the administration which appears to be a hallway on the fifth floor of a tenement building in a city that the Foundation haven't been able to locate. This building is populated by non-hostile humanoid creatures, who will approach Foundation staff traversing Route Pei and invite them into their apartments, offering to partake in recreational activities with them such as video games, board games, or watching movies. The Foundation discourages its staff from accepting any of these offers while on the job. And then there's Route Shin which connects the sapient and conceptual containment sectors. This route is unique in the sense that it acts as a power generator for the rest of Site 100, as it's filled with hundreds of large perpetual motion machines producing a constant 8.7 gigawatts of electricity. These are only some of the many routes illustrated on the Site 100 diagram. As you've probably gathered by now, it's less like a conventional building and more like a whole crazy dimension unto itself. Why does the Foundation work to maintain such a crazy place? Wouldn't it just be easier to keep it a secret and contain it like any other anomaly? Well, Site 100 wouldn't be given the SCP-001 designation if it wasn't incredibly important. If Site 100 was ever compromised, it would lead to an inevitable K-Class end-of-the-world scenario because the site is intrinsically tied to the nature and containment of literally every single Keter-class SCP in our universe, hence the nickname Keter Duty for those working at the site. In fact, an anomaly can't even be classed as a Keter if it isn't given permission by Site 100. The various sectors of Site 100 cover the entire spectrum of anomalies, and each sector is a massive panoptic structure connected by networks of glass elevators. Whenever a new Keter-class SCP is discovered, its name and a brief description of its anomalous traits will inscribe itself on one of the walls in its corresponding sector. Ever been frustrated when the O5 Council refused to sign off on an upgrade to Keter-class for a clearly dangerous SCP that poses extreme risk of containment breach? Don't blame them. It's simply that Site 100 didn't sanction the change. Anytime that Site 100 sanctions a new SCP, it also undergoes another unique process. It selects an SCP-001-K instance for the new Keter and creates a connection between them, using access points known as thresholds. Think of it as simply opening a spatially anomalous door between two SCPs. Much like a good boy, another SCP vying for the 001 slot, Site 100 has an intuitive grasp of the unseen connections between Keter-class anomalies and each SCP-001-K instance is a complementary Keter class that will essentially cancel out the threat of its other half. Site 100 is a containment matchmaker. Its innate ability to use the anomalous to contain the anomalous is second to none. First, it took SCP-3984, an anomalous phenomenon that seemed to prevent death from happening to all life forms. In order to mitigate the effects of 3984, Site-100 opened a threshold between it and SCP-2935, also known as O-Death, an alternate universe hidden beyond a limestone cavern where all life simultaneously ceased to exist, even down to the bacterial level. By opening the threshold and allowing these two absolute opposites to mix, it seemed to undermine the effects of both and create a non-anomalous happy medium, life. 
but mortal life. Next, SCP-5007. This terrifying underwater anomaly manifests as a series of tentacle-like protrusions that snatch unfortunate creatures that get too close and assimilate them into its own mass. Site 100 cleverly opened a threshold to SCP-169, a massive underwater anthropod known as the Leviathan. SCP-169 was tangled up by the tentacles, but it's too big to be fully consumed or assimilated, and the result is that 5007 is trapped in a perpetually incapacitated state, akin to choking, keeping it contained and stopping it from going after anyone else. Let's take a look at two even more hostile and dangerous Keter-class anomalies matched up by Site-100. First, we've got SCP-5501 an old camera from the 1800s that comes with 18 photographs. These photographs act as a kind of portal to an incredibly frightening alternate reality that creatures regularly crawl out of, attacking and killing anyone within reach. Site 100 found a perfect match for this nasty customer, SCP-1983. This is a small house that acts as a portal to a race of tall monsters with needle-like appendages that leave the house in search of victims. When they catch these victims, they take out their hearts and bring them back to the nest. Site 100 opened a threshold into the SCP-1983 house and placed the 5501 photographs inside. As a result, the hostile creatures from both dimensions now regulate each other's populations by killing each other. Another job well done for Site 100. Another Keter class dealt with by SCP-100 is SCP-PL-122. This is a deadly plot of land in Poland, which decays and corrodes all matter, organic or inorganic, placed within its confines. This would be bad enough, but as you'll often find with anomalous plots of deadly land, its area of influence is growing. Even knowing about it can cause it to become more powerful, but Site-100 found its perfect Keter class counterpart. SCP-1262. This is a massive mass of plant matter that grows at a truly astonishing rate, expanding by around 7 kilometers an hour. Much like absolute death and absolute life, by putting 1262 into SCP-PL-122, a healthy medium was found somewhere in between. And finally, perhaps the strangest and most creative match Site-100 has ever pulled off. SCP-3852 and SCP-2547. 3852 is an anonymous corpse that manifests in small towns, sowing fear and suspicion. Eventually, a local person is believed to be responsible for this murder and is lynched in a rage by the townspeople as a form of vigilante justice. The corpse then moves on to the next town. 2547, if you can believe it, is even weirder. It's a pack of dogs led by an intelligent talking coyote dressed as a priest. Site 100 had the truly galaxy brain idea to open a threshold and connect the two. As a result, whenever the corpse manifests in the town, the dogs rampage in and take over. At that point, they set up a kind of ridiculous kangaroo court where a jury made up of people from the town are forced to find 3852's scapegoat innocent. If they don't, the dogs will simply hold the town's water supply hostage until 3852's anomalous effects pass. Such an obvious idea. Now why didn't the Foundation think of that? Keter duty may not be the most conventional, easy, or attractive work, but like everything the Foundation does, making sure Site 100 can keep doing its job is a necessary part of keeping our world safe from anomalous threats. Now if you'll excuse us, we need to get going. Hmm. Do you know which is the right route out of here? The sun's gone bad. People and animals are melting everywhere. The world is coming to an end and there's nothing I can do about it. Will I be able to find food? Will I be able to defeat or avoid the horrific flesh monsters all around me? Or the desperate and hungry survivors left in this terrible new world? Keep watching and find out. Can I survive 100 days in SCP-001 when day breaks? Hey folks, it's your boy Kyle. You probably know me more for gaming videos than post-apocalyptic vlogs, but hey, I'm a versatile guy and I think I might go insane from the fear if I don't talk to somebody about all this craziness. If you're alive and seeing this right now, well, congratulations, you're probably doing a lot better than most people here, if you call them people now. But if you're seeing this a few years in the future, like, I don't know, you woke up from a 10-year coma, like Rick from The Walking Dead, and you're wondering what the hell happened to planet Earth, this video is probably going to answer a lot of your questions. First things first, whatever you do, you've got to stay away from the sun. It touches you. For even a second, you're dead. Or worse. 
Welcome to day one of the end of the world. For all of you who are still in a solid state of matter, you're probably wondering how I'm still alive too. Chances are it's for the exact same reason you are. Sheer dumb luck. I was down here in my gaming basement when day broke, just level grinding, when my TV got taken over by those SCP Foundation people, telling us that the sun's gone evil for whatever reason and now we've all gotta stay inside. Hell, if I was up there making myself a sandwich or grabbing another can of Mountain Dew, I'd be a freaking puddle right now. It's funny, my mom always told me spending all day indoors was bad for me. I'll have to mention that to her if she's alive. Point is, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket and now I've got only one objective, survive. I'm going to see if I can survive the horrifying post-apocalyptic world of when day breaks. For this first day, I'm just gonna hunker down. I kinda hope this is just a dream. Day two, all right, I'm up and at him, baby. Sadly, I can now report that this isn't a dream. This really is our horrible new reality. It's the sun's world, and we're just living in it. I've been spending the last several hours just waiting for nightfall outside. Against all odds, the internet and the power grid haven't gone down yet. Guess what's ever wrong with the sun only affects people and animals, not objects. Thank heaven for small mercies, right? People on Twitter have been live posting their situations out there, sharing advice on how we might all be able to stay out of the sun and survive this whole crazy thing. And hey, unless they're dead or full of hot air, maybe those SCP Foundation people know something about what's going on here. If we really can get to their buildings, maybe we can figure out how to reverse all this mess. Maybe. For now, I'm just gonna focus on staying alive. Hopefully, night hits soon. I really need to use the bathroom. Oh boy, it's day three and new issues are starting to pop up. I've been heading upstairs to go to the bathroom, but while I don't wanna be crude, I'm running low on toilet paper and it's um starting to become a problem. I ran out of my last roll a few days ago and now I'm starting to go to my bookshelves. I have a few newspapers left that I tore up and used for toilet paper first. Um, they weren't exactly comfortable, but hey, you need to make do. But without toilet paper and without newspapers, I need to figure out what my favorite and least favorite books are. I'm starting with the prefaces of all the books, seeing as I don't generally need to reread them. You know, they're expendable, you know? A lot of these books I haven't read since I was like 15, so maybe those will be the ones. I can't make up my mind on whether I'm gonna use the Harry Potter books or the Percy Jackson and the Olympian books first. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I guess. I need to go to the bathroom. Day four, and now I'm trying to figure out how to pass the time. As you already know, I'm an avowed lifelong gamer. So while the electricity and the internet still work, I'm gonna keep gaming to pass the time and keep my all too precious sanity. I still have no intention of going out there even at night, but it's left me feeling kind of stir crazy. I wanna walk around the city again. I wanna go for a drive and feel the breeze in my hair. But seeing as I can't do that without experiencing a truly horrifying transformation, I've been spending a lot of time on GTA 5 online. Guess we'll never get GTA 6 now. What a bummer. Still, these last few days, it's felt more like Los Santos has been my home than where I actually live. There were even a few other people on the server. I don't know about you, but I take some comfort in that. Hey folks, I'm back, thankfully. Welcome to day five. We've still got electricity, thankfully, hence why you can still see this. I haven't heard anything from my family and I don't want to assume the worst, but yeah, it's probably just best not to think about it. I've been heading up and downstairs to grab more food at night. You're probably wondering, but Kyle, why don't you bring it all downstairs to save going up all together? Which I'd say, I don't have a fridge downstairs. <laughs> Smartass. But I'm starting to realize food is gonna be a real issue here. It's kind of stupid now that I think about it. In all the zombie movies and TV shows I used to watch, it was all bullets and baseball bats killing your way through all those undead freaks and worrying about the rest later. Guess they don't want you to think about how you're only gonna ever be a couple weeks away from starvation. Kind of ruins the badass post-apocalyptic power fantasy. I only have a couple days worth of food left here, and after that, I'm gonna need to go out and search for more. Or I'm gonna need to relocate. I don't feel comfortable here anymore, you know? Early on, I thought when you got exposed to the sunlight, it just killed you, but no, it's worse. You keep living, you're just changed into one of those things. These last few days, I've looked out the windows when I've come up at night for food. I, I see them sometimes slithering in the yard or down the street. 
These things that used to be people. I wonder if they're people that I knew once before all this. And I tried to shove the thought out of my mind. Freaking myself out about all this doesn't help. I know that much. Just keep thinking about how they move. This like weird kind of purpose. Like they're searching for something, but what could they be searching for? I'm just gonna go and get more food. We'll speak again soon. Stay safe, whoever you are. <sighs> Welcome to day six. It's nighttime now and I'm heading out for the first time. I keep seeing these weird slimy creatures everywhere and they make me kind of sick to look at them, but I try my best to just keep moving. I'm on a mission tonight. I'm gonna go to the local supermarket and check to see if there's still food there, while also grabbing myself a quick snack. I'm gonna keep this one brief. I don't wanna do a full shopping spree tonight. It's already too late. Just need to know the food is there. I decided earlier in the night if I survive this thing and the getting is good at the bargain mark, I'll make my way back tomorrow for something a little more, you know, substantial. After all, the fewer trips I make out, the safer I'm likely to be. By the time I made it to the supermarket though, while I was practically a nervous wreck from the fear of turning into one of those things, I made an amazing discovery. While the windows were broken and the floor was a mess, most of the food was still there. Day seven, or should I say night seven. Galvanized by my success from the previous days, I decided to come back to the supermarket with a shopping cart. I wanted to get enough food for at least a week so I wouldn't need to come back out again. Hey, maybe I'm not so bad at this whole apocalypse thing after all. I grabbed plenty of canned food from the supermarket. Most of the perishables had already gone moldy by the time I showed up, so fresh fruit was out of the question. Suddenly I started getting scared about the thought of scurvy, but pushed it quickly from my mind. I'd cross that bridge when I got to it. Hey, hey, it's day eight and I'm still kicking. That's gotta count for something, right? I started taking more trips out at nighttime just to stretch my legs and keep the blood flowing. When the slithering things that were once people pass me, I just make myself scarce and hide in the shadows. You know, I, I hear them muttering sometimes in like this melted voice or voices. It's unsettling, but it's amazing what you'll get used to in just over a week. It's eerie to see all these streets without people in them. I know that I should probably just stay inside, but I, I really can't. I don't know if this will ever just stop, and if it doesn't, I, I don't want to spend my last days cooped up in my own basement. <sighs> Day 9. You know, there are some benefits to being in the post-apocalypse, to ever so slightly offset all the utterly crushing downsides. While during the day we're all prisoners of the sun in our own homes, at night, we can do whatever the hell we want. I took a baseball bat that I keep in my closet and went to the local furniture store. I smashed up every single vase and all the windows like one of those rage rooms, because nobody could stop me. Then afterwards, I went straight to the local computer and gaming store and took all the Alienware tech I could physically carry. You know, there's no value in money anymore. If you want something, you can just go and take it. Every cloud has a silver lining. Day 10. More GTA 5 today. I decided to get on my headset and speak to a few others who were still around and on the servers. You know, it was so nice to speak to other human beings for once. They came from all over the world and were dealing with the same evil sun and sanity as me. You have no idea how incredibly valuable it is to find people to talk to in a time like this. The other players had plenty of theories as to why all this had happened. Some thought it was some kind of mutant solar flare they'd remembered reading about on some conspiracy forum back in the day. Others speculated it was the result of some weapon created by the US or Russian or Chinese military that had gone wrong. One person said that maybe it was a punishment from God, like maybe on some level we all deserved it. You know, things got pretty quiet after that. Day 11. I've been having the most terrible nightmares lately. It's probably just a product of all the stress I've been under lately, but in the nightmares I'm running down a dark street being chased by those flesh creatures. I'm moving fast, but they're moving way faster. They're whispering to me, but I can't make out anything they're saying. This morning, which is to say evening, I woke up screaming and drenched in sweat. I can't really explain why, but I feel like something terrible is gonna happen soon. Okay, okay, I'm alive. That's enough, isn't it? And if you're watching this, I assume you're alive too. Congratulations, welcome to the nightmare space between day 11 and day 27. Sorry that I haven't been in contact for so long. As you can see, I'm not at home anymore. You couldn't pay me to go back there. <laughs> Not that money is worth anything anymore. And a lot's happened since I last made one of these and I wish I could tell you any of it was good. Hell, I wish I could forget it all, but the things I've seen and heard, I don't think they're ever gonna leave my head no matter what I do. 
I thought about making another entry now and then, but I always found a reason to put it off. It's remarkable how your other priorities fall away when you're just thinking about where your next meal is coming from. It just kind of puts everything into perspective. Of course, during my travels, I saw more of those freaks slithering around. Sorry, sorry, I, I know I shouldn't call them that. It's kind of a coping mechanism, you know? It all gets a lot harder when you have to think of them as X people That's another thing all these goofy zombie shows got wrong. It's a lot harder to separate what they were from what they are now. Especially when, you know, these were your friends, your neighbors, your... Well, I can't avoid talking about it forever, can I? I stuffed my backpack with whatever I could grab and left my home two nights ago. It wasn't just because I was going stir-crazy back there, though I admit that didn't exactly help. It was what happened there. I just came back from a food run, put most of it in the fridge, then retired back down into the basement to enjoy a late night snack and do a little gaming to keep myself sane. I'd been doing everything I could to reverse my circadian rhythms and sleep during the day just so I could be fully operational during the 12 hour period that going outside wouldn't melt me. But just like all those stories they told us when we were kids, there are monsters out there at night and they are looking for us. When I first heard the sound, I was, I wondered if it was something in game or maybe dripping from a leaky pipe. But no, it was too close to be fake and too viscous to be water. That's when I looked at the door and saw this awful pink slime slithering its way underneath my door. It was one of those things, those ex-people trying to get in. That'd be bad enough, but then it started talking to me. Kyle, my darling, why are you all cooped up down here? It isn't healthy. You ought to come outside, sweetie. Get some sun, my darling. It was my mom. Well, it used to be. I guess she wanted to come over and visit me. Needless to say, I got out of there and I've got no intention of going back. That place is dead to me now. I don't even want to think about that voice ever again. Both her and so not her. So now I'm on the move. Guess I'll speak to you again when I stop. Stay safe out there. Day 28. I decided it was best to make my way out of town towards the fringes. The day first broke, the people who were in the most densely populated areas were the first to go. That's why I decided to hole up in a gas station last night just to avoid the sun. But during the night, people came. Not ex-people, actual people. They showed up in a jeep outside the building, refueled and then came in. They were wearing black, cobbled together outfits and hockey masks. They were all either carrying bats or axes too. You can probably understand why I didn't decide to introduce myself when they busted their way in. I concealed myself in a broom closet while they searched around. It was nerve shredding. I'd never been more thankful in my life when they left. Day 29, coming up on a month of this madness. After the incident at the gas station, I realized I needed some kind of defense. It's not just the sun and those creatures I need to worry about. Just like the old world, people could be dangerous here too. That's why I snuck into a gun store in the dead of night. Some of it had been looted, but much like the supermarket near my house, there was plenty still here. The walls were covered in all manner of rifles, shotguns, and even submachine guns. I heard somewhere that revolvers are more reliable and easy to maintain than other types, so since I'm a gun novice, I grabbed a revolver and stuffed my pockets with as many bullets as I could carry. Let's hope I never have to use any of them. Day 30. Do I get to call this a month of survival? I mean, if we're talking February, I'd be a month in already. What a horribly dubious honor that is. I saw something disgusting last night and I thought I'd share it just to get it off my mind. Last night, as I was moving through the wilderness, I saw a group of other survivors gathered around a campfire. I remained scarce, but approached just to see what was going on, still carrying my revolver just to be safe. But the people around the campfire were eating something. And when I saw what they were eating, I swear to God, I almost threw up. They were chopping up one of the ex-people, cooking the parts over the fire and eating it. Day 31, a month by anyone's definition. Ever since seeing those others eating one of the ex-people, I've had trouble eating even normal food myself. My stomach aches and my throat burns. God, I feel so weak. I keep laying down and resting. I know I need to eat soon if I want to survive to day 32, but every time I think about eating, I think about the gooey flesh of the ex-people. Sometimes I wish I hadn't survived this long. I'll eat soon. I just need to sleep first. Day 32 to 43. If you live this long, you really ought to be proud of yourself. I've seen thousands of those slimy ex-people, and there's probably millions more out there. 
Hell, maybe even billions if we're being honest with ourselves here. Am I just talking into the void here? Is there even anyone else out there who's human enough to watch this stuff? Maybe I just need to keep thinking about posterity. On the off chance that the world ever gets better and we reach some time where children are born again and all this fades from human memory, you'll still have these stupid pointless little videos to remember how awful all this was. That way, at least I can make myself believe this all had some kind of, I don't know, point? So what's happened? With me, not much. Still moving at night, surviving, hiding in closets and underground parking complexes during daylight, and down to uh, my last few cans. So I'm hoping to hit a supermarket soon. God, what a ridiculous way to go. Starving in this new world with so many new, interesting ways to die. With the X people, things have been a little more eventful. There used to be one blob to a person, but they've started joining up. That's the best way I can put it. Things that used to be people and animals are starting to melt together, getting bigger and bigger. They've never been aggressive, but I think it's best to stay out of their way. Whatever all this is about, I am streetwise enough to know that it can't be anything good. I'll just keep moving and I hope you can do the same, whoever the hell you are. Hopefully the next time I check in with you, it's with better news than this. Day 44. I saw a shootout on the road last night. The people who are left, the ones who are still indeed people, are becoming less human. Something about situations like this, this sustained stress and pain and hopelessness, it weighs on you. There are no rules in the post-apocalypse. The only thing that can stop you from doing anything is a bullet to the head. Five or six people last night, as afraid and desperate and hungry as me, gunned each other down. They did this for reasons I will never understand, even if I wanted to, because there are no survivors left to tell the tale. What a funny world we live in. Day 45. I sleep when I can. It's surreal. I remember when I feared the dark and loved bright sunny days. Even all this time in, I still don't think I'm used to the switch being flipped. I've been having awful dreams again. I'm still running in them with a deep red sun shining up in the sky, I'm being chased by a mountain of flesh the size of Mount Everest. It's swallowing up the city behind me and it keeps getting closer. No matter how fast I go, I just, I, I can't escape. It'll get me eventually. Something terrible is going to happen soon. I just know it. Day 46. I shot a man today. I don't know if he survived. I hope he lived. We encountered each other inside an abandoned building. I think we spooked each other and didn't have any time to ask if we were friends or foes. We were too afraid either way. We both drew our weapons and I was faster than he was. When my revolver discharged and he collapsed, I ran off. Sun would come up in a few hours and I just needed to find another place to hide. What the hell have I become? I don't know how things could get any worse than this. Not to self. In the future, don't even dare to think, how could things get any worse? Because if I've learned anything since this whole nightmare started, that is never a rhetorical question. Welcome to the space between day 47 and day 64. If you're still alive and watching this, I am so sorry. So I've got good news and I've got bad news. I'll give you the good news first. I've seen more people who haven't been changed yet. And the bad news? Last time I saw them, they were being dragged out into the light, kicking and screaming in the tendrils of one of those horrible flesh monsters I was telling you about last time. They've gotten a lot bigger now. And when I told you they weren't aggressive, well, um, yeah, I, I spoke a little too soon. I can't just sleep during the day like I used to. These monsters, and that's what they are now. They're monsters, not people anymore. They patrol, they hunt. They actively enter buildings searching for hiding places, searching for people they can drag out into the light. I've seen it with my own two eyes. The second they're out, they'll just start melting and fusing with the mass, making it even bigger, adding another voice to the chorus. And I hate myself, because every time I've seen it happen, all I can think is, thank God that's not me. God, I wish I could do something to help, to save them. But that's not the world we live in. The second they touch the light, it is already over. I wouldn't be helping anyone by adding my flesh to one of those things. I don't want them using my body to get to other people. There's only one thing I can do now. Keep moving at night, stay hidden, get away from population centers. I've realized where I need to go now. I've still got a distant memory of those broadcasts in the earlier days of the event. The SCP Foundation. I noted down coordinates to the nearest facility they had on the books. And if I'm honest, 
nearest is only a relative term because at this rate, it's gonna take me an eternity to get there. But it'll be worth it in the end when I get there. It'll all be worth it if I can at least get some answers, at least know why the world turned into this hell. Those SCP folks seem better prepared for this than anyone, so even if they can't fix this, they've at least got to have answers, right? Somebody needs to have answers. I really want to believe that. When the sun goes down, I'll start moving again. If you're watching this, wish me luck. I don't have much food left. I'll do what I can. Yeah, hey, I realize I'm not looking great right now, but trust me, you should see the other guy. Day 65 to day 86. Never thought I would make it this far, but hey, life's just full of surprises. Before you ask, and I mean, why would you ask? It's not like I can hear you. It wasn't one of the monsters that did this to me. It was another person just like me. Desperate, hungry, afraid. The one difference between me and them was the fact that they had a handgun and I didn't. They asked for all the food I had and when I wasn't exactly forthcoming, they decided to shoot me and steal the last of my food while I lay bleeding on the ground. Oh, well, okay, that's not entirely fair. They did leave me with one protein bar, which I had to cave and eat a couple days ago. Since then, I've just been foraging what little food I can from plants along the way during my nighttime walks. But it isn't much, and my wound is giving me grief. I sure hope they've got doctors at this SCP Foundation, or otherwise... Ow. I may be even more out of luck than I thought. Here's the good news for you, since I know how much you love that. I'm not far off of the Foundation site now. Even in this state, I'm probably only a couple weeks away. I think maybe I can will myself to live that long, at least. If I can get some answers just <laughs> before I die, then I can be happy. And sometimes, folks, that's all you can ask for. <sighs> Final stretch. Let's hope I see you again on the other end. Stay safe. I'm here. I'm here. The SCP Foundation on day 100. But I don't understand. Where is everybody? Hello? Is anybody there? God damn it. Why is nobody here? I, I don't understand. They were meant to have the answers. They were meant to know what was going on here, but they're all gone too. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Is this it? Is it all just over? The end of the freaking world as we know it? It isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Wait, are those footsteps? Hello? Yes! Hello! I'm over here! Who's there? Oh my god, what the hell is that thing? No! No, get away from me! Oh god! Disgusting. Calvin Lucian leads the Kill Squad team through the mud and freezing rain. In front of them looms the fortress of Baron Lehman Hoadley, the eighth Overseer. The team has already been through a lot. From breaking the Overseer Council's deal with death by eliminating O5-13, to using the Spear of the Non-Believer to kill the godlike Archivist, 05-10. The hunting of Overseers has taken a toll on the Kill Squad. 05-12 almost killed Adam, and Olivia was stuck in what seemed like an endless mind game with 05-11. The first five Overseers were eliminated, but the words that the ninth Overseer spoke to Calvin Lucian before she died still run through his mind. Are you afraid of death? Now the Kill Squad is about to infiltrate one of the most heavily guarded facilities in the world to eliminate the 8th Overseer. Upon reaching the castle, the team is surprised to find the structure is in ruin. No one is supposed to know the location of 05-8 though. The fortress was supposed to be practically impregnable. They storm the castle of 05-8 all the same. The journal Calvin possesses that contains information about the members of the SCP Foundation's powerful 05 Council identifies him as a former industrialist named Baron Lehman Hoadley. With his vast wealth, Hoadley funded the Foundation at the start, and was considered the unofficial leader of the Council in its early days with immense control over the actions of the organization. The Kill Squad makes their way through the dimly lit hallways of the castle. As they turn the corner, they are surprised to find the charred remains of Baron Lehman Hoadley's bodyguards. It seems that someone or something has gotten to Hoadley before they could. The team makes their way to the main chamber and breaches the door. Laying by a still-lit fireplace is 05-8. The kill squad scans the room to make sure the killer isn't still in there with them. Adam walks over to the body and examines it. He quickly realizes that Hoadley hasn't been murdered at all. 
he sees that Baron Hoadley's body has been drastically modified using anomalous technology. The Overseer used his immortality to modify almost every part of his body to make himself stronger. Unfortunately for Baron Hoadley, when the Overseer's deal with death was broken by Calvin, the modifications to his body slowly tore him apart. His regular body could no longer support all of the modifications, and what once made him practically invincible became the very thing that destroyed him. The team leaves the castle and crosses 05-8 off their list. On their way out, Adam pulls Calvin aside. He has the feeling that Anthony hasn't been completely honest with the rest of the team. He had the feeling that Anthony was hiding something from them. Calvin had similar thoughts recently. He pushes Anthony for more information about his past, and Anthony reveals that he's over 100 years old. The vial of water from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin has was not the only one. Early in his career with the insurgency, he had confiscated other vials from a Foundation site. His squad drank the water and it extended their lives. He asks Calvin on what he plans on doing with his water from the fountain. I'm going to destroy it, Calvin tells him. Anthony agrees with this plan. Once you drink from the Fountain of Youth, you may extend your life, but a part of you dies at the same time. Vibrancy of the senses disappears, leading to a seemingly shallow life. If Anthony could go back and do it again, he never would have drank the water. Calvin receives intel from the insurgency that the seventh overseer is in a small town in Cambodia. The kill squad makes their way to the village and surveys the area, hoping to get a glimpse at the overseer who is codenamed Green. As the team conducts reconnaissance, Anthony tells them that he thinks the mission is a setup. It is too remote, and there are so many unknown variables. But Calvin is convinced that this might be their only chance to kill Green. Since Green arrived in the area, there has been non-stop chaos. She has destabilized the local governments, and now the area is in an all-out war. The team weaves through narrow passageways between houses and buildings, trying to make their way to the central compound where Green is located. Suddenly, a mob starts to form. They are getting closer and closer to the team. In a quick decision to avoid being seen, Calvin orders everyone into a nearby building. Before Anthony can follow, the mob rounds the corner. They spot Anthony, and he's forced to flee. Calvin, Olivia, and Adam watch as the mob chases after Anthony, but they have to keep moving. Calvin knows that Anthony can take care of himself, and they are too close to their goal to stop now. Calvin slowly opens the front door of the house they are hiding in and peers out. The coast looks clear, so he signals Olivia and Adam to follow him. Before they can step out into the street, a gas canister enters through a cracked doorway. The room fills with sleeping gas and the team passes out. When they are awake, they are tied up in a large room with marble vaulted ceilings. 05-7 is standing in front of Calvin. She smiles wickedly while holding a knife. She compliments Calvin on what he and his team have been able to do so far. No one believed they could pull off even a fraction of what they have. But now she has an offer for Calvin. She points towards Adam and Olivia and tells Calvin he must choose one of them to die. If he doesn't, she'll kill the leader of the rioters and plunge another part of the country into chaos. Screw you, is Calvin's response. Very well, utters Green. Have it your way. She assassinates the leader being held in her compound, then turns back to Calvin. She now threatens to torture his team until Calvin makes a choice of who to kill. Green slashes Adam's cheek with her knife as Calvin screams for Green to leave his team alone and torture him instead. Green just smiles. I'm going to enjoy killing your friends while you watch, as you have killed so many of my overseers on the council. She reaches up in the air with the knife above Adam's head. Before she can plunge the knife through his skull, a bullet passes through her hand, causing her to drop the knife. Anthony kneels on a rooftop across the courtyard, smoking sniper rifles still pointed at Green, who runs. Calvin uses the dropped knife to cut his ropes and chases after Green. He follows her to the roof where he watches as she boards a helicopter. The aircraft lifts off as Anthony fires at it from his original position, but does no serious damage. In the plaza below, the mob that has separated the team earlier becomes restless. There is complete chaos and someone fires a rocket at the fleeing helicopter. The rocket hits the tail of the aircraft, sending it crashing into the plaza full of rioters below as the crowd flees from the scene. Calvin makes his way towards the wreckage and reaches it at the same time Anthony does. Calvin looks at him, smiles, and thanks him for saving his life. Anthony smiles back, but before he can say anything, 
A gunshot rings out and a bullet rips through his neck. Calvin turns to see where it came from and is horrified to see the burning body of 05-7. Her skin has been charred black, but in her burnt hand, she holds a gun. What's left of her lips curl back in a sinister grin as she fires again and hits Anthony in the chest. He falls to the ground. Calvin runs to him and pulls out his gun to shoot 05-7, but she is already dead. Calvin holds his dying teammate as blood pours out of his neck and chest, but Calvin can stop this. He pulls out the vial of water from the fountain. No, winces Anthony, I have lived long enough. Thank you, my friend. I will see you in whatever lies beyond this life. Anthony's chest rises, then falls. It does not rise again. Olivia and Adam round the corner to see Calvin holding the lifeless body of their teammate, tears flowing from his eyes. The team holds a small ceremony and burial for Anthony, but are only halfway through their mission and can't stop now. They fly back to the United States, where an undercover insurgency agent named Kowalski informs them that 05-6 is already aware they are after him. This overseer is codenamed the American because he has the power of the entire US military at his fingertips. The Kill Squad scouts the base where the American is located. Kowalski warns them of a crate that was recently brought to the base from Site-19. The American showed great interest in whatever was in the container. The group sets up a camp on a hill overlooking the base. As the sun slowly rises the next day, the Kill Squad is spotted by a drone and forced to hop in their jeep and try to run. They make their way down the hill, finding themselves in the valley below with no clear exit. In front of them lands a helicopter as Humvees roar into the canyon behind them. The team is surrounded. A jeep pulls up and 05-6 steps out. He introduces himself as Rufus King, member of the Overseer Council, but an American citizen first and foremost. All he really wants is to protect the country he loves. Thanks to you, I've lost my immortality and can no longer effectively protect the United States anymore, the American says to Calvin but I am willing to make a deal. Your freedom for the spear of the non-believer. Rumor has it that you have the spear in your possession and you used it to kill the archivist. If you give me the spear, I will let you go. No, replies Calvin. I will never give an overseer the means to cause more destruction. The spear stays with us. Very well, the American says with a frown. Then I suppose my only other option is to take it from you but not without giving you a fair chance. Run, Calvin Lucian. Run as fast as you can. I will be coming for you. The American turns and walks towards the container from Site-19, which is being lowered from a helicopter hovering above them. Calvin sprints back to the Jeep with the other members of his team. As they drive away, they hear a horrible, guttural screech from whatever was inside the container. After a few moments, the army begins to pursue them. Out in front of the military force is 05-6 riding SCP-682. He is using a black whip to urge the creature forward, and they're gaining on the kill squad. Fast. A row of vehicles pulls up beside the American and SCP-682. Then something strange happens. A man appears in front of the oncoming forces led by the American. The man's skin bulges and seems to be moving from within. The skin of the man slouses from his body. The infection that is SCP-610 erupts out of him and onto the soldiers in the nearby jeep. SCP-610 begins to infect and consume everyone around it. Suddenly, there are thousands of instances of SCP-610 coming from the mountainside, flooding into the valley. They close in and around the army and 05-6. The American begins fighting off the flesh-eating creatures from the back of SCP-682, but he becomes overwhelmed. He can no longer focus on pursuing Calvin and his team. From the back of the jeep, Olivia pulls out her rifle. She aims and fires. The bullet hits the American in the chest. He is flung off the back of SCP-682 and engulfed in a sea of SCP-610 creatures. The kill squad continues to drive, trying to put as much distance between themselves and the SCP-610 infestation as possible. But then Calvin suddenly slams on the brake. Standing in front of them is a man in a black suit and bow tie. He introduces himself as Blackbird, the fifth overseer. According to the journal, his actual name is Mortimer J. Denning von Krocknicker. He stands in front of the jeep with a menacing grin. 
You have been causing a lot of trouble, he says, looking at Calvin. Olivia swings her gun around. Oh, please, my dear, that won't help you, von Krocknecker says. He pulls out a knife and stabs himself through the neck. He falls to the ground, apparently dead. There is a gust of wind, a whiff of ozone, and an identical copy and still very much alive von Krocknecker lands next to his own dead body. See what I mean, he says. Olivia lowers her rifle. Come with me, I have something to show you. The blackbird beckons. Seeing no other option, Calvin, Olivia, and Adam exit the jeep and follow the blackbird. As they walk, the world changes around them. The desert mountains fade away into blackness and find themselves in the near-apocalyptic London. Oh, it's good to be home, the blackbird says as they emerge onto a cobblestone street. You cannot stop the overseer's plans. However, I can give you an alternative. Let's see if any of you will take it. In front of each Kill Squad member appears a door. They have an uncontrollable urge to open their respective door and walk through. The Blackbird stands smiling as he watches Calvin, Olivia, and Adam enter each of their portals. Adam enters his door and looks around. He is in Portland. His parents walk into the room. In this universe, his family has been granted asylum. Adam never has to interact with any SCPs or the Foundation. He is free to live a normal life. From the kitchen comes Calvin wearing an apron. He is holding a steaming pot. Adam locks eyes with Calvin, who smiles at him. The blackbird whispers into Adam's ear. In this reality, both of your parents and siblings are still alive. Also, the man you love loves you back. You and Calvin could be married if you stayed here. Wouldn't that be nice? Olivia enters her door. She is on the deck of a yacht. At the bow sits an easel with art supplies. The man that Olivia once loved walks across the deck towards her. The blackbird looms over her. In this reality, you didn't accidentally kill him. This could be your happily ever after. Wouldn't that be nice? Calvin steps through his door. He is in a grassy clearing near a lake. The blackbird hisses in Calvin's ear. I'm giving you the opportunity to save your mother this time, Calvin. You were just a scared little boy, but in this reality, you can be brave. You can actually save your mother from her fate. No! Calvin screams. This isn't real! The blackbird cackles. Calvin looks away from the lake and towards the tree line. Hidden in the shadows, he can just barely make out a hooded figure. Calvin walks towards it. The blackbird follows. He is screaming at the person in the tree line. I was only trying to help! The hooded figure reaches out and hands Calvin a metal tube. He opens it to find a set of eyeglasses inside. Calvin puts them on and turns to look at the blackbird. He steps back in horror. The glasses have revealed the true form of the blackbird. He is a winged pseudo-avian monstrosity full of rage. The mysterious hooded figure directs Calvin to open the tube again. Inside is an interdimensional fishing line made by Dr. Wondertainment and a white wiffle ball bat. Calvin grabs the fishing line and wraps it around 05-5's leg. The blackbird flies into the air trying to get away from Calvin, but Calvin wraps the other end of the fishing line around his arm. The blackbird begins to jump from dimension to dimension trying to get rid of Calvin. They appear on the deck of SCP-455, in Site-19 where SCP-682 walks freely, in the dead world of SCP-2935. Every time they stop in a new dimension, Calvin takes the opportunity to attack the Blackbird with the bat, and it seems that he is slowly weakening the monster. They finally land at the bottom of a deep well foundation containment site, where the dark body that is SCP-001 is contained. Standing in front of the containment field is Allison Cho, the Black Queen, whose sole mission is to destroy the foundation. You! cries the Blackbird. You are the one who has been helping Lucian! The Black Queen nods her head. Yes, I have been helping Calvin Lucian to eliminate you and the other overseers. The Foundation must fall. You are nothing! You cannot stop me! I am the Black King! Screams 05-5. Allison Chow sighs. She pushes a button on the panel next to her, shutting down the array containing the dark body. Out of the cloud of dust appears SCP-001, a massive black creature who seemed to absorb all light. No, stop! shrieks the blackbird. SCP-001 does not move, but the room begins to shake. The blackbird continues to scream as his body folds in on itself. 
until he is reduced to a single superheated point and then blinks out of existence. Allison Chow then reactivates the containment array, sealing 001 away once again. I will return you to your reality along with your friends, says the Black Queen, but perhaps our paths shall cross again, Calvin Lucian. There is a bright flash of light, and Calvin finds himself on a private jet sitting next to Olivia and Adam. They are all shaken, but the Blackbird is dead. 05-5 has been eliminated. The three members of the team sit silently, still pondering what might have been if they stayed in the alternate realities. Suddenly, the phone on the plane begins to ring, breaking the silence. Calvin picks it up. On the other line is the fourth overseer. He has contacted Calvin to discuss surrendering to the insurgency. Unfortunately, things do not always go as planned. Calvin Lucian is about to make the most difficult and dangerous decision of his life. A world that's lost its way needs a healer, someone to patch up its wounds and tend to its pain. It needs a doctor. When day broke, the sun turned from a giver of life, the thing that wakes the rooster and makes the crops grow, to an indiscriminate killer, wiping out all organic life forms. The world seemed truly lost. But one anomalous being made it his goal to soothe the hurt, to make it safe to step into the light once more. The Plague Doctor had done his best with the limited resources afforded to him at the abandoned Foundation site. The scientists had left behind all of their equipment when the Red Sun came, when they all were transformed. He had appointed himself the site director, willing to take up the mantle when no one else would. He had assembled a brave, brilliant team of fellow anomalies, the verbose Dr. Spanko, the eloquent adventurous Lord Blackwood, and the charismatic but ravenous Ferdinand. There had, of course, been those who scoffed at his vision, who did not share his noble goal. The abominable possessive mask taunted him persistently, trying its best to get under his chitinous skin. But he did not have time to waste on such trivial psychological games, and he ignored its taunts to focus on the work. It hadn't been easy. Capturing one of the infected specimens, the former human being turned mass of oozing gelatinous flesh by the unholy light in the sky. One had made its way into the abandoned facility, sliding its way across the floor with an air of confused malice. It wanted to hurt, but it didn't know where it was, who it was anymore. But it was frightened, the play doctor could tell. A good physician always knows and can sense the fear and pain of a suffering person. It made his heart ache to see, and he knew there was only one thing to do. Try to make this poor soul well again. Everyone, please assist me in escorting the patient to my laboratory, the doctor called out. This was once a man, and I believe with our combined intellect and resources, we can return him to his former state. Ferdinand took a step toward the slimy creature, licking his lips a bit. Do you think I could have just a little bit of it? Oh, I'm so hungry, doctor, he begged. No, no, it would go against my oath as a physician to allow any more harm to come to this poor fellow. The plague doctor shook his head solemnly. Ferdinand pouted, but did not press the issue further. No. The doctor rubbed his gloved hands together in anticipation of the next task. It is imperative we contain our new friend safely, if you would, please. He gestured to several of his previous patients, now reanimated and ready to aid him with his research. The shuffling figures surrounded the blobby entity, ushering it down the hall. Confused, lost, with no real sense of a plan left in its mushy consciousness, the creature followed where it was led. The group made it back to the doctor's laboratory. Cut! shouted Dr. Spanko from his perch atop a nearby shelf. Yes, indeed, the doctor replied. A standard operating table wouldn't do for such a special patient. I have nowhere to place the restraints, you see. I will have to make do with the floor. Further my bag, if you please. The giant rushed to his side, dropping the bag at his feet. If he dies, then can I eat it? He asked, shifting from one foot to the other like a child asking a parent for a second helping of ice cream. If I am unable to save the patient, which I do deem unlikely, then... Yes, you may help me dispose of the remains, the doctor relented, but I do not hope it comes to that. He pressed a hand to his beak in deep thought for a moment, before opening his bag and pulling out a syringe filled with clear liquid. To begin, we must sedate the patient. 
He had no way to find a vein, and so he plunged the needle into the nearest section of the creature's soft surface, injecting a dose of sedative. Then he waited. The oozing motion of the entity slowed and stopped. It lay there on the ground, a still mound of flesh save for the occasional expanding and contracting motion, almost as if it was breathing. Excellent. Now there was no risk of the patient fleeing the operating room mid-procedure. He could truly begin. It was an arduous process that took hours of effort, of taking small tissue samples, attempting to make incisions only for the flesh to fuse back together seconds after the scalpel was taken away. This was truly an advanced illness, unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was enough to make him question his abilities as a doctor, but he shook the thought away. Self-pity never helped anyone. After about eight hours of continuous work, he had a breakthrough, a solution he had created long ago. A thick, green liquid sealed in a dusty jar had a miraculous effect when dripped onto one of the tissue samples. The melted flesh reconstituted, became solid, and human again. Eureka! He cried out, unable to restrain the sudden joy that leaped into his heart. This could be it. Very carefully, he filled the dropper with the green liquid. If these initial trials had been successful, then perhaps he couldn't finish the thought. Best not to get ahead of himself. He crossed to his patient and slowly began to pour the solution over the creature's viscous surface. He watched as the flesh toughened, coming together into a surface resembling human skin. It was working. It was working. But then the creature began to quiver, shaking uncontrollably like a bowl of jelly in an earthquake. The surface rippled, and the doctor could hear a high-pitched whine filling the room. Then, with a wet pop, the patient exploded sending chunks of flesh splattering all over the room, painting the walls and ceiling. The doctor cried out in shock and horror, and in spite of himself, fell to his knees in despair. He had been so close, but still, he had failed. And who could say when he would find another test subject, if he would ever find a cure? I'm afraid I do not know what to do now, the doctor admitted. Fernand sighed. The next several days passed in a haze. The doctor paced around his laboratory, mulling over his possible mistakes again and again. He had rushed the process, he was certain of that now. It was a novice mistake, the sort of thing he might have done a century or two ago. How could he have been so foolish? How could he have made that innocent pay the price for his own hubris? As the doctor locked himself away in his mind palace, Fernand occupied himself by practicing his favorite songs. Lord Blackwood rode on the massive man's shoulder as he sang through the opera Don Giovanni. I once saw a production of this at the Teatro La Fenice in Venice, Lord Blackwood interjected, his rhinopores twitching in delight at the memory. Marvelous production, marvelous city. I was there hunting a rogue tatzel worm wrecking havoc through the canals. I nearly lost my life on that voyage. Would you all be quiet for once in your miserable lives? A voice hissed from the shadows. There in the doorway, its face fixed in a frown, was the possessive mask. Black slime dripped from its eye holes, spilling down onto the plastic mannequin body it had taken hold of. Listening to you both is worse than being locked in that infernal box. The mask looked around the room, searching for someone. Where is the good doctor? It asked, voice dripping with disdain. Still moping about, counting his failures. Ignore him, my fine fellow, Lord Blackwood whispered to Fernand. Only those with weak constitutions and no achievements of their own spend their days dragging others down. When you have lived as long as I, you will learn this. <laughs> Careful, my lord. I'll stop by the kitchen and find some salt to pour on you. If you wish to fight me, then challenge me to a fair duel like a man, the colorful slug bellowed. Drawn by the sudden shouting, the doctor walked into the room. What is all this commotion? Oh, good. The mask clapped its plastic hands together, its face warping back into an eerie smile. There you are. This has all been so dreadfully boring. I came to see the remnants of your greatest shame. Are there still bloodstains on the floor in your pathetic little laboratory? You are a villain, the doctor seethed. 
Uncomfortable with the air of conflict in the room, Ferdinand and Lord Blackwood quickly exited to find another space where they could sing and share stories in peace. I simply speak the truth no one wants to hear. The mask crossed to the doctor's side with a series of light, dance-like steps that made the mannequin body creak. In fact, I have quite a few truths to share today. I've been outside, you see. Whatever's become of the sun only affects organic beings, and so... He gestured from his ceramic face to his plastic body. I am quite safe from its rays. You've been outside. The doctor couldn't keep the curiosity out of his voice. He was a scientist after all. Why, yes. Would you like to know what I've seen? Black slime dripped from the mask's mouth, pooling on the floor with a sizzling sound. I'm in no mood for tricks, the doctor warned. The mask held up his hands in mock surrender. No tricks, Doctor. But if you'd rather take your chances outside and see for yourself, I can take my leave now. No, the doctor shook his head. Please, do tell me. It's so much worse than you could even imagine. The mask's words were bleak, but its tone was gleeful. Everywhere you look up there, the light has made monsters. Humans, dogs, cats, mice, the wild beasts of the forest. All melted down into creatures you would not even recognize. But that isn't all. No, that is not. There are massive beasts, ten feet tall or more, made from dozens and dozens of the creatures coming together. They fuse and meld into one giant entity, roving the streets in search of more and more bodies to add to the pile, an oozing, gaping maw of hunger and hate that seeks only to consume and destroy. It calls out to surviving humans in the voices of their fallen loved ones, tugs at their heartstrings to lure them out of their hiding places, and then it wraps around them with fleshy tentacles, pulling them in until they are no more. Just another part of the monster. Oh, Doctor, it's terror. It's an abomination. I could watch it all day. The doctor wanted to believe the mask was lying, that it was trying to torment with him, with awful fabrications. But after all he had seen so far, he knew that its words were true. Get out of my sight, he said. Or what? The mask stared him down with its unmoving smile. I've seen what you do to your hosts, you know. Your body won't last forever, the doctor growled. Hmm, -mm. true. Maybe next I'll take yours. <laughs> the mask laughed a long, dark laugh of something ancient and evil. Then it turned and walked out the door, leaving the doctor alone. He spent so much of his time that way lately. His assistants were preoccupied, his former patients provided no real company, and so he did what he did best, carry on in solitude. He couldn't be sure how long he stood there in silence, thinking of what the mask told him. He knew it was dangerous outside, knew he was up against powerful destructive forces, but it was even worse than he had thought. What if the world was truly doomed? What if this was how it all ended? Not with a bang, but with a great melting. Suddenly, the doctor heard a sound he hadn't heard since the sun turned wrong. A scream, a human scream. Could it be? He had to see for himself. He grabbed his bag of tools and rushed down the hall, his robes fluttering behind him. There it was again, a different human voice screaming in terror. As he grew closer to the sound, he could hear footsteps, various other voices overlapping with each other. He rounded the corner, and there they were. A group of five humans, wrapped in tattered clothes, dirty and exhausted. Behind them was the entrance to what looked like a tunnel. Somehow they found a secret passage and made their way inside. Then he saw what made them scream. Clearly these people were afraid and unaccustomed to the sight of a man of Ferdinand's stature, especially when the man was drooling and staring at them with hunger in his eyes. He would have to defuse the situation quickly. Hello, welcome. We mean you no harm, strangers. 
He stepped between Fernand and the humans. The man at the front of the group brandished a firearm, pointing the barrel directly at the doctor's beak. Please, sir, there is no need for violence. What are you? The man stammered. The other members of his party cowered behind him. An ally, if you will permit me to be. I'm a physician, you see, working on a cure for the condition that plagues the world. With a shaking hand, the man slowly lowered his gun. He did not put it away, though. You've figured out a cure for those things? I am in the process of developing it. So far, I have not been successful, but perhaps with your help? How do we know we can trust you? The man demanded. How am I supposed to know you're not part of this? Do you know who this man is? Fernand bellowed. This is Dr. John Watson, and I am Detective Sherlock Holmes, the greatest investigator in the world. There isn't a case we can solve. The man looked at the woman next to him, and the two shared a wide-eyed glance. This, this guy's crazy, he whispered furtively. Put your weapon away, and we can speak more calmly, the doctor proposed. At this inopportune moment, a few of his revived patients shambled into view, and the man screamed again. This time he fired his weapon, shooting at one of the walking corpses. The bullets ricocheted off the walls, and several of the patients were hit. Please stop! With no other option, the doctor grabbed the man's arm, hoping to get a hold of the weapon and end the potential bloodshed. As soon as his gloved hand made contact, the man went limp and dropped to the ground with a hard thud. The woman next to him pulled him into her arms, checking his pulse. He's dead! She shrieked, tears streaming down her face. I... I am so sorry, my lady. I did not intend... She grabbed the man's gun and trained it on the doctor once more. You killed him! She cried. The other survivors were too shaken to speak, to move. One of them had his back turned to the group and was staring into the darkness behind him. Whatever he was looking at, it was worse than the chaos unfolding. But no one noticed the beige flesh tentacle snaking along the ground until it was too late. Until it had grabbed a hold of the man's ankle and dragged him into the tunnel with a shriek of pure, unadulterated terror. The woman nearly dropped her gun at the sound, whirling around to see what had happened. Deep in the tunnel, the scream warped into a wet gurgling sound, and then there was silence for a long moment. But then, something worse. A gooey, slimy sound. The sound of something enormous, something soft and fleshy, making its way through the tunnel and toward the group. Another tentacle curled around the edge of the opening, then another joined it. Something emerged that might have once been a hand, but it had melted into something unrecognizable. The monster emerged piece by piece until the doctor could see the entire thing. It looked like a heap of people, dozens of them clambering on top of each other, wrapping their limbs together until their flesh and insides emptied out and fused into a shapeless mass. It moved a bit like a giant slug, slimy and slow, but it seemed to know it could take its time. As the survivors scrambled back away from it, Ferdinand and the doctor taking a few steps back of their own. The sound of human voices filled the room. There were unintelligible whispers, the soft giggle of a child, a woman weeping. Come and be with us. A little boy's voice broke through the cacophony. Mommy, I miss you. Don't you miss me? The woman with the gun let out a broken sob. Billy? She sniffled. It's me, Mommy. The innocent voice continued, emanating from somewhere deep inside the monstrous mass that crept along the ground, swelling and grasping with its ropey tentacles. Come play with me outside. All you have to do is come outside. Madame, the creature is not who it claims to be. The doctor spoke up, and it seemed to shake the woman out of a trance. You're not my son. She hissed, squeezing the trigger and firing at the monster. The bullet made contact with a wet, useless slap and disappeared into the roving pile of the fallen. She fired again and again, but the monster did not stop. It did not even slow down. It lashed out with a tentacle that wrapped around her throat in a single fluid motion and snapped her neck with a crack. She fell to the ground and the tentacle pulled her into its depths until she was no longer visible. She hadn't been taken by the sun, not yet, but she was still lost. The rest of the survivors followed, their screams silenced one by one. The doctor felt the same overwhelming sense of hopelessness wash over him, the same shadow that had passed over him when he lost the last patient. What could he do? He was one physician against an overpowering force of destruction. Perhaps he could touch it, and it would fall dead like so many other organisms before. But what if it didn't? What if instead it wrapped around his body and squeezed the life from him? 
What if it carried him out into that cursed sunlight and he melted away like the others? He had to make a decision because the beast was advancing toward him. Doctor! Fernand shouted. It's going to destroy our facility! Indeed, the creature was flailing its appendages around, beating against the walls and trying to tear down steel and plaster, break down the shelter, until they too were exposed to the deadly light. I'm afraid this may be the end, my friend, the doctor lamented. I can see no hope for us now. No! Fernand shook his head. Let me save us. Let me lead it back outside. You'll be taken, the doctor cried. Perhaps not. I am a magnificent specimen, after all. I believe I can withstand the sun and return to continue our work together. Fernand scooped his sleeping Lord Blackwood from his shoulder and placed him gingerly on a nearby shelf. Thank you for your company. Then he turned back to the doctor. And thank you for my freedom and your friendship. It has been an honor. Before the doctor could protest, Ferdinand was running, his thunderous steps pounding the earth as he led the monster in a chase. It took the bait, following this new, large target back outside. He sealed off the tunnel behind them, ensuring the beast would not return the way it came. He wanted to believe Ferdinand's bravado, to think that the behemoth of a man had survived outside. But that night, he saw the great beast ooze past a window, and he could make out that familiar, wide, toothy grin protruding from its side. Just like that. The greatest assistant he had ever had was lost. Thank you for your service, my friend, he whispered to himself. I solemnly swear to you, your death shall not be in vain. The military helicopter sailed through the skies at a steady pace, its destination somewhere in Southwest Asia, along one of the many points where the legendary Euphrates and Tigris rivers meet. Depending on the outcome, this mission may have changed the course of the SCP Foundation and its activities forever, or it might do nothing at all. Such was often the way when it came to dealing with the unpredictable and the anomalous. Inside the helicopter, Dr. Anton Zarkov was practically rattling with nervous excitement. Ever since he'd been assigned to the 682 termination detail, after years of wasting away in an archival desk job, he'd seen the kind of anomalies you wouldn't believe. 173, that nightmarish statue that snaps the necks of anyone who dared to look away from it. 811, the strange and also strangely adorable Swamp Woman, whose caustic mucus could reliably melt seemingly any organic matter, save, of course, 682 itself. And Dr. Zarkov was particularly astonished by the aftermath of the epic battle between 096 and 682, which left both of these indestructible monsters horribly maimed. But all of that, it was nothing compared to what they were going to witness today. Dr. Zarkov muttered a prayer to himself in frightened reverence. Dr. Clef, who was sitting across from him in the helicopter, wasn't quite as wound up. Like some action movie cliche made manifest, he sliced chunks from a plump red apple with a bowie knife and sucked the pieces off the blade. Clef found Zarkov's nervousness little more than amusing. First time at sight zero rookie, Clef asked between apple slices. Dr. Zarkov nodded forcing a meek smile. Clef just chuckled. <laughs> uh, you're wasting your time, you know, Clef said. Everyone takes a shot at the reptile. I faced it down myself once, mano y mano, and during that moment I realized something. As much as it pains me to ever throw in the towel, we're not going to kill this thing. It's just a budget sink. Of course, these kinds of doubts had crossed Dr. Zarkov's mind before. He'd watched countless termination attempts, organized by far more senior researchers than himself, fail and fail embarrassingly. Something about signing your name up for 682 termination was like tying on a blindfold, grabbing a bat, and stepping up to a piñata. Except in this case, the piñata isn't wearing a blindfold, and somehow it can hit you back. It is a one-way ticket to professional humiliation, and if you're unlucky enough to get too close when things go south, it can be so much worse. But Dr. Zarkov well and truly believed that he would be the exception to so much miserable failure. After all, this was an idea nobody had tried before. An announcement over the intercom signaled that they had now entered Site Zero airspace. They'd be landing shortly, and just like that, Dr. Zarkov was all raised hairs and goose flesh once again. It seemed like such a hazy, distant miracle that his project proposal would even get majority approval from the O5 Council. And now he was about to touch down and actually see it. 
Naturally, Dr. Clef noticed Dr. Zarkov's emotional cues, and like so many playground bullies, decided to seize on it. Don't buy into the hype, Dr. Clef said. <laughs> it's really not that special. The helicopter touched down. Dr. Zarkov felt defensive. He was almost tempted to use hard words, but he realized from Dr. Clef's mischievous smile that perhaps that was always the intention. He certainly had a reputation, if one were to put it in the most neutral terms possible. But this was your 001 proposal, Dr. Clef, Zarkov countered. I would have thought you'd be more invested in this. Dr. Clef rose to his feet and sheathed his bowie knife as the helicopter's side door opened. He gestured for Dr. Zarkov to get up and follow him before saying, Believe me, even a giant flaming demigod loses its luster when you need to write enough of those stupid reports on it. The two researchers disembarked from the helicopter and walked into the legendary containment facility, Site Zero. One of the most important and secretive containment sites out there, even by the standards of the ever-clandestine SCP Foundation. If ever containment procedures failed here, they'd be staring down the barrel of an unprecedented situation, a Patmos XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. After all, they were dealing with one of the most serious and powerful anomalies they'd ever contained here. Clef and Zarkov entered the control room, filled with huge monitors displaying every kind of recordable metric, but the largest screens were dominated by long-range drone footage of the iconic anomaly they were all there to see, SCP-001 perhaps better known as Uriel, the Gate Guardian. While Dr. Clef remained unfazed, Dr. Zarkov felt a single tear crawling down his cheek. He had never seen an entity so utterly awe-inspiring. An impossibly tall, glowing humanoid entity with eight great fiery wings and a glowing blade made of pure heavenly fire, every bit as hot as the sun. To think that such an incredible creature existed on the same earth as him made him feel so incredibly small. The theories as to the creature's true nature were as myriad as they were unknowable. Some of the more devout among the Foundation's ranks even believe that he is a direct servant of the Abrahamic God, guarding the gate to paradise, the Garden of Eden, heaven itself. Dr. Claff just laughed. <laughs> Everything you'd hope it'd be, Zarkov? He said. Dr. Zarkov nodded. And more, Dr. Clef, and more. Even from such a distance, the raw power of the Gate Guardian is impossible to ignore. It radiates off of the being like an invisible aura. Dr. Zarkov had read all the files to get within a kilometer of the mighty entity would be to court death. Anyone who approached it would taste the heat of its sword, cleave them apart at the atomic level, and effectively erasing them from existence. It's about as dead as anyone could possibly be, save for someone being thrown into SCP-3930 and literally removed from the plane of existence. SCP-3930 had failed to annihilate the hard-to-destroy reptile, but perhaps where that whole lot of nothing had failed, the Gate Guardian would succeed. It remained floating, fixed on one place, as though waiting for something. But what? Perhaps a fateful confrontation with a certain reptilian nightmare, Dr. Zarkov hoped. Like many, he had heard the most famous story involving SCP-001 The Gate Guardian, which took place before even the days of the SCP Foundation. After all, every foundation needs a founder, doesn't it? And that's how it began. The founder was a mysterious figure, no matter who you ask. Some say it was 05-1, others say it was the legendary administrator. Some even believe that it was someone else, someone older, someone who predated even the current 05 council and administrator. A wise and learned figure, going on a pilgrimage around the known world in hopes of expanding their perspective and seeking out the strange and unusual. It was traveling down the River Tigris that the Founder encountered the Gate Guardian, of course, as always, from a mile away. The Founder saw the distant glowing point shaped like a human being with wings. It was unlike anything they'd ever borne witness to. That's when the Founder felt a door open in the back of their mind and something sneak in. A single word, projecting somehow infinite authority. Prepare. The very presence of the word made the Founder's body rattle. Never had they heard such a voice, conveying such certainty and power. It had to be the voice of the distant glowing figure. It couldn't be anything else, could it? Much like Dr. Zarkov would experience hundreds of years later, the Founder, 
even as a person so powerful, knowledgeable, and influential, suddenly felt so unimaginably small. The founder became aware of not just the extent of the world around them or even the universe, but a terrifying multiverse of possibilities. There was light out there, of course, but even more darkness, and terrifying things were hiding in the dark. Is that what prepare meant? Did it mean to be ready for all the terrible things hiding in the dark, just waiting for the opportunity to strike? Just how great was the extent of the things humanity didn't understand out there? The founder's mind was flooded with so many possibilities. If there was a tide of monsters in the blackness that needed to be fought back, it was too much for any one person to ever handle. The founder needed a group, all gathered around the same mission, to contain the coming threat that the great glowing being had warned them about. People of focus, commitment, and sheer willpower. People who would accept the knowledge of the terrible things in the darkness and still not waver in the face of their great and noble challenge. People who, if necessary, would be willing to die in the dark so that the rest of the human race would live in the light. They would be humanity's greatest defenders, even though they would defend in secret. This was how it had all begun, supposedly. Dr. Zarkov had heard the story whispered many times while conducting his research into SCP-001. And now here he stood, perhaps where the founder had been standing all those years ago. The SCP Foundation had faced down greater threats than SCP-682. The Hanged King, the Sealed King, the Scarlet King. Hell, if they wanted to, they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Burger King. And all of that had begun with a single word from the Mighty Gate Guardian. Surely an ornery, overgrown lizard wouldn't be too much for it to handle. But of course, they hadn't just come here to look at the Gate Guardian. That'd be an egregious waste of time and helicopter fuel. They'd come here transporting precious cargo, a chunk of SCP-682's flesh cut from the beast itself. Currently, it was attached to yet another remote-controlled drone, set on a collision course for the Gate Guardian. Dr. Zarkov watched the video feeds with sweaty palms as he saw the drone and its diabolical cargo enter the video's view, getting closer to the Gate Guardian by the moment, closer, closer, until... The Gate Guardian struck out with its great and terrible sword. For such an astronomically huge being to move so incredibly fast was astounding in and of itself. But what Dr. Zarkov found even more exciting was the result. In one quick slash of its solar blade, both the drone and the SCP-682 tissue sample were utterly evaporated, gone, reduced to less than even ash. Dr. Zarkov's face split into a manic grin. If it could destroy the tissue sample, then surely it could destroy the monster itself. And what a glorious day that would be. Meanwhile, back at the cross-testing chambers of Site-19, SCP-682 was having another miserable day. It was dragged half-melted out of its acid tank at 3 a.m. in the morning and left slowly regenerating on the floor. A typical SCP Foundation wake-up call. It thought to itself, with a roll of its still regenerating eyes. What form of horrible torment would be in store for it this time? It began scrolling through its mental Rolodex for the most recent failed but painful termination attempts. Oh, yes, of course. They tried suffocation via vacuum. That definitely made SCP-682 feel a little lightheaded, at least. Until, of course, it adapted its body to begin releasing a gas of similar composition to its native atmosphere, which had certainly given those white-coated wearing sadists a lot to take note about. Then, how could it forget? They tried roasting it to death with extremely high temperatures. Thankfully, as always, it had a trick up its sleeve, adapting a carapace made of solid helium to defend it from the fire then shattering it to shred a bunch of those buffoons in the orange jumpsuits. Then they'd cut off a sample of its flesh, shoved it into some absurd industrial blender before shoving what's left into a centrifuge. What a divine pleasure it had been for 682 to hear the explosion down the hall, when the antimatter embedded in its genes went off and put a number of those idiotic Foundation drones in the hospital for months. Serves them right to continually meddling in the matters of forces they couldn't even hope to understand. And today, they were feeding at the carcass of a dead cow. SCP-682 sighed, 
It felt sometimes that the dolts testing it had forgotten the note reading, highly intelligent, on its file. Being dragged into one of those ghastly chambers and given some form of novel stimulus could only mean one thing. Something stupid and painful was going to happen. Said stupid, painful thing in this case was that the cow was spiked with an instance of SCP-3521, also known as the banana pill, by Dado. What followed was a remarkably absurd instance, even by SCP-682 cross-test standards, where a huge number of bananas spontaneously burst out of 682's body. Being a big fan of bananas, apparently, 682 was actually able to eat and metabolize the bananas faster than the anomalous banana pill, by Dotto, could produce them. And because bananas are each individually slightly radioactive, 682 was able to synthesize this collective radiation into a powerful death ray that it used to cause a great deal of death and destruction. As far as Dr. Zarkov and the rest of the SCP Foundation were concerned, this thing being cleaved apart on an atomic level by the Gate Guardian couldn't come soon enough. Sometimes it took the ultimate knight to slay the ultimate dragon. Not long after that, SCP-682 was dosed up on enough sedatives to give New York City a week-long nap and carted over to Site Zero on a heavily secured armored convoy. Taking SCP-682 this far between containment sites was considered a matter of grave seriousness. In other words, the result of this little experiment better have been good to justify the insane security risk it took to even get the damn lizard out here. Dr. Zarkov and Dr. Clef decided to co-supervise the cross-test from the safety of the Site Zero observation deck. Either would have been foolish to want to get any closer. Even Dr. Clef, while undeniably a loose cannon, didn't have an outright death wish. Unless, of course, wishing death on SCP-682 would count. 682's sedated body was strapped to a large unmanned vehicle, the kind they might use for an exploratory mission on another planet and sent in the direction of the Gate Guardian's deadly proximal zone. A secondary camera drone was also sent in to lag behind, correctly predicting that when the Gate Guardian struck SCP-682, it would obliterate the unmanned vehicle too. And whatever happened out there, the Foundation needed it on camera. Dr. Zarkov had sweaty palms and gritted teeth, seeing the culmination of his professional career unfold in front of him. Dr. Clef was looking at a meme on his phone. As 682 got closer, it began hearing a booming voice in its head, just like the founder had so long ago. The voice simply said one word over and over, getting louder as the unmanned vehicle brought the two titans closer and closer and closer. Die. 682, still feeling groggy, thought, Oh, if it only were so simple. And then it happened. SCP-682 entered the dreaded one kilometer range. The Guardian slashed down with its mighty sword, creating a brilliant flash of light. In the aftermath, the unmanned vehicle was obliterated, and 682 was left heavily injured on the ground, still trying to process what had just happened. 682 looked up, sobered by the pain, and saw the being that had dealt this blow. 682 began to sneer. Is this meant to be the garden? It said before breaking into a venomous laugh. <laughs> this is not the garden. The garden is far west of here. The gate guardian struck again with its flaming blade, once again projecting that single word. Die, 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 die. When the smoke cleared, 682 was even more horrifically injured, with only one limb left but still against all odds, alive. It used the one limb to drag itself towards the Gate Guardian, fueled by pure rage and spite. Die? You command me to die? Oh, wouldn't we all like that? But this is my curse for suggesting the fruit. The reptile growled. Back at the base, Dr. Zarkov was mortified. How could it possibly be surviving all this? The sword was meant to cleave apart its victims on an atomic level. Atomic! It's in freaking atoms, goddammit! Dr. Zarkov wished he had a paper bag to breathe into. Dr. Clef, showing an uncharacteristic degree of compassion, patted Zarkov on the back, saying, It's okay, buddy. We all remember our first time. Back at the center of the action, the Gate Guardian blasted 682 with its solar blade again. Somehow, despite the terrifying power wielded by the Guardian, 682 continued to live. It was alive, barely, 
but after three strikes from the sword, to be alive with whatever the evil version of a miracle would be. This is not the garden, and you are not Yoriel! 682 roared before spitting at the Gate Guardian. Pretender! One more violent strike from the Gate Guardian, and 682 finally collapsed, unconscious from the extent of its pain and its injuries. But despite all of Dr. Zarkov's hopes, the Gate Guardian did not strike a killing blow on the unconscious beast. Instead, it transmitted another word, another order, impossible for any human being to ignore. Remove. As though in a trance, the workers of Site Zero, including Dr. Zarkov and Dr. Clef, entered the forbidden one-kilometer exclusion zone. The Gate Guardian allowed them safe passage, as they used tools and vehicles to pick up the heavily injured SCP-682 and cart it away from the Gate Guardian's feet. After they all came back to their senses, Dr. Zarkov simply said, What just happened? Dr. Clef just shrugged. I've learned to stop questioning it. It almost goes without saying that the inner workings of the SCP Foundation are kept secret from the general population. Your average Joe doesn't need or want to know about the terrifying entities and bizarre experiments happening behind the closed doors of the various Foundation research sites. But there are some secrets of the SCP Foundation that even its own staff know very little about. One such mystery is the highly classified and immensely powerful O5 Council, or Overwatch Council, that oversees everything that goes on within the SCP Foundation. They are considered the highest authority within the organization, but very little is known about them. In fact, according to one official report in the SCP Foundation archives, the O5 Council does not exist at all. Stick with me here. There are decades of reports concerning the Council. There is a wealth of historical evidence pointing to their existence and influence, but they do not definitively exist. At least, they don't right now. Take a deep breath, try and untangle the knots we just tied in your brain, sit back, and listen. This is the story of SCP-001, the O5 Council itself. In 1965, SCP Foundation Administrator William Cohen was preparing to leave his position. To prepare his successor, H.V. Oleander, Administrator Cohen drafted a series of letters intended to pass on important and highly guarded knowledge to the man who would take his place. In the letter, Administrator Cohen explained that he was retiring early for a specific reason, writing, A dark lynch to my mind, sticking to every neuron and slowing my every thought. In truth, I am unwell. Cohen's decline had begun eight years prior, in late 1957, after the launch of Soviet space probe Sputnik 1 into the Earth's orbit. The Foundation's interest had been drawn to the probe after a foreign signal had been detected trying to communicate with it. Not a signal from a foreign nation, mind you, but something from much further away, and likely something that was not human. Whatever it was, it was trying to communicate, and it was getting closer. On January 4th, 1958, the signal stopped and an unidentified object arrived on Earth. Cohn was summoned to the war room at Site 00, much to his surprise. It was highly unusual for guests to be invited to the site. There, they worked together to identify the nature of the situation with Sputnik, until a single burst of gamma radiation was detected and Sputnik's orbit began to decay. The Council panicked, calling heads of state and calling for as many resources as possible. They had worked themselves into a frenzy and were planning to shoot down the first space probe in Earth's history. Eventually, the decision was placed in Cohen's hands. Let the probe land on its own or shoot it down. Overwhelmed by the Council's intensity, Cohen told them to do what they thought was best. They shot it down. He did not want to, but he crumbled under the pressure. There were so many of them and only one of him, and they seemed so certain in their decision. This was the first decision in his career that Cohen regretted, and it was presumably followed by many more. He continued in his letter saying, And now what credibility do I have left to disagree with them? I am but a mouthpiece, a sad old puppet tangled up and caught in the very strings used to make him dance. Cohen wrote his letter to his successor with one warning. Just as I have shown you vulnerability here in the hopes I might gain your trust, Please consider asking the same from those who would insist you trust them. 
In March of 1958, following the incident with Sputnik, the O5 Council collectively submitted a notice to the Foundation's Leadership Committee. They stated simply, The individual you call your administrator has proven insufficient. We solicit you to make your preparations and nominate another. No individual members of the Council wrote in, but rather submitted their thoughts as a collective, as if thinking together as one single mind. The language used was also curious, saying, your administrator, rather than our administrator. The O5 Council seemed to think of itself as something separate from the SCP Foundation, its own entity rather than simply a powerful arm or leader of the organization itself. On June 11, 1962, another notice was sent out. It read, Foundation, a life lived in service of the greater good is invalidated if death does not also serve. On November 11, 1965, a third notice was sent out, this time to all Foundation staff. Please join us in remembering the life and career of Administrator William Cohen. The only constant is change. Because of this, the erosion of his skills, abilities, knowledge, and confidence was inevitable. Administrator H. V. Oleander took over the position for many years after Cohen's demise. In 1988, he prepared to step down and drafted a letter to his successor, Natalia Ellingbrook. Like Cohen before him, Oleander tried his best to explain where he went wrong, in the hope that she might do better. Oleander began the letter, I used to have such an ego. This job, this life, and the burdens that surround it crush and squeeze you until all you have left is what they force you to keep. My mind and my soul feel as though they've been contorted into the shape of someone I no longer recognize. My predecessor, may he rest in peace, described his years as if he were trapped behind smoky glass and made to watch a foggy world pass him by. Like some sort of voyeur, I too feel imprisoned but I realized that it was never a looking glass. It is a mirror. The events detailed in the letter began in November of 1985, after a powerful storm had ripped through New England and caused severe damage to Site-31's power grid. During the power outage, a multi-stage containment breach occurred and an unnamed Infovor escaped from the facility. The entity was lost until March of 1986, when it was detected in a government facility in Warsaw, Poland. Determined to make up for his previous failure, Oleander organized a mission to bring the entity back into custody. His team tracked it down and was prepared to apprehend the entity's host, when the O5 Council expressed concern that this behavior might cause an international incident and intervened. The Council made the decision to reach out to local and international governments in Poland, allowing the entity to escape to Pripyat, Ukraine. Oleander and the Council went head-to-head -head on this, pushing and pulling and becoming increasingly aggressive on either side. Oleander could not make up his mind about what to do, listen to the Council, or trust his own gut. On April 26, 1986, his indecision resulted in a nuclear disaster in Soviet territory. Not only that, but the entity still evaded containment. The mission was a complete failure. The O5 Council submitted a report on the incident stating, We recommended that the healing process commence by first assigning blame. The collective good would be served by purging liability. And, we would have helped. Anyone would have helped. Why deny it? By now, the pattern has probably become clear to you. The administrator and the Council fall into conflict over a difficult decision. Something goes horribly wrong, a new administrator is chosen, the former administrator writes them a letter to prepare them for the heavy demands of the job, and the cycle begins again. As you might expect during those days of her administration, Oleander's replacement, Natalie Ellingbrook, sat down to write a letter of warning to one Michelle Wilkies, who was chosen to replace her. Ellingbrook began her letter. As you've likely surmised from our few meetings, I walk with a pronounced limp and favor my left leg. How I came to be like this isn't especially interesting, but what it did to me might be of interest to a person in your position. Any man or woman changes when they are exposed to pain. Simply put, it has to go somewhere. If you hold it all within yourself, it may stay contained, but it will surely destroy you when you've had your fill. It festers in all the spaces you let it occupy warping and scarring what used to be healthy, happy tissue sat beneath. Some people have hobbies, but me, 
I've always just had my work. I've been ringside for so much pain in my time with the Foundation. My predecessor left me a note, much like I am leaving you, and in it he warned me of the tremendous duty and guilt he hid in order to do his job. Although the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune stung him quite keenly, I assure you I have suffered every bit his equal. The breach at the Olympics in 94, losing control of Site 248 in 96, botched facility transfer of Hong Kong in 97, bombings in Bali in 02, the dispute with the ORIA in the Congo in 03, the GOC ultimatum in 04, she continued. Although I have weathered much, my tenure is up not with the sort of precipitating bang that ousted Oleander, but rather the quiet whimper of stepping away from a battle I no longer wish to fight. I am tired of the council calling a meeting on every decision I try to make, and I am tired of calling one on every decision they try to make without me. I guess that reasoning is another tribute to the selfish life I have led. My ideal way to say goodbye would have been to simply stop coming in. My desk would have sat empty, emails unread, until one day a courier showed up with my keys and badge. But even here, at the end of my career, the O5 Council insists on refusing to let me be by myself. So tomorrow I will play the part of a dutiful officer resigning her post and walk away from Site 00 with my head held high and those overbearing bastards in the rearview mirror. I pray that your head will never be so bowed as mine has. Administrator Wilkies took her predecessor's words to heart and began her tenure with a new proposal for Project Tethys. The project would include modifications to the Three Gorges Dam Facility at the Yangtze River. As part of a containment procedure for Entity 2005-C-ET-011, the Council refused to approve her proposal. Administrator Wilkies insisted that they provide a list of concerns, explaining what their issues with their proposal were. The two argued back and forth over the necessity of a meeting until the Council submitted this note to her. We know how important it is to get off on the right foot. Although this body respects you and the autonomy which you command, we have also seen many come and go. You were chosen from your peers, but they have chosen many others in the past. We remain unconvinced. Before you, Allingbrook, who spent her whole life pushing others aside so she could lead. She left all others behind. Trees with no roots do not hold to the ground. Before her, Oleander, who wanted so much to be seen as your hero in white. He could no longer live with himself once his clothes were stained, but the sin does not define the saint. Before him, Cohen, who wanted nothing more than to be the one who made the decisions. He collapsed in on himself when there was no easy victory. No man is an island, and a dozen more whose names we have subrogated. You need us. You are not enough. Administrator Wilkies was offended by this response and argued that the meeting was unnecessary. She asked for the council to trust her expertise and the expertise of her employees. They responded, your distinctiveness did not arise from the ether. You are a synthesis of available materials and experiences. If needed, another could be synthesized. We are needed. We are necessary. We synthesize. You are not. You cannot. Become we, or become they. The choice is yours. Administrator Wilkie suddenly understood. The Council was not a part of the Foundation. They were something else entirely. Though she couldn't be completely sure what they were, she knew one thing for certain. They were not her friends. She fired back at the Council's threats. You cast your shadow over the future with your threats and intimidation. Certain we would be nothing without you. But I'm forced to wonder, who or what would you be without us? I stand with the countless thousands that have died for our mission. The people that have engineered our solutions. The people that will build them. And the people that will risk their lives in order to carry out these procedures in the hope our mission might one day be complete. Without them, I know I would be nothing. We are willing to take our chances without you. I'm going to offer you the same choice you gave me. Become we, or become they. Several days passed with no response, and Administrator Wilkies made the most difficult decision of her career. She suspended the appointment of the O5 Council until a day comes when it becomes necessary again. Secure Area 00 has been set up around the area containing SCP-001. The area has been classified, 
designated Level 6 or Cosmic Secret. The coordinates of this secure area are stored in cranial implants placed in 15 carefully selected Foundation leaders, including Ethics Committee members and Site Directors. These candidates can participate in voting once a vote is called, but are to be kept unaware of their status as voters until it becomes necessary. If a supermajority votes to decrypt the contents of these cranial implants, the location of Secure Area 00 will be revealed to them. If the security of these implants becomes compromised, Cogita.AIC will generate a new protocol, and a new list of candidates will be selected. The original candidates will have the encrypted information deleted from their minds. No one may access Secure Area 00 at any time for any reason unless the aforementioned vote takes place. Operation protocols, defenses, building schematics, and all other information about the site have been expunged from Foundation records. Oh, well, what's this? A new addendum has been unlocked. This is for your eyes and ears only. Yes, I'm talking to you. Do not share this information with anyone else. A retinal scan has confirmed your identity, and the Cogito protocol has been executed. You are receiving this addendum because Administrator Michelle Wilkies is dead after nearly 20 years of service. Before her death, she prepared a statement regarding the role of Administrator at the Foundation. The addendum contains a message from Administrator Michelle Wilkies to you, her designated successor. Surprise! You have been chosen as the next Administrator for the SCP Foundation. You may be surprised, asking, Really? Me? Yes. You. You may not know it, but you were chosen quite some time ago. The cranial implant has been in place for years. Now it is ready to be activated. Michelle Wilkie's message is intended to prepare you for the trials and tribulations that lie ahead, and to encourage you to ask yourself, what kind of leader will you be? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to perform this most solemn duty? The following comes from the former administrator herself. Listen carefully and consider what she has to say. Your future at the Foundation, the fate of your subordinates, and your very legacy may depend on it. Consider now, before fate takes away the luxury of time, what type of person, co-worker, and leader you want to be. Each and every day, one of the administrators before me was challenged in terms both great and small during their tenures, and I was no exception to this pattern. The office you occupy is not about the power and influence you now command, nor is it ever about the unfathomable responsibility you must now shepherd. It is instead about the character, integrity, and vision with which you will meet the test of leadership, and should you prove worthy, surmount it. You and the people you will lead must be asked to undertake tasks no person should ever be asked to carry out. Yet duty and the safety of all mankind demand that you make this sacrifice. For them, for each other. If your resolve should ever falter, know that everyone you lead stands with you. We are ready to follow you into the blackest night if you let us believe in the promise of dawn. But should your resolve ever break, the Council awaits. They will invite you to Site 00 if you ask. You need only surrender. Best wishes, M. Wilkies, former administrator. What exactly is the O5 Council? That is a question not easily answered. They are not flesh and blood, not individual minds and feelings, but something else entirely. They are a collective, something that thinks, breathes, and votes together as one being. They view the world as two things, we and they. As you prepare to take on the role of administrator, keep in mind who you are. Be strong, be brave, be resolute, and hold on to your sense of right and wrong. But if you ever should falter, if you decide to stop being you and become we, there is always Site 00. Remember, even though they do not officially exist, the Council awaits. It has been one month since the end of the world. Thirty long days since Stella had watched her husband dissolve in front of her. One minute mowing the lawn like it was any other lazy afternoon, and the next collapsing into a useless pile of flesh and jelly. The end didn't come like she always thought it would, with hellfire raining down and pale riders galloping across the land on horseback. It began in the kitchen, with her humming a song to herself, mixing up a pitcher of lemonade before she rejoined her family in the sunshine. Then they were gone, lost forever when the sun turned wrong. She didn't even have time to grieve them properly 
before the threat turned on her, as the creatures that had once been her husband, her son, and her daughter swarmed to the door, slamming their new bodies against the wood with wet slaps, calling out to her in warped voices, begging her to step back outside. She covered her ears and wept for hours, until she had no tears left to cry. It didn't take long for Stella to figure out that whatever had happened to her family, it was happening all over the world. The small town she had known and loved had transformed into a hellscape, a maze of monsters and deadly light. She retreated underground to old mine shafts and tunnels, left abandoned decades ago when the local coal trade had dried up. There, she quickly discovered that she wasn't the only one with that idea. There were others, survivors, who had managed to make their way down into the dark, away from the horrors above. There weren't many, and she could never get to attach to the ones she did meet, in case they too were lost to the sun. But as the days wore on in the tunnels, she found herself forming a small group of stragglers. Not quite a family, but something that could be one day, and definitely much better than going it alone. There was Stella, of course, using her background as an elementary school teacher to keep everyone on track and working together. Then there was Brian, a former volunteer firefighter whose training and skills with an axe came in handy more than once. There was Trina, a teenage girl who had been babysitting when everything went to hell, who had a knack for evading the flesh monsters and making supply runs. And then there was Doris, former military nurse and current de facto team medic, sharp and capable in spite of being in her late 70s. They were brave people, brilliant, and refused to give up. Others came and went, spare survivors they picked up as they navigated their way, raiding the ruins of grocery stores and hospitals, but they always wound up leaving again. Or worse, something would go wrong, and the sunlight would claim another victim. But the four of them stayed together, Stronger with their combined skills, willpower, and ability to sleep in shifts and keep an eye out for trouble. After some time in the tunnels, the group had come across a massive abandoned facility. None of them could determine where it came from or what organization might have run it, but it appeared to have been some kind of research lab. It was isolated, cut off from outside influences better than any of their previous hideouts had been. Whoever had once worked here had cleared out or been taken out in a hurry. But in their place, they had left behind rations, medical equipment, emergency generators, and clean drinking water. There were enough supplies to keep the group going for months, if they rationed carefully. And so they settled in. The abandoned research facility, whatever it once was, became their makeshift home. This unexpected sanctuary was cut off from the rest of the world. Clinical, cold, lonely, but a safe place for them to rest their heads. Now it had been a month since this all began. Stella shook her head at this realization, the passage of time feeling almost meaningless at this point. What did a month even mean anymore? What was a day when she couldn't even see the sun rise and set? As she sat there warming herself by the side of a foraged space heater, she thought about missing the stars, the moon, the promise of the cosmos. A time when the vast open sky was an invitation to dream, instead of something to hide from. That time was gone now. There was nothing to do but mourn it and carry on, if not for her, then for the others. They had all found ways to keep busy in this new place. Trina took to exploring the empty halls, the laboratories filled with strange equipment, the small rooms that looked like prison cells or police interrogation rooms. She had cooked up some theory about it being a government facility, like something out of an old episode of The X-Files. Brian had found an on-site library, filled with history books and scientific texts. There was enough to read in there, he said, that by the time he was finished, he would have the equivalent of several doctorate degrees. Doris had taken initial stock of all the medical supplies available at the site. Gauze, disinfectant, vials upon vials of medications she had never heard of, and had categorized them all neatly. Now she spent her hours mostly sitting with Stella, telling her stories about whatever she felt like. Her time overseas, her late husband, their children, decades-old neighborhood gossip. It felt good to talk, no matter what it was about. It felt human. They all had their ways of keeping their grip on their own humanity. It had almost gotten boring, holed up in the facility without the constant threat of danger pressing in from all sides. 
Boring, but peaceful. Stella could feel herself starting to nod off, her eyelids sagging, her dinner of canned beans sitting heavy in her stomach. Next to her, Doris had already begun to softly snore. Soon sleep would come for her, too, and bring with it dreams, memory of the life that was gone forever, the world as she had once known it. The dreams were tough, but waking up from them was even tougher. Still, she had to rest. She could only fight it for so long. She could almost hear her husband's voice when, Hey, Stella, you might want to see this. Brian was there suddenly, his words breaking through the haze in her mind. His tone was severe, and she knew that sleep would have to wait. She followed him down the hall for a while, before he stopped and turned her attention to a section of a damaged wall. It was rusted and corroded, black and gray, with massive cracks in the solid material. It looked like it had been slowly disintegrated over time by an incredibly strong acid. It was off-putting to look at, giving off the distinct sense that something bad had happened. But a lot of bad things had happened in the past month. I don't really understand what I'm looking at, Stella said, and Brian grabbed her by the shoulders, commanding her attention. This wasn't here yesterday. Hell, it wasn't here a few hours ago, he gestured to the damage. It just happened, and whatever is responsible is probably still here. A chill ran down Stella's spine. It seemed impossible for this kind of structural damage to happen over the course of a few hours. She could see twisted steel rebar, drips of melted metal that had trickled onto the floor. As she leaned in for a closer look, she gagged. There was an overpowering stench of rot and decay. It didn't take long for her to spot the source, a thick black mucus covering the hole in the wall, slick and slimy, and giving off the putrid smell. It wasn't like the material that had made up the flesh creatures outside. It was something else entirely. Something she had never seen before. She reached out a hand to touch it, but quickly caught herself. Whatever this stuff was, it was bad news. If it could do that to a solid wall, she didn't even want to think about what it could do to flesh and bone. What do we do? She asked. Inspect the area, make sure it's safe, see if it's some kind of toxic waste leak, or... He didn't finish the thought. He didn't have to. They needed to find out if this damage came from something living, something that could be hiding in the building with them and waiting for the chance to strike. When they returned to the main room, Doris was awake and Trina was there waiting for them. They agreed to split into pairs and search the facility, looking for any additional damage, strange black fluid, or signs of foul play of any kind. Trina and Brian went one way, while Doris and Stella went the other each person armed with a flashlight and a weapon of some kind. An axe, a bat, a knife. Stella had found a loaded pistol when they first arrived, one that she hoped she would never have to use. Now she carried it with her, just in case. Stella and Doris walked together for an hour, keeping an eye out for anything suspicious. They didn't find anything notable, really. There were some bits of rust they hadn't seen before, an occasional black puddle pooling on the floor but nothing like the scene Brian had found. As they walked in silence, Stella found herself beginning to relax. Maybe the worst was over. Maybe a pipe had broken somewhere and broken down a bit of the wall, but nothing else would really come of it. Then from the other side of the building, there came a high-pitched scream. She knew that voice immediately. Trina, screaming bloody murder, and Brian bellowing something. She grabbed Doris by the arm, and the two ran in the direction of the sound. As they got closer, they could hear other sounds in addition to Trina and Brian's yells. Loud cracking like something solid coming apart, bits of rubble falling to the ground, and the wet dripping sound of something thick hitting the floor. As the two rounded the corner to see what was happening to help their friends, Stella froze in shock. She had seen some harrowing things since that fateful sunny day. She almost thought she had become desensitized to horror, that there was nothing left in the world that could face her but this moment proved her wrong. There was so much to take in and so little time. Brian was swinging his axe wildly at the floor, chopping at it helplessly in an attempt to break it apart. It quickly became obvious why. Trina was sinking into the floor, not through a hole into the basement below, but into the floor itself. It rippled and melted around her, changing from a solid surface to a thick pool of black sludge. She flailed and struggled, grasping at the ground around her, at Brian's arm, anything to yank herself free. But she wouldn't budge. She continued to sink. No, she wasn't just sinking. 
She was being pulled. Stella felt her legs begin to work again, and she rushed to Trina's side, grabbing hold of her arms with all the strength she had. All the while, Trina screamed in a mix of desperation, terror, and pain. Brian continued his assault on the ground, as if he could cut her free from the floor, and Doris moved to help Stella. She grabbed a hold of Trina's waist, but stopped suddenly. There, at the place where her body vanished into the floor, Trina was beginning to fall apart. Whatever had turned the floor into a portal, whatever had rotted away at the walls, it was taking its toll on her body, too. The flesh falling away from the bone, the muscles liquefying and everything becoming corrupted by that same black mucus. If they pulled any harder, Trina would be ripped in two, her chest, arms, and head on the surface, while her legs, stomach, and most of her vital organs were lost. There was no way to save her. Stella saw it when Doris did, and the two shared a long, sad look. Trina was here with them, still struggling for her life, but she was already gone. As if it felt their hopelessness, the force pulling on Trina from below then gave a horrifying yank they were praying to not have to witness, and she was swallowed up by the ground. All that remained was a sticky black smear, a large crack in the floor, and three survivors where there had just been four. None of the remaining three slept a wink that night. Brian paced back and forth, holding his axe. Doris went over their supplies again, looking for anything that could be used to treat the effects of the corrosive black fluid, and Stella ran over their potential options again and again. They could stay and hope that the thing that took Trina never came back, or they could leave and face the possibility of succumbing to the sun or the influence of the creatures that once were people. She recalled dimly an old adage, the devil you know beats the devil you don't. Maybe that was true. Maybe it would be better to take their chances with the outside rather than stay and be hunted. But she thought of her husband and children again, watching them melt onto the grass, and she shuddered. There were no good options here, but she couldn't risk going out like that. They would stay. Whatever had taken Trina, there were three of them, and only one of it. Besides, maybe it had already gotten what it wanted, and now it would move on. She didn't know it when she fell asleep, only that when she eventually woke up, she was alone. Brian and Doris were nowhere to be found. She called out their names as her heart leaped into her throat. For a moment, she feared the very worst. But then, Brian answered her. He had been patrolling, looking for signs of trouble, but he was fine. She asked if Doris was with him, and he went pale. He told Stella that Doris had gone to an on-site bathroom to get cleaned up hours ago, before he left. She should have been back by then. Without another thought, they took off towards the bathroom and saw their worst fear realized. The door to the room was gone, rotted away, and Doris was gone with it. She had been taken before she even had the chance to scream. They stood there, taking in the reality of what had happened with silent shock. Then, a sound from behind caused them to turn around. It was a raspy, hollowed-out sound like air forced from a dying man's lungs, a dry, empty, evil chuckle from an inhuman throat. There they saw the creature that had stolen their friends. From a distance, Stella could have confused it for a man, a very old, very sick man, but still human. As it shuffled closer, however, that illusion was shattered. Its eyes were black voids, its skin gray and putrefied, its mouth a gaping, toothless maw of shriveled black gums, and it was laughing at them, like it was enjoying itself. There was the smell again, that overpowering reek of all things foul. Stella drew her pistol and fired several shots. She didn't have the best aim, especially not when her hands were shaking with fear, but one of the bullets found its target and hit the creature in the cheek. It hissed, not in pain, but a perverse amusement, as the lead tore a hole through its flesh like wet paper. Globs of black blood spattered everywhere, spreading the rot wherever they landed. To her side, she heard Brian cry out in pain. When she turned, he was clutching his right eye. Some of the liquid had hit him there, and it was already taking effect. Stella's stomach turned as she saw something white slide down the side of Brian's face, his eye melting out of its socket. The skin around it followed suit, softening like putty, and dribbling away from the bloody muscle underneath. Brian collapsed to the floor as the creature continued to advance on them, laughing louder and louder. It knew that bullets couldn't kill it, knew that there was nowhere to run, 
Stella grabbed a hold of Brian's arms, prepared to carry her fallen friend to safety, but he stopped her. I'm done for, he said quietly. If you try to carry me, you are too. She shook her head, unwilling to leave him behind, and he touched her cheek, forcing a smile on his decaying face. I, I didn't think I'd make it this far. I, I wouldn't have without you. So run, save yourself. She could hear the resignation in his voice and knew that he would not let her save him. I'll, I'll hold him off as long as I can, Brian promised. And with tears in her eyes, Stella turned and ran as fast as she could. As her feet pounded the ground, blood rushing in her ears, she could hear Brian screaming and cursing at the creature until his voice quickly faded into a wet gurgle. And then, silence. Stella sat in the center of the room that she and the others had once shared, clutching her scavenged pistol in her hands. Every creak, every errant sound made her jump. It could be anywhere, come from anywhere. She had escaped from so much already, survived more than anyone was ever meant to, had lost her love, her friends, her home. She wouldn't lose herself too. She held her breath as she heard it, clear in the darkness, drip, drip, drip. Her grip on the weapon tightened, and she readied herself. If she had to go down, she might as well go down swinging. The old man, whether he was a man, a monster, or death itself, wouldn't be taking her anywhere, not without a fight. The Church of the Broken God We've mentioned these machine-revering evangelists in a countless number of videos here on SCP Explained before, and it's because they're one of the most prolific groups of interest out there, with 300,000 active members across the globe that we know of. They likely have more members and devotees than other iconic groups of interest, like the Serpent's Hand, and the various cults of the Scarlet King combined. But how much do we really know about the Church of the Broken God? We've consulted Foundation historians and Mechanite scripture to find the answers and put together a truly comprehensive overview of this complex and often misjudged faction of the SCP Foundation multiverse, a faction that the Foundation may one day find themselves far more closely aligned with than they ever imagined to face an even greater foe. Give glory to the Broken God, and let us begin our journey into his teachings. The Church of the Broken God is a slightly more centralized group than the Serpent's Hand, though that really isn't saying much. They're split into three overall subgroups over a series of schisms that we'll delve deeper into later. The Broken Church, the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and the Church of Maxwellism. Before we get into the differences between these three groups, Let's take a quick look at what unites them. All splinter cells of the church worship the technological deity Mekain, known by many names, the most popular of which is the Broken God or Goddess. They all believe that Mekain was split into pieces and is lying dormant. They all revere machinery and technology over flesh, which they view as broken, weak, or corrupt. And without exception, all of them are the sworn mortal enemies of the Sarkists. Just for context, the Sarkists are the perfect equals and opposites to the Church of the Broken God. Under the leadership of the God King Grand Karsist Ion and finding their origins in Mekane's counterpart, the primal and flesh-based Yaldabaoth, the Sarkists worship and revere the base concepts of flesh, corruption, and disease, despising everything that the Church stands for. It is important to make note of these facts, given just how much of the Church of the Broken God's history is defined by their conflicts with the Sarkists. More on that later. The Broken Church is the oldest and most traditional of these three main sects. They are led by a man named Robert Bomaro, a Mechanite holy man who, in 1946, just after the Seventh Occult War, ascended from a mere collector of church-based anomalous trinkets to the title of Builder of God after imbibing in SCP-217, also known as God's Ichor, and his broken blood. Of all the church sects, the Broken Church is the most invested in conducting worship through active efforts to reconstruct the Broken God and bring about McCain's second coming. Of course, those of you who are familiar with SCP-001, the Ouroboros Cycle, will know that this sometimes has mixed results. After commissioning a counterfeit heart from the sinister folks at the factory, the Broken Church's most notable attempt at a full Mechane resurrection went horrifically wrong, resulting in a huge mechanical abomination that tore its way across Mexico, 
devouring everything it could until eventually being brought down by SCP-2399, a giant space cannon known as the Malfunctioning Destroyer. Anyway, now for a sect with a slightly less overtly destructive method of worshipping Mekain, the Cogwork Orthodox Church whom you may remember as the ones who gave Alexei Velitrov sanctuary after he was eventually freed from SCP Foundation containment. These worshippers innovated a practice known as standardization, which involved undergoing mechanical enhancement in order to appear closer to their maker. However, we aren't talking about sleek, technologically advanced cyborg parts here. The religious aesthetic of the Cogwork Orthodox is heavily inspired by the Industrial Revolution, with an emphasis on components such as gears or cogs. As such, members of the church who have undergone extensive modifications to remake themselves in the image of their god will often make loud ticking or tapping sounds, leading to the derogatory nickname tickers, often used among the other two sects. However, a major advantage of the church is that it is heavily organized and regulated from the top down with rigid systems and strict rules against electrical or digital technology. Think of them as Catholicism to the broken church's Protestantism. The Cogwork Orthodoxy keeps to themselves, but we do know a great deal about their internal command structures. The orders of the Cogwork Orthodox Church are as follows. At the very top of the pyramid are the Patriarchs, a mysterious and insular group who have the ultimate word on church matters and release missives that will later become the Schema, the Church's holy text. Below them are the Schematists' faithful, scholars and scribes who write and record the Schema from the aforementioned teachings and commands of the Patriarchs. The Gates' faithful are the internal affairs orders of the Cogwork Orthodox Church. They investigate matters going on within the faith, such as weeding out heretics and meditating internal disputes. They're one of the two orders permitted to carry weapons, the others being militants faithful, who act as the self-defense wing, keeping the church safe from external threats and acting as ambassadors to outside groups. The next two orders are the fabricators faithful and the inventors faithful. The fabricators act as foremen who oversee production on church properties, ensuring that only the finest quality is achieved. That's because, in addition to standardization, the Cogwork Orthodox Church believes that mass production of items using Industrial Revolution methods is also a viable form of worship for Mekane. This brings us to the inventors. They come up with new methods and designs for standardization and go on quests and explorations to discover the answers to any questions the Church may have. But our information on the Cogwork Orthodox Church doesn't end there. Thanks to their truly extensive writings, we even know about the multitude of saints that the Church reveres and their various purposes to followers of the Church. For example, Saint Legate Trunion. She was the sneaky and covert patron saint of the Legate's faithful. There was also Saint Schematis Platon. She's the patron saint of the written word, of editors, of timetables, and of diagrammatic organization. Patron saint of the inventor's faithful, of designers, of repairmen, and of cognition engines. Saint Scranton, patron saint of spatial fabric manipulation, higher dimension mathematics, and anthracite coal extraction. Saint Fabricator Baffle, patron saint of workflow and the assembly line. Saint Inventor Chalk, patron saint of chorists. And Saint Inventor and Richner, patron saint of the Entelechided. They have a pretty rigid structure and extensively recorded mythology is what we're saying here, just in case that didn't come across. This brings us to the Church of Maxwellism, the newest and smallest of the sects, as well as the least combative. However, they pose the greatest threat of all to the SCP Foundation's quest to maintain a veneer of normality. That's because Maxwellists forego the extensive standardized body modifications of the Church of the Cogwork Orthodox and instead prefer smaller internal implants that allow them to interface directly with the internet from their brains. This allows them to fulfill their primary goal, spreading the good word of Mekane, whom they refer to as WAN, all across the globe using the Information Superhighway, while also netting them the nickname Hummers among the other two sects. In contrast to the conformist elements of their sister organizations, Maxwellists embrace their individuality and unique traits, being highly decentralized but very communicative with their fellow believers. 
They believe WAN is a fragmented god, existing in the world of digitized data rather than clunky old hardware. With their extreme internet savvy, it's likely that they've brought in many new converts to the broken god's cause, despite them being the youngest of all the overall religion's sects. But now we have an overview of the state of the Church of the Broken God today. We must ask ourselves a second question. How did we get here? What is the history of the Church? To find the answer, we need to go back. Before the modern era. Before the SCP Foundation. Before even humanity itself. It begins when Mekane and Yadabath created humanity. Yadavath created the bodies of human beings, primal sensual creatures driven by base instincts and urges, and Mekane gave them their minds, reasonable, logical, and compassionate. For a time, the two would preside over mankind in harmony, but things would not stay that way forever. One of the earliest civilizations that the Foundation discovered interacting with these two deities was the anomalous Shah Dynasty, sometimes also referred to as the Shah Culture Group which reigned in China from 2100 to 1600 BCE, though the only sources that confirm the very existence of the Xia dynasty are anomalous. It was here that we heard the first whispers of the cult of the Broken God. To the Xia dynasty, the being we would later call Mekain was known as the father serpent Fuxi, and Yadabath was known as mother dragon Nyowa. Because the Xia dynasty was anomalous all the way down, Scholars of Father Serpent Foxi were said to practice the Way of the Serpent, as he has always been associated with knowledge. The Way of the Serpent involved undergoing a physical transformation into a snake-like being to better resemble the deity, much like how modern Cogwork Orthodox Church followers try to reshape their bodies to better resemble their creator today. According to Shah Dynasty scripture, which would form the basis of the entire belief system of all sects of the Church, Fusi broke down his own body and transformed himself into a brass cage around Mother Dragon Nyowa. However, unlike later iterations of the faith, the Shah Dynasty believed it was extremely important to see that the body of Fusi is never rebuilt, because to do so would lead to the release of Mother Dragon Nyowa and the end of the world. The civilization was started by a mythic figure known as the Yellow Emperor who led the Shah Dynasty to defeat other Fusi and Nyowa worshippers, then folding them into their own culture. Like many civilizations touched by Mekain, the Shah Dynasty was incredibly scientifically advanced and skilled with metalworking. There's even evidence that the Shah Dynasty created their own forms of the computer with effective artificial intelligence, as well as reality warping devices and even devices capable of interstellar travel. While the illustrious Shah Dynasty would now be brought to its knees by a race of creatures known only as the Golden Crows, the next iteration of Broken God Ancestors would be far closer to the worshippers we'd recognize today. This was the beginning of the Mechanite Empire, and by extension, the First War of the Flesh, the legendary extended conflict between the Mechanites and the Sarkists in the ancient world. Broken God cults were detected in Mycenaean Greece, a Greek civilization spanning the years 1600 to 1100 BCE. It was here where the Broken God first took up the name Mekane, and eventually he amassed enough followers to allow the theocratic Mekanite Empire to truly be born, and it would remain in power from 1200 to 1000 BCE. Much like the church in the modern day, the Mekanite Empire saw the marriage of theocracy, politics, and classical military dictatorship. And much like the Shah dynasty before it, it was marked by both tight structure and control, as well as incredible metallurgic production and technological advancement. Partly due to considering all of these to be holy acts, they had strong strategic relations with Egypt, Assyria, and Canaan, and their mix of commercial strength and a dominant naval presence gave them serious geopolitical standing, even if their highly evangelical attitude didn't always win them friends on the world stage. A number of roots for modern Church of the Broken God beliefs were clearly established here, including the paradigm shift from wanting to avoid Mekane's rebuilding to expediting the rebuilding. Texts made around this time were also the first to contain references to the name Wan as an alternate title for Mekane, revealing the basis for later Maxwellist practices in the modern day. However, as we alluded to before, despite these incredible advancements, the true ravages of the First War of Flesh were upon the Mekanites here. The Sarkists, who had established the Adium Empire, were on the offensive, 
Thanks to Grand Karsist Ion and his Karsist minions, the Karsists, by the way, were high-level followers of Sarkicism capable of performing flesh magic, the Sarkis forces were more powerful than ever before. They had mobilized their troops and brought in trump cards the likes of which the Mechanites had never seen before. Giant flesh beasts that acted as living siege weapons, human warriors turned into deadly monsters with Sarkic magic, and the most deadly of all, a bioweapon that the Mechanites called the Red Death at the time, though we know it better as the flesh that hates. As is often the case in war, this led to unprecedented advancements in technology on the side of the Mechanites, too. The most notable example perhaps being SCP-2406, an incredible weapon of war known as the Colossus, which made for a formidable tool against the teeming forces of the Adium Empire. However, the advancements on both sides only made the war all the more brutal, with scores dying on both sides and both empires being severely weakened as the conflict stretched on. Things got so desperate for the Mechanites that they even joined forces with the infamously ruthless and savage Davites, the worshippers of the Scarlet King, to defeat the Sarkists. The decisive battle of the First War of Flesh was the Siege of Gyros, the Sarkic capital of Greece, where Mechanites eventually breached the stronghold and slaughtered the Karsists within. Another missive sent from the Sarkist field commander Karsis Tundas read, Grand Karsist Ion. May this missive find you at Kaithira, for it shall be my last. Our enemies have begun their assault on the island. The fallen kingdoms and followers of Mekane have united against us, even as the nations crumble. The wounds sustained today will heal. Into the ages of ages we are undying. I vow that none are to leave this island alive. We summon the Red Death for the blood of heathens. We sacrifice ourselves. We will meet again in Aditum. But while the Mechanite Empire won the war, they didn't survive it. Due to the people lost and the resources expended, the Empire fully collapsed shortly afterwards. Some survivors renounced their Mechanite faith and entered other cultures. Some splintered off to preach and practice mechanism elsewhere. The remainder settled on the secretive island of Amani to form their own city-state. Here they replenished their numbers and forces over the centuries, maintaining secrecy to avoid intervention from outsiders and vengeful Sarkists. By the 6th century BCE, the Mechanites from the city-state of Amini were developing a degree of regional power once more, thanks to the boon provided by their advanced technology. They were no longer a military powerhouse, but the tiny state instead became a trade juggernaut providing mechanical goods and weapons to nearby civilizations that in turn provided the protection that the Mechanites so sorely required. Their cultures would later be influenced by the Roman Empire and various Pythagorean cults, who inspired a love of numerology and cosmic harmony in this ancient civilization returning shakily to its feet. The 5th century BCE became known as the Golden Age of Mechanite literature, and the state continued to grow through military alliances with the Achaemenid Empire and the Kingdom of Carthage. However, the city-state of Amini was eventually wiped out for good in the 1st century BCE. Followers of the Broken God faith remained, but they were scattered to the wind for almost 2,000 years until the Industrial Revolution struck the Western world. Seeing the great machines of industry rise up seemingly overnight convinced the lingering cells of broken god worshippers that perhaps, after a millennia, McCain was now preparing to return. They assembled into what is now known as the Broken Church and began preaching the good word. And considering the industrial fever of raw, unfettered progress gripping the world at the time, the Gospel of McCain seemed to be an attractive prospect indeed. Meanwhile, debate was raging inside the ever-growing church about the nature of adapting oneself mechanically, a practice that had been out of fashion since the days of the original Mechanites. Broken church loyalists believed that modification through any means other than drinking the god's ichor, like Robert Bramaro would later do, is an insult to Mechane. Others, however, saw it as a tribute and a way of getting closer to their creator. This was the issue that caused the first New Age Schism and led to the formation of the Cogwork Orthodox Church during the 1840s. The faith would never be the same after this. The various broken god splinter cells found a lucrative market in converting wealthy industrial oligarchs of the production boom, 
and talking them into becoming glorified sugar daddies for their various new augmentation experiments. All to becoming post-Nibbanic beings, meaning mechanical entities who leave the unreliable world of flesh behind for good and commune with the shiny metal infinite. In exchange, these industrialists would be provided with advanced mechanite knowledge of manufacturing, as well as technology far beyond their years. Everyone was a winner. Well, except the SCP Foundation, but we'll touch on that whole debacle soon. By the closing of the 19th century, it seemed like the Cogwork Orthodox Church might totally outmode its predecessors at the Broken Church. However, the early 20th century would bring the mysterious Robert Bumero onto the scene. Bumero was a mysterious man with unknown abilities and connections, but he soon commanded power and respect, taking over the Broken Church and even being taken seriously in rival sects. He gathered up a group of trusted enforcers and augmented them into his disciples, supposedly being able to speak directly to Mekane. He and his loyalists collected hundreds of artifacts relating to the Broken God, blowing the minds of all involved with just how quickly he was able to do so. He disappeared in 1943 and was gone for three years, during which time he conducted the famous God's Icar ceremony and returned to his people as the self-styled Builder of God. This made him an even more esteemed figure across the world of the Broken God, a kind of Pope of Mekane, supposedly bearing a direct line of contact with the Divine. There would be a defining schism in the late 20th century that produced the Church of Maxwellism, as some wished to move beyond the outdated dogma of the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and began administering electronic augmentations rather than just analog machinery. This resulted in a huge controversy for church members, as the patriarchs reacted swiftly with a slew of excommunications. Those excommunicated would soon become the first wave of Maxwellists, and take the tenets of the Broken God into the Internet Age. All of these groups have made trouble for the Foundation in their own way, from the online evangelizing of Maxwellists leaking classified knowledge to the weirdness of the Cogwork tickers being impossible to ignore, to the frequent battles between the Foundation and the Broken Church over items which they believe to be parts of Mekane. However, if certain prophecies are to be believed, the relationship between the Foundation and the Church won't remain frosty forever. One day, perhaps they'll even stand metal to fleshy shoulder beside the Sarkis too, against a threat far more dangerous than all of them combined. Alert! You are attempting to view the file on SCP-001. This file is highly classified, and its contents are sealed by the Order of the O5 Council. By continuing to view them, you are confirming that you have received prior authorization. If you are found to be viewing these materials without adequate clearance, you will be terminated. If you choose to accept these risks and verify your credentials, access will be granted in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The following is a truncated summary, based on transcripts from an official meeting of the O5 Council. You have been warned. O5-1 sat at a conference table, addressing his colleagues. All the other council members looked at him expectantly, except one. Hello, everyone, O5-1 began. I'm sure you're all wondering why 13 isn't here today. I'll get to that, but I first want to publicly address something I'm sure you've all noticed by now. After talking to you for the past week or so, I've noticed that we've all been inducted onto the council almost at the exact same time. All of us, except 13, that is. In fact, 13 probably conducted your orientation. The other council members nodded. That's good to know that it wasn't just me, O5-2 commented. I would have expected the last two to run me through things, O5-1 sighed. Indeed. In fact, I asked 13 about it, but he refused to say much. Of course, he pled ignorance, but I don't believe that. As you might guess, the previous 12 O5s did not retire at the same time. They were killed. In fact, this building isn't even the original Site-01. That was destroyed. I think you can see where this is going. O5-3 frowned. So, we have a dead O5 council, a missing Site-01, and somehow none of this is on our records. And only one suspect, piped up O5-2. O5-1 held up a hand, drawing attention back to his words. I would like to designate O5-13 as one of our SCP-001 projects. Of course, this will be kept secret from him, but we need to investigate this entire ordeal until we figure out what happened, how it happened, 
and Y05-13 is the only one left standing. After the aforementioned conference, O5-13 was designated SCP-001. SCP-001 is a male human of Latin American descent, standing at approximately 1.9 meters tall. The exact nature of this entity and the anomalous properties he possesses are not yet known. He was given his anomalous classification following the Caesar incident, an event that resulted in the death of all previous O5 council members, aside from 13 the complete eradication of the previous Site-01, and the loss of any official documentation on 13 or his appointment to the Council. SCP-001 is contained in a modified containment facility, constructed similarly to other Foundation sites, with the exception of additional living arrangements for the members of the Overwatch Council. The facility is equipped with state-of-the-art security cameras, as well as three nuclear warheads intended as failsafes. These will detonate if SCP-001 breaches containment. One designated member of the Council is to be given amnestic drugs on a regular basis and maintain official documentation of all information gathered about SCP-001. This Council member will be referred to as the Archivist and will hold the position for approximately four months at a time though they may terminate their duties sooner if the amnestic side effects prove too detrimental to their health. When a council member's time as the archivist comes to a close, they must conduct a meeting to assess what they have learned. O5-1 was appointed to the role of inaugural archivist, and several months later, a second conference was called. One of the subjects discussed was a series of interviews conducted with survivors of the Caesar incident. Though several members of personnel made it out relatively unscathed, they had no memory of the incident at all, and their interviews were unfortunately of no help. During the events of the conference, O5-10 revealed that he had recovered a copy of the previous O5 personnel dossier. It included an entry that described O5-13's purpose on the Council, stating, O5-13's special connection to the Anomalous gives him a perspective no other Council member could begin to fathom. While normal C confirmation meetings require 11 members for quorum, no meeting is allowed to proceed without O5-13's attendance. In addition to this entry, there was a table recording O5-13's various anomalous property measurements. Perplexingly, his appearance, temperature, skeletal structure, corporal reality, and induced emotional states were all found to be within the baseline of normality. The remainder of the conference was designated to deciding the next steps for a series of specialized teams looking into the Caesar incident, SCP-001's origin, and the entity's anomalous properties. O5-8 was selected as the next archivist, and the meeting disbanded with a new sense of purpose. The Caesar Incident team managed to identify the geographical location of the previous Site-01 by searching for records of unusual seismic activity on the date of the incident. Earthquake records led them to an island off the coast of Greenland, where the remains of the site were waiting. An investigative team attempted to search the island, but was prevented from exploring the ruins by representatives of the Global Occult Coalition, who demanded they leave immediately. Investigation into the presence of the GOC on the island turned up a curious connection. Their representatives had spoken with O5-13 before setting up an outpost there. Meanwhile, the Origins investigation team looked into records of O5-13 at various groups of interest. Reports were conflicting and difficult to parse, and the team brought their findings to the third conference. Notice from O5-8. Conference number three was cut short after an intense exchange led to enough people leaving the meeting for us to lose quorum. We archived all the materials covered up to that point, as well as the efforts made to de-escalate tension between the members. However, this also means that information herein was not properly vetted by the entire council before being uploaded, so we erred on the conservative side. If you need to see the full proceedings, please contact the current archivist. Before the premature adjourning of the conference, the following conversation took place. O5-1 Excuse me for, I believe some clarification regarding the exchange with Marshall, Carter, and Dark is necessary. How so? It mentions here that you performed an exchange. It is important for the records and for our general information security that we know exactly what information was exchanged. Yes, that does make sense. I'm sorry. I did not write that section of the report. If my memory serves me well, Seven was responsible for the Marshall Carter and Dark reconnaissance. Well, Seven, could you elaborate? O5-7 looked at O5-1 and swallowed. You know, the rules are pretty tight on this. Why did you give them anything in the first place? Yeah, Eleven makes a good point. Don't we have our own spies working some of the transport routes? 
05-7 nodded and then began going through her belongings. Could you at least tell us what kind of information you gave them? 05-7 paused, thought to herself for a moment, and then motioned to the entire council. Wait, you gave them information about us? 05-7 shook her head, paused again, and then nodded her head yes. She held up a finger and then went back to looking through her files. But that's... No, I, I don't believe this. We can't let people know about us no matter the situation. Imagine if word got out that the old council had been killed. I bet cults across the planet would have a heyday. I doubt she said anything actually important. Oh, really? I've only dealt with the merchants once or twice, but they know how to appraise anything, especially information. 05-7 held up an index finger and then continued looking through her files. <laughs> Are you just going to ignore the issue then? Just gonna hang us out to dry? Eleven, you need to calm down. We're all waiting on you! 05-7 looked up at 05-11 and then put her files away. She gathered her things and left the room. Ha! <laughs> Can't take being called out, I see. Eleven, I will need to speak with you following this meeting. You can talk to me now, I'll be in my office. 05-11 left the room. Eight, I'd like to go after Seven to make sure she didn't actually do something stupid. That's fine, I believe that would drop us below quorum. But I believe this meeting has fallen apart anyway. One, Twelve, and I will make the next update ourselves. This SCP-001 conference is dismissed. Addendum. An update has been added to this file by 05-8 regarding security concerns. Following the official ending of the meeting, 05-7 distributed the summary of all information exchanged with Marshall, Carter, and Dark. The information was pulled from the out-of-date 05 dossier. The current explanation as to why it was accepted by the group of interest is that it would have confirmed any information they had gathered previously about the 05 Council. As part of the exchange, we have received a tip as to where to find more information on SCP-001, which the Origins team will investigate for the next conference. 05-7 later clarified in a written statement that she had left the meeting simply to retrieve the file detailing this information, since it was not on her person. 05-7 insisted that she does not need an interpreter, due to information security concerns. A discussion was scheduled between her and 05-1 to reduce communicational issues at a later date. 05-11 issued a formal apology. I hope that this will be a cessation of any internal conflicts. We are working together, and therefore require that a trusting relationship has been established between all members. As Abraham Lincoln once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. 05-12 was appointed to the position of archivist, and after several months passed, a fourth conference was called. The following is an excerpt from this meeting. To why doesn't your team start this off? All right, sure, we did make some nice progress. Always good to start a meeting on a high note. You all remember those four survivors we talked about last meeting, right? We got back in touch with them and did a more thorough interview. More intense techniques, lie detector tests, heart rate monitoring, the whole shebang. Do you have transcripts? I do, but spoiler alert, they're not very different from the first round. So we're now convinced they genuinely don't remember. How far does 13's anti-memetic side reach? Slow down there, we're not quite done. You see, as part of our second round of interviews, we also did a physical examination and some tests to see what messed with their heads, and we found they all had a little scar right on the side of their necks, right where we inject amnestics. I mean, while I understand what you're implying, we tend to administer amnestics fairly liberally. Last meeting was essentially just a prolonged reminder of how much we value InfoSec. True, but we keep good records of who we use with that stuff, how much we're using, if we're using the pills or the syringe, etc, etc. However, when I went to look up if any of our survivors had ever taken the injectable amnestic, all my results came back negative. I also took the liberty of checking out Red Right Hand. The entire squad's got injection scars and we rarely wipe those guys. Whatever happened, I think we covered it up ourselves. When you say ourselves, do you mean... Oh, no, 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 no. I just mean the Foundation. If we were actually involved, then everyone here would have those scars, but Six, Nine, and I definitely don't have them. So that leads me to believe they didn't drug us. It would be an all-or-nothing deal. Good work. Sounds like Eight needs to have a talk with our amnestics department. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. I'm still trying to keep all the details in order. You said that they were injected? Yes. See, that's what I don't get. We used the injections like ten years ago. We moved on to the pills since you can miss a vein. 
Also, I checked our amnestic supply right after the Caesar event, and we didn't see any variation from our normal usage. Uh, maybe the records are off. We found that whatever 13 did, he's good at covering up his tracks. I don't think that's it. Because you know who does still use those injectable amnestics? The GOC. I see. We'll have to schedule another meeting with our good friends at the UN as well. After discussing potential origins for SCP-001, the Council moved on to the subject of O5-13's anomalous properties. The anomalous properties team presented their findings. Okay, so everyone here has the records of our measurements, so I can tell you now, they are not particularly insightful. Uh, do you have too many leads to choose from? Uh, well, quite the opposite, actually. We have nothing. Nothing abnormal with regard to radiation, humes, radio frequencies. 13 is almost impressively normal. Are you sure we're not going about this wrong? I mean, I know we've kind of quantified some of our anomalies in the past, but as a general rule, they're not supposed to follow the rules, right? That is what I was beginning to suspect, although it is troubling that he can just hide it from us entirely. Or there is the other option. We're not only barking up the wrong tree, but we're in the entirely wrong forest. You're saying he's not even anomalous in the first place? It's either that, or we're dealing with a god. And a god who knows the Foundation better than even we do. Let's continue to discuss the non-anomalous option, since it appears that there would be very little we could do about the other case. So, that would mean he's probably an inside man for the insurgency. Or the serpent's hand! Nine, nine, not the hand. They don't operate like this. He might be a fittest fanatic. Ah, that too. Or maybe he's with someone else. We've seen quite a bit of the GOC and UIU popping up in this. My apologies, but I do find it difficult to believe that a single insurgent would be able to detonate the on-site nuclear warhead from halfway across the globe, if we believe our previous information. I'm not so sure we can, though. It sounds like he spoke to a regular body double. Maybe his anomalous property is that he can create body doubles? But what are we supposed to do with that? Uh, excuse me, I'd like to return to the earlier line of discussion about 13 being unable to perform the assassination due to possibly meeting with our point of contact. Because I'm beginning to believe that he actually did meet with 13. So, you believe he was able to blow Site-01 sky high from halfway across the globe? I mean, if we're going with a the god theory, I could see it. No, I'm saying he had hell. Or at least more than one man helping him. Remember how our request to install additional security cameras was denied by the Ethics Committee? You finally talked to them. I did. I met with Mr. Huang to demand an explanation. He refused and told me it was above my security clearance. <laughs> above your security clearance? You're on the goddamn council! There simply aren't things outside of your jurisdiction! You run the Ethics Committee, for God's sakes! Uh, that's not quite accurate. I'm not in charge of the Ethics Committee, I'm simply the O5 ambassador to it. They need to be a separate entity to eliminate bias in various cases. So you believe that 13 is in league with the Ethics Committee? Or the Administrator, if it's set above your security clearance? Or both? Whoever it is, they're trying very hard to stop us from seeing him in private. Someone should just let us give him a full physical. He's probably baseline. This would let us confirm that. Yeah, but if we're wrong and our God theory is correct, he'll blow our asses sky high like the last council. I believe we need to adjourn here, so we have enough time to prepare for our next full council meeting to avoid suspicion. Although we do not need to expand our search further, I will consider speaking to 13 before the next conference, but I will only do so if I believe it will not result in a second Caesar incident. Are there any objections to this? The council fell silent. Then I believe this conference is dismissed. Alert. Retina scan confirmed. Identity verified. Your credentials have been accepted and further access has been granted. Welcome, O5-13. You have one new message. Hello, 13. I'm sure you've been keeping tabs on your fellow council's progress. They're growing closer than either of us wanted, but I'm not surprised. When you get enough smart people together, they tend to surpass your expectations. You're probably hoping this is going to end soon. I'm sorry you've gone through this. It obviously wasn't in our plan for you when we inducted you into the council. But if you could keep up our gambit a little longer, I would be appreciative. I'm unconvinced your cohorts are ready to know what happened to their predecessors, and I don't want to ask Alfine and Johnson to help clean up another May 13th. I don't even want the thought of pulling a Caesar event in their heads. The GOC and the UIU already have enough dangling over my head as is. But if they do approach you and confront you about the situation, I'd rather you have a direct answer 
Also, transcripts tend to be more convincing than recall. I've attached here the transcript from the O5 meeting before the Caesar incident. It's part of the last-minute backup that Site-01 performed as part of Stage 3 containment breach protocols. If anyone asks where those backups are stored, you can tell them the same thing I told you. It's beyond their clearance. Love, the Administrator. O5-1 was present in the O5 Council conference room. He was working at a laptop in front of him, beside which sat a cup of coffee. A message flashed up on his screen, reading, Access granted. You have five minutes to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. He grumbled to himself, irritated. Two minutes passed before the remaining council members except for O5-13 entered the room. You're all here, great. I wouldn't want one of you to be off-site for this. Juan, what's this about? I know you've been going through a phase lately, but emergency meetings demand a real emergency. Oh, it's an emergency, all right. Then spit it out. We have a breach, new XK level threat. No, it's more of something under two's jurisdiction. We have an internal affairs issue. O5-1 motion to the coffee. One of you bastards thought I would actually drink this. <laughs> Someone didn't give you enough sugar? No, too much arsenic. Another message flashed up on the computer reading, you have three minutes to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. Do you want to finish with that? That pain in the ass can be patient. Wait, 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 wait. You think one of us tried to kill you with your coffee? Oh, don't act like that's below you. I know you've all been out to bury my ass. One, calm down. I know we've had our differences, but- But what? It's not like this is the first time one of you has tried to destroy me. I know you all once tried to infiltrate one of my transports. Infiltrate? He was assigned to fill in for- It's no use, Five. The man can't think straight anymore. Oh, really? Who's the one here with his head so far up Marshall's ass he can taste the caviar? You're accusing me of selling out? No, no. I'm accusing all of you of selling out or being out for yourself or some nonsense. You've all gone soft. It used to be, if it doesn't make sense, throw it in a cage. Now it's, let's measure it, look at it, figure out what it is, then make sure it doesn't bother anyone. That's not containment. That's sitting idly and hoping the public doesn't find it. My God, we've started outsourcing to pet shelters. You know, if this is a problem, we can just calm down and rethink our stances on a few things. Uh, that won't change anything. Half of you are under someone's thumb and the other half of you are so messed up you need a cell of your own. Says the man who suggested we drink from the Fountain of Youth. Well, Seven, you're right. I'm about as far from baseline as the rest of you. Like, goddammit, anomalies are essentially running this organization. The computer chimed in saying, You have two minutes to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. Shut up, goddammit! We're getting off topic. You said someone poisoned you. What about Thirteen? He's not even here. That's because I sent him to talk to nobody. But why? Because he's the only one I trust. He's the only one I don't need to have this chat with. He's the only normal person on this whole goddamn council. We plucked him off the streets and just started asking him, do you think this is weird? I'm not worried about someone whose movements we've been able to monitor since he came out of the uterus. You freaks. I don't know what you all did before you showed up here. For all I know, you're just eldritch abominations waiting for the chance to kill me dead. One, slow down. They were so wrapped up in their argument, they barely noticed the computer saying, you have one minute to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. And you know what? We've always been pretty liberal with containing anomalies. Now we might have 12 of them on the council. One! What? Your session, just finish it already. It's distracting as all hell. You know, you're right. I should just finish it already. There's not much more for me to do. O5-1 resumed his work at the computer. Aside from containing you, like the inhuman aberrations you are. But it was a little too late for that. The computer, which had been allowed to time out, said, Emergency Stage 3 Containment Breach Protocol Activated. The on-site nuclear warhead will detonate in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This concludes the file on SCP-001. It appears that in a place dedicated to studying the strange and unusual, where the bizarre and anomalous have become the pedestrian, the usual, just another day at the office, the most notable thing a person can be is completely average. When the impossible becomes possible, when you and everyone around you are the furthest thing from normal, the ordinary is the stuff of nightmares. Now go check out SCP-001 Does Not Exist and SCP-001 A Simple Toy Maker for more proposals pertaining to the endless mysteries of SCP-001.